All right, very cool. So I'm going to bring up Ken Jocelyn. Let me just spin him real quick. Before Ken starts, I want to just kind of uh, talk about Ken because Ken and I met about, when, was, when did we meet Ken? About a year and a half ago? About a year and a half ago. Uh, let, me, let me let you unmute. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, it's been, it's been about a year and a half ago. It's been about a year and a half. And I've seen this guy just skyrocket since the day we met in, in the past years and a half. And I just see him constantly get better and better and better, not just for himself, but he also helps a bunch of other people. He's, he's built a huge mastermind. He gets some of the biggest players that, that are in businesses mastermind. In fact, one of the people that I met through, through Ken's mastermind is, is a billionaire that sold his company to, to Warren Buffett for $8 billion. So this guy knows how to get connections. He knows how to build audiences. He knows how to host events. And I wanted him to come in and just kind of add as much value as he could uh, to you guys before we get started with the real estate content. You know, he's going to be able to, to teach you a lot of things. So, Ken, I'm super excited to have you kickstart the, the event. You're the first speaker. Honored. Love that. Um, Very cool. At least, I don't, at least I'm not speaking behind John Maxwell again. I've done that <laughs> three times in my life where I've had to speak. Does anybody know who John Maxwell is? Give me a thumbs up. I've had to speak behind John three times. My first big speaking engagement about 20 was 2000. Uh, 23 years ago, I was, what, 31 years old, and I go in front of 9,000 people, and I have to go behind John Maxwell. And if you guys know John, he sucks all the oxygen out of the room. Um, it's, it's the last year at my conference in Atlanta. I do a, I do a large entrepreneur leadership conference, and uh, John opened the conference. I had to speak behind John again. And then I told him, I said, I'm never doing that again. And what I do, I did it again this year, about three weeks ago. And I was <laughs> John again. So I'm um, honored, number one. Um, I just got a couple of things that I want to share with you guys this morning. I think Abbas told me I had about three hours to talk <laughs> to you guys. So I'm going to try to cram as much stuff in in three hours as I can. Uh, how many of you guys have got one of these? This is a pen. And, and this, is a, this is actually my planner, but this is a, a notebook. I'd love for you to grab a pen and a notebook. And I just want to share a little bit of my journey over the past three years. And uh, boss is like, I got me a, a boss and his legal pads. That's uh, right. I, I uh, Number one, let me, let me say this. Um, I, I do, I do. Uh, my life is, um, it's, it's insane. It's, it's so, I wake up every single day and I am literally blown away at what God does in my heart and in my life. I spent half of the last 30 years in full-time vocational ministry, pastoring and planting churches um, around the Southeast. I live in Birmingham now. I'm actually in Nashville at a really good friend's house. I'm here. He's one of the, he's one of the, he's on the residential commercial side with EXP. Um, but I've done uh, the other half top, top mortgage broker lender and top um, real estate broker as well. I've done about 300 million in transactions. 300 million transactions in my world is a lot. 300 million in, in a boss's world is a little different. Um, but I do. I get to hang around some pretty amazing people. Um, he mentioned Vic, um, who's a part of our mastermind. Vic and I are, are, are super close. He had 11 companies successfully acquired by Berkshire Hathaway for an undisclosed amount that was around $8 billion. Um, he's, a, he's a dear friend, uh, my best friend. Um, Jeff is, uh, Forbes Magazine calls him the Tony Robbins of Persia. He does huge events in uh, in. Malaysia and in Dubai, 15, 20,000 people in-person events. Um, Gary Brecka um, partners with Grant Cardone at 10X Health Systems. Brent Gove is one of the top guys at EXP. 30,000 agents in his organization. Um, gosh, about who else? I mean, Brian Covey, who's the senior vice president, lives here in, in Brent, where Franklin, Tennessee, where I'm at now. About $5 billion a year in, in mortgages that they do. Uh, Randy Garn, who is one of my best friends, who is on the board with Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi. Um, I, I've just, I've, I have a very unbelievable um, circle and corner of some very, very, very special people in my life. Um, and Abbas is one of those guys. Um, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what an, an amazing, I call him a kid. Um, he's 25 years old. I've known him, I think he was at least a year and a half. Post I'm trying to years. grow the beard so that way I get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody seen a boss without his beard? Give me a thumbs up. I know we've got a, almost 100 people on this call. If you've ever seen a boss without his beard, he looks like he's 12. Um, so <laughs> he's hilarious. And I'm like, I mean, he is the, he's the, he's the richest 12 year old um, I've ever seen in my life when he doesn't have a beard, but. I just, I just want to say this to you guys. I know this is a multifamily call, and, I, and I've watched the boss over the past two years. 
um, grow. I've watched him grow from just residential commercial into uh, multifamily. And I've watched him grow his, his this syndication and grow his company and grow his team. And um, number one, he is a, uh, in, in all of the people that I get to spend time with uh, last week, I mean, I, or two weeks ago at my conference in Atlanta, I've got all these guys on stage with me together and and John Maxwell and Ed Milet and just a, a bunch of phenomenal, phenomenal people that I get to spend time with. And the number one thing that I got, the number one comment out of my conference a couple, two or three weeks ago in Atlanta was just the humility and the uh, the level of transparency that comes out of the people that that I get to do life with and a boss is, is no different. And so I want to share two things with you guys today, because I'm sure every single one of you guys, you're on here, you may be, oh, Barry, I see you, Barry Mathis. I didn't even see you until just now. What's up, buddy? Good to see you, man. Um, I'm sure every single one of you guys have dreams and visions and goals. And here's what I'd love to do. Can they unmute or know about, here's what I like to do. In the chat, if you've got goals, like give me, like I've got, I've got goals right here in my planner. We're going to talk about two things today. Number one, how do I get the right people in my life? Like, how do I get around a Vic Keller? How do I get around a Gary Brecca? How do I spend time with guys like a boss? How do I get, I would literally was just on the phone with Brent Dove. I, I'm like, I told Brent and Pete, who's here, Pete's the number one luxury real estate guy in, um, now he's do, opening office in Nashville, but in La Jolla, California, the number one guy. And he's been doing, he's from Boston. So he's in La Jolla, he's got this Boston accent. And he's just like, ah, you know how Boston people are. They're all up in your face and rushing it. Absolutely. How do you how do you get around these people? I'm upstairs with Brent on the phone. I'm like, dude, I got to have my phone. I got to get downstairs in the office and get on this call with the boss. But how do, how do you get around these people? There's two things, guys. I want you to write this down. There are two things that keep people from living a, a I'm talking about not just a normal baseline life, but living a life where you wake up every morning and you're like, oh, my God. Like I pinch myself some days. Like I get to do this for a living and make really, really, really good money doing this. Like hundreds of thousands. And we did, we, we netted almost a half a million dollars in revenue last month. Like I get to do this for, a. I mean, this is what I get to do. These are the people that I get to do. Tuesday, I fly to Puerto Rico for five days with all of the guys that I just mentioned to do our mastermind Saturday we're hopping on Gene and Susan Frederick's brand new $10 million, 110 foot yacht for the day. Like how in the world do I get to do this? How many of you guys would like to live a life like that? Give me a thumbs up. I posted, I posted on my Instagram page this morning. I wanna preface it with this. I posted on my Instagram page this morning. Actually, it's gonna be, I think it's the one tomorrow. I talked about fulfillment. I talked about fulfillment. Because the, the one thing that I will share with you guys, with a boss and with all of the, the, the people that I get to do life with, and I'll jump right, there's two things. Number one, you got to have the right, you got to have the right mindset and you got to have the right relationship. And I'm going to talk about both of those really quick. You have to have the right mindset and the right relationships. I'm going to go in a little bit reverse order. I'm going to start with the relationship, but you've got to have the mindset piece, piece component down first. And then the relationships will follow. But I'm going to jump into relationships since we're here and we're talking about that. Um, there are three spheres of relationships that I talk about all the time. It's community, circle, and corner. Your community, your circle, and your corner. And those things are the most important things in your life. Listen, they are the lifeblood of everything you do in your business. Every single thing you do in your business circles around your community and your community is that large group of people you travel with. I was in Vegas last week. I'm close to Grant Cardone. A lot of you guys know Uncle G um, and obviously Gary Brecca. I was, I'm real close to them. So I was in Vegas last week for three days for growth con. Like, like that is, that's, that is a community that I am very, very tight knit with and very close with. Another community is my GSD community. Another community is this community of multifamily investors that a boss is building. It's a community. Like the community is a group of people that you have the same, the like-mindedness, the same passion, the same vision, you're going in the same direction. Like literally when you get in a room like this, when you leave, you're so freaking fired up to go do what you're doing. You can't even stand yourself. And for me, as being in ministry for 12 or 13 years, if those of you guys that are people of faith, Proverbs 27, 17 talks about iron sharpening iron. 
Like when you get in a call like this or around the relationships like this in a community, like a boss is building of people who are going after like in this multi specifically this multifamily investment network and community. What happens is, man, you leave and there's going to, like boss said it, it's all about the relationships. You're going to have opportunity to be able to connect. You're going to have an opportunity to be able to meet some people that have done more than you have. Let me tell you why that's important. So community number one is that circle are the 10 to 12 people you spend the most time with. 10 to 12 people you spend the most time with. My best friend, Jeff, I mentioned him earlier, um, Forbes magazine, whole write up last year, called him the Tony Robbins of Persia. He's Persian. Um, he, he's, he is my best friend on the planet. I sat at his house this past year in Calabasas. Um, if you, if you know anything about Calabasas, it's a, he lives in one of the nicest, one of the nicest, wealthiest neighborhoods there. And I'm sitting, we're sitting out by the pool and Helen, his housekeeper had just brought us this huge tray of cut up fruit. And we're just sitting there by the pool. It's beautiful. Jeff leans across the table and he asked me this question. He goes, Ken, what's your goal this year? I said, dude, I want to make a million dollars. And he leaned over and he put his hand on my knee. He goes, a month or a week? I said, no, 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 dude, you don't understand. You don't understand. I said, I, my goal this year is 5.192 million in revenue, which will, which will net me personally about a million dollars in income this week or this year. And Jeff leans across the table. He puts his hand back on my knee. He goes, a month or a week? I'm like, damn, like I said, dude, listen, just let me catch up with a million dollars a year and then I'll catch up with the million dollars a month or the million dollars a week because he was dead serious with me. And one of the things you're going to get, so you got your community, large group of people you travel with. It can be 10X, it can be a boss's group. It can be our GSD community or our mastermind. In your circle, that 10 or 12 people you spend the most time with. Here's what I want to ask you this morning. When's the last time, when's the last time that you've taken an inventory of your circle. Who is in your circle? The people in your circle will determine the ability at which you're able to achieve and see the goals God's put, the dreams God's put in your heart come to pass. Hands down, number one thing. It is hands down the number one most important thing are those relationships in your life. It's not even close. Like literally when we finished our conference and in January, I got my report and we did over half a million dollars in revenue. I thought about the first time back in August of last year, what, six, seven, eight months ago, we did a hundred grand in a week for the very first time in revenue. And I remember hitting a hundred grand. I'm like, yes. And as soon as I hit a half a million dollars in revenue, I sent it to, I've got a text thread with all those guys, Jeff, Brent Go, Brian Covey, Randy Garn, Gary Brecka, and then Bit Keller. So there's actually seven of us on that text thread. I sent that screenshot from my QuickBooks to all of them. And I said, man, guys, I just want to celebrate with you guys. And this is this, these are the texts I got back. Dude, that's awesome. Half a million dollars a month in revenue, or that's half a million dollars in profit. Like, that's amazing. Now shoot for a half a million dollars a week. <laughs> like, like, they let me rest in it and celebrate it for about 30 seconds. And then they're already pushing me forward. They're already pushing me forward. So I want to ask you guys this question. When's the last time you took inventory of your circle? When's the last time you really looked at the 10 or 12 people that you're spending the most time with? The people that you're doing life with on a daily basis? Because I'm telling you, some of you guys already, you know there are people in your circle that do not need to be there. And let me say this, guys. I, again, I spent a long time in full-time ministry. That's awesome. Um, is it rain? I guess is how you pronounce it. That's amazing to be able to do that. It needs to be something that you're constantly evaluating and looking at. No different than you do for those of you guys who are on a health journey. You've got to be constantly assessing where those relationships are at. Those people that are in your circle, and then I'll get to, those are the 10 or 12 you spend the most time with. Those are the people. And there is, again, I spend a lot of time in ministry. I love people. I, 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 the one thing, and I'll, I'll get to this in just a minute, but the one thing I talk about, and I want you to write this down. The one reason I get around the people that I get around is because I want something for them, not from them. I want something for you. Become a person who wants something for people and not from people. I'm telling you, you will see relationships in your life that are absolutely unbelievable. It will blow your mind, the people that come in your life. So in that, there is a right way to get rid of the wrong people in your life. And I want to give you verbiage 
and how we communicate. One of my five core values is intentionality. And that's how we communicate with my team and how we communicate with the people that I love and our clients. Like there's a, there's a right way to communicate. So if you've got someone in your life and you know, or somebody in your circle and you know, they're not, they're not going in the same direction. They don't have the same goal. Like I literally had a conversation with myself this morning about a, somebody that's really close. Every time we go out, they're wanting to slam a bottle of wine or have four or five, six tequila shots. Listen, I'm all about a good glass of wine. I'm all about, I'm all about some good Casamigos repo or some 1942 on a block. But I ain't about eight of them. I'm not about six of them because I can't get up on Saturday morning and function and go to F45. Today I hit my 40th different F45 location around the country. I've lost 82 pounds in the last three years. Like I am locked in and laser focused. So I'm evaluating even this morning. And can, I, can this person, can this person stay in my life at this level? Or do they need to, or do they need to go from really from my corner to my circle into my community and maybe even not in my life that much at all? But let me say this to you guys. There's a right way to move the wrong people out of your life. How many of you guys have ever read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great? Give me a thumbs up. Read Jim Collins' book. Oh, my goodness. Okay, just write that down. Jim Collins, Good to Great, 20-year-old book. It's one of the top five leadership books of all time. Um, he talks about getting the right people on the bus and then getting them in the right seats on the bus and getting the wrong people off the bus. And this is in your relationships. This is on your team. This is in your business. This has everything to do with literally everything that you're doing. And you're like, I didn't come on a multifamily investment call to learn about relationships. But I tell you, this is the most important thing you're going to learn all day long. Because if you don't have this skill down and you don't understand what it takes to get th that level of people around you, because the level of people that are around you are going to determine the level that you're going to rise or fall in the dreams that God's put in your heart. So how do I get rid? How do I get rid of the wrong people? How, how do I do it? The, how do I, what's the right way to get rid of the wrong people? Here's, here's, here's a conversation. I'm going to give you some purpose. A boss, do you not love you, man? It, and what happens is you're going to create organically some separation and some distance. Uh, good to great by Jim Collins. Serata, good to great by Jim Collins. If somebody could type that in and check, that'd be great. Um, a boss, dude, I love you, man. And we've been friends a long time. And we spend a lot of time together. God's really put something in my heart. And I'm really going after this. I'm, I'm, God's put something really cool in my heart. And I'm really going after this vision. And... I probably, I probably, there's going to be some distance that's going to happen just kind of organically between the two of us, just because I'm, this is what I'm going after. I love you and I care for you right now in our season of life. We're just going after two different things. And I want you to know that the distance isn't because I don't care about you. The distance is because this is something God's put on my heart and I have to go after this. And if you want to go in the same direction and go after some of the same things, I'd love to, I'd love to continue to spend time with you. But outside of that, I, I've got to move forward. And listen, when you do that, when you have, and I know this is a business call, but when you have conversations and you, and you filter those things through a lens of empathy and grace, I'm telling you guys, it, it, it makes you an attractional human being. People want to be around you. So let's talk real quick. Community, circle, corner. Your corner are those two, three, four. I've got real, I've got, I mean, even out of my six, I've got probably I mean, I probably have, well, there's probably four in that six that are my corner. There are guys that I talk to. I've got a 90 minute call scheduled with Vic on Monday to talk about, we're doing, we're doing my conference now two times a year, one year, once in, in Atlanta in January and once in Dallas in July. I don't even think a boss knows this yet. And so we've got a call for 90 minutes on Monday to talk about what that looks like and how can we take it to the next level. And this is a guy who owns 17 companies right now. He just bought Cantoni Furniture in September for $292 million. This guy buys and sells companies. He owns Christensen Arms. It's the number one sporting rifle manufacturer in the country in Utah. Just won two or three of the big, I don't, I'm not a big gun guy, but just the big gun magazines, won rifle of the year in three different gun magazines like over the past, past week or past month. So I've got a call with him Monday. So how in the world do you get those guys in your, in your life? Three things. I want you to write all these things down. Number one is you got to be a person who wants something for them, not from them. Hmm. Yes, sir. Be hags, be here. Audacious goals. You've got to be somebody that wants something for them, not from them. Vic Keller back in August, we had a call. I didn't know Vic. One of my best friends is the CMO of one of his companies. 
And Vic and I just – he I happened to be on a FaceTime with Nate. Nate worked for John Maxwell forever. That's how I met John 20-plus years ago. I'm on a call with Nate. Vic walks in the room, and he's like, introduces us. And Vic and I just talk for just a few seconds. And they get off the call, and Vic's like, dude, I, I, I need to meet Ken. I want, I want to get to know Ken. He sets up a 15-minute phone call. Now, listen to me, guys. This is how quick your life can change. Like some of you guys are looking for investors. You're looking for properties. You're looking for stuff. Number one, you've got a boss on this call. I – I know a lot of people in this space, a lot of people in this space. I know very few people like this young man right here. I, I told somebody, I told somebody that this morning, I said, if I had a daughter that was single and I was looking for her to have a husband, this would, this would be the kid right here. <laughs> this would be the kid right here. And I'm just telling you, I have four daughters, but, but he, he would be like, Hey, have you met a boss? A boss? Have you met my daughter? I, in a minute, I would do it. Um, that's how much I think of this kid. I hop on a 15 minute phone call with Vic Keller in August, 15 minutes. I shared this story at my conference with all six of my guys sitting, except for Brian Covey. He was out of town to the daughter's um, soccer camp in Auburn, at Auburn University. So I had all, I had five of my guys sitting on stage and Vic gets up there and I shared this story. We had a 15 minute phone call. We get that 15 minute phone call turned into an hour and 27 minute phone call, like hour and 27 minutes. About the last 15 to 20 minutes of the phone call, Vic goes, man, dude, Ken, I, we're, we're going to be bro we're, we're brothers. Like, we connected. Like, you know when you connect with somebody, and it's not a, it's not a transactional or a bit, just a business relationship, but you have the same core value, the same vibe, the same energy. Like, you're chasing the same thing. You have the same DNA in what you're and how you're living your life. Vic goes, Ken, this is the question he asked me. Ken, what can I do for you? I said, dude, I don't need anything from you. He's like, no, dude, I, I love what you're doing. Man, you're so passionate about what – you might feel my passion in here today. Can you feel that? Give me a thumbs up. Like, I'm passionate about what I'm doing. Like, he goes, dude, what can I do for you? I'm like, Vic, dude, I don't, I don't need anything from you, man. I don't need anything. He asked me six times, dude, what can I do for you? And the, the last thing, the last time he asked me, I said, you know what you can do for me. I know what he's wanting to do, it's like this next step for him in kind of his evolution, his business and going out and starting his Epic MBA platform where he's going to train businesses to, I mean, he's, when he sold or when he had successfully acquired for Warren, he served as Warren's CEO for Berkshire Hathaway Automotives for three years, $11 billion a year company. And he was the CEO. So how many of you guys think he knows a little bit of something about how to grow a business? So I said, listen, Vic, I, I do, Man, we're we're gonna be we're gonna be bros. Like I can tell, I don't need anything from you, but I've got my mastermind in Scottsdale, Arizona, the first of November. There's gonna be some people in that room. I think would be would you would love to meet them. They're amazing human beings. Like as all those guys that I mentioned, a boss included, as good and successful as they are in business, they are as equal or greater than amazing human beings as they are businessmen and women, hands down amazing human beings. And I said, dude, Vic, there's going to be some people in that room you need to meet. There's going to be some people in that room like Randy Garner who sits on the board with Tony Robbins. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can tell you this, but if we keep this quiet, I can tell you. <laughs> tell us. Three, tell weeks, us. Three, three weeks ago, Vic sends me a picture. Not even, in my, not even to our text thread group, but just me. Actually sends me a video and he's sitting in Tony Robbins' basement. He spent three days with Tony. And he got there because of the relationship with Randy. So he come, he goes, I tell you what, I'm gonna fly my jet down. Now, Sunday afternoon, he's at, a boss was in this meeting. We had 44 people at my mastermind. Sunday afternoon, he's at Warren, Warren Buffett's house having dinner with Warren. Monday, he flies his jet down to Scottsdale. Tuesday, he's sitting in our mastermind. He walks in, he goes, guys, I'm gonna spend about 30 minutes. I'm gonna share with you everything I've learned from Warren in the past seven years. Turn all your cameras off, turn your phones off. And he made my videographers turn their cameras off. Did me a boss. <laughs> how many of you guys would, how many of you guys wish you knew what he said for that 30 or 40 minutes? Cause I can't tell you, I don't have the time, but I will, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this. He comes down and he spends not one day, but three days with us. And we get done and him and I are working a partnership right now that I think is going to, it's going to, it's going to change the lives of, of business owners across the world and, and done in a really, really good way. So number one, want something for people, not from people. That's how Vic and I, that's how Vic and I got really close. And, and, even, and even after that, let me say this. Be flexible 
in those relationships because between the phone call and the six weeks after when he said he was going to come to Scottsdale, about a week and a half after that phone call, I'm on the runway on a plane leaving Birmingham, flying to Dallas to record a TV show. And I'm flying from Dallas to New York City to speak for my buddy Josh York, Inc. 100, um, the 89th fastest growing franchise in the country. I'm speaking to his top 100 franchisees. I get a text from Vic. Hey, dude, can you come to Montana and hang out with me for this weekend? He's got a place in Whitefish, Montana. I, if you ever been to Whitefish, my it's it's insane. Like it's it's absolutely insane. And that is Andrea. That's my favorite quote. It's going on my Instagram post tomorrow. Be helping up people get what they want. Eventually, you'll get what 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 you want. It is absolutely hands down. You can ask a boss. I talk about it all the time. Um, he texts me and he goes, "Hey, can you come to Whitefish this this weekend and spend three days with me?" I said, "You better believe I can." I packed for two days. I packed for two days. Birmingham to Dallas for a day, spend the night, fly to New York City, speak the next day, fly home. I was gone for 48 hours. It turned into a seven-day trip. I packed for two days. I, I text my assistant and I said, get my stuff rerouted and get me to Whitefish out of New York City after I speak. And I went and spent three days with Vic. And after I got through spending three days with Vic, we, 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 we have been ridiculously good friends since then. Why? Because I didn't want something from him. I wanted something for him. And I'm telling you guys, if you will lean into this, I get emotional thinking about the relationships I have just because of that principle. So uh, this past year, my word of the year was intentional. I wanted to be intentional. And one of the things I did a year ago, like two weeks, two weeks ago, so just, just about 54 weeks ago, I finished my first, first Create Conference. A boss was that, at that. He signed up for my mastermind there. Um, those five guys, I didn't know Vic, but all those other five guys. And this is this is what I, I, I don't know how much, how much time do I have left the boss? Uh, you're good. We're, we're good on time. We've got about 20 more minutes. Okay. 20? Okay, perfect. Because I want to do a little bit of Q&A with you guys um, at the end. Last year, I finished my career conference. And I, the word God gave me for the, my year for last year was intentionality, to be intentional in my relationships. And so I... I text or called each of those guys that are on my list. And I said, hey, listen, I want to be intentional in building my relationship with you guys this year. And I'm willing to invest. And I want you to write these three things down. I'm willing to invest my time, my talent, and my treasure into building our relationship. I'm willing to invest my time, my talent, and my treasure into, in, into building our relationship and our friendship. I told you I was on the phone with Brent Go just a minute ago. Brent Gove has sold more mastermind seats. My mastermind's 40K a year. He's brought more people into my mastermind and sold more tickets to my conferences than I have. I, it's, 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 he, he literally just called me. He's going, dude, I got two more couples coming to our mastermind next week in Puerto Rico. <laughs> I'm like, dude, like, it's not like he doesn't have 30,000 agents in his organization, dude. I know you're busy, bro. I, how, do you, how grateful do you think I was when I got that call from Brent just a while ago? I'm like, dude, I had the greatest friends in the world. So I'm on a call with all, with all those guys individually last year. Brent was one of them. I called Brent on the phone. I said, Brent, here's what I'm going to do. I want to take our relationship to the next level. I'm willing to invest my time, which means I'm going to come see you. Brent lives in Puerto Rico half the year. So this year I spent seven days with him and Kathy. They're two of my best friends outside of our mastermind, outside of all the business stuff, outside of all the things we do to create conference. Um, I said, I'm going to fly down and spend, I think I spent six or seven days with him in Puerto Rico back in May. I want to invest my time. Like I'm coming to wherever you are to invest my time. I've been to, I've been to Salt Lake city to see Randy Garn probably five or six times this year. I've been to Calabasas to see Jeff probably four or five times this year. Who else have I got on there? Brian Covey been to Nashville to spend time with Brian, Gary Brecka been to Miami. I'm on the phone with Gary all the time. Um, Vic Keller, dude says, you want to come to Whitefish? You, you better freaking believe I do. My ass is on a plane coming to Whitefish. I'm going to invest my time. Now, listen to this. I'm going to invest my talent. How can I, in the sphere of influence I have, and the relationships I have, and the talent that I have, how can I help your dream that God's put in your heart come to pass this year? How can I help you get closer to achieving what you want and what God's put in your heart? How can I help you? achieve that. I'm on a call with Dr. Rob Kelly last year. He's the number one alcohol addiction doctor in the world. 
97% success rate. This guy's treated Will Ferrell, the chick who plays Wonder Woman, um, Bradley Cooper. Um, uh, what's the white rapper dude's name with all the tattoos? Um, crap, what's his name? Post Malone. I mean, dude, he, Stephen, everybody. He's, he's, he's helped every one of those guys get off alcohol. call 97. I'm going to call with him. We'll get through the podcast. And I said, Dr. Rob, what can I do to help you? He goes, what do you mean? I said, dude, what can I do to help you? He's British too. So we're both Manchester United fans. It's probably like we're, 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 we're tight. And he goes, can nobody ask me what they can do to help me? Everybody always asks me what I can do for them. I said, well, I'm not that guy. What can I do to help you? I'm on that phone with Brent Go, my time, my talent, and then my treasure. Brent hosts a conference called Build for EXP. It's a big, it's a big agent. It had 4,400, a boss was there this year, 4,400 people in Dallas. Tony Robbins was the keynote. Um, and then Gary Brecker spoke right before Tony. And then Dean Graziosi was right before Gary. So I'm back in the green room with, with all those guys, hanging out with those guys. And Brent says, I said, Brent, when's your Build conference? He goes, August the 19th, 20th, 21st, whatever the three dates was. I said, what's the website? He goes, build22.com. How many of you guys, you want to guess what my next thing I did was? I went straight to build22.com and I said, what's your most expensive? What's your most expensive ticket? I bought a front row seat for like four grand. I didn't ask him for a discount. I didn't say, hey, can I get a VIP pass because I'm your friend? I said, what's the, what's the most expensive tickets you have? I bought his most expensive ticket. I sat on the front row at Build. To my left was my best friend, Jeff. To my right was Gary Brecka and Sage, his fiance, then Brent Gove, and then Kathy, and then Dean Graziosi, and Randy Garn, and then the two billionaire Glens, Glenn Sanford, the CEO of EXP, and then Glenn Star Stearns, the CEO, undercover billionaire guy that owns a mortgage company. That's the front row. I remember, I remember looking at Gary Brecka, so I said, dude, I do not belong on this row. Like, this row is insane. Like, it's absolutely insane, the level of the cowboy, the people that are on this row. But how did I get there? Because I invested my time, talent, and treasure in, in, in him. So I went through all of my list of guys called Gary Brecker. Actually, let me, I take that back. Gary Brecker and I were on a Zoom call with me, Gary Brecker, Dr. T, um, who's a top NLP guy out of Chicago, and Dr. Rob Kelly. And we get done with wrapping this call up on this project we're working together. And I, I connected all those guys. Those guys did not know each other. Like my superpower is I'm a connector. So let me tell you something. If you're a connector, especially in this industry, in multifamily, if you, when you start putting deals together and you start drawing a boss or, hey, you have a finance guy or I'm looking for a property that's this cap rate or whatever the lingo is you guys use, I know a little bit of it. Um, when you start doing that, you start connecting and piecing deals and putting people together and you help other people win, you know what they do? They start opening up their sphere of relationships for you as well. I'm on that call with those four guys. I connected all those guys. Uh, Gary Brecka and, and Rob Kelly, they still do stuff together today. If Gary has anybody that has any kind of addiction issue, he sends them straight to Rob Kelly. If he has anybody that has any kind of mindset or NLP, he sends them straight to Dr. T. We're on the call. This is last year. And I said, Gary, dude, I said, you ready for growth con? I said, are you speaking? And dude, Gary, how many of you guys know Gary Brecka? Give me a thumbs up. You think I got energy? Gary Brecken makes me look like I sleepwalk. Like, this cat's got so much energy, it's insane. And he's like that 24-7. Gary goes, dude, I'm speaking on Friday. Grant gave me a 90-minute slot. I can't wait, dude. The next question he said, are you going to be there? I'm like, dude, what's the date? I pick my phone up. I'm looking at the date. I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, it's the same date I bought front row seats to go see Eric Church in Birmingham, Alabama. They cost me a 1000 bucks a piece. I'm like, damn, now what am I going to do? I'm looking at my tickets and I'm going, Gary, I'll be there, man. I'll be there. I picked the phone up and I text Jim Morales, who's Grant's CFO, who's a really good friend of mine. And I said, hey, I think I got a $10,000 credit on the account. Can you get me a diamond ticket? Jimmy texted me back about an hour later. and He said, you got it done. Here's your diamond seat. I basically gave my $1,000 seats, two seats. It cost me 2000 bucks to go see Eric Church, one of my favorite country artists, front row seats in Birmingham. And I gave those up to fly down to Miami to go see Gary speak. And when Gary came out of the shoot at GrowthCon, this was actually in Miami. This was last year. When Gary came out of the shoot in Miami, I was in the second row. And as soon as he saw me, <laughs> he was already going nuts and dancing and doing his thing. But as soon as he saw me, dude, he came up and bear hugged and picked me up off the ground. And I was there to support him the first time he spoke in front of about 4,000 people. 
guys, listen, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's really, really not rocket science. And now I get to spend time with, and I have one of the most unbelievable masterminds. And I built this, you know, the boss was at my very first one last May in a lake house in, in just outside of Atlanta, where I'm from at a lake house with 19 people. We started with 19 people. And now we have about 50 to 55 people. Y'all want to do the math at that? At 40K, a boss paid 50 because he's doing the thing with with um, with uh, uh, me and um, Vic Vic. Keller. Yeah, that, that's about $2.2, $2.3 million. Guys, I just started this three years ago next month. Like, it's there for you. And the number one thing, you when you start surrounding yourself, I have a quote in the bottom of my planner. Can y'all see it? It says, get in rooms with people who think bigger than you do. I used to write this in my 10X planner for a year and a half until I created my own. And now I had it printed on the bottom right hand side of every single page in my planner. Get in rooms with people who think bigger than you do. And that's exactly what you guys are doing right now. You're in a room and it doesn't matter. I tell you, the one thing I love about our community and the one thing I love about a boss is you can't tell. You cannot tell in that room. I talked about Doug Volsky, who's been in my community since day one. He's got a CEO ticket, 10K ticket to my event. He's sitting right in front of me three weeks ago in Atlanta. And I'll never forget, I did a small event in um, Scottsdale, Arizona, June, a year and a half ago. 55 people. I had Anthony Trucks, Carlos Reyes. If those of you guys in the wholesale, you know Carlos. Um, Sharon Lecter, co-author, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Were you at that event? Abbas, you weren't there at that one, were you? That's before I don't I think so. No. Yeah, it was small. It was like 55 people. It was like a 5K event. The last day of the event, I'm looking, and Doug is – Doug, proximity is power. That is That proximity is a cheat code. That's what I tell everybody. I'm watching Doug in the back row take notes in my planner. He's got a whole page full of notes. And I'll stop, and I'll open up for Q&A real quick. Um, I, I snap, I'm standing, standing back there with Carlos Reyes and Anthony Trucks and Jeff Finster. Jeff's a really good friend. He's a CEO of Everbowl, top 40, under 40 CEO in the country. Forbes magazine and entrepreneur. The kid's a stud. And the three of us are sitting back in the room. And I snapped a picture on my cell phone of all of Doug's notes. I sent it over to the, I sent it over to the tech guys. I said, get this ready for the TV. We had like a big 80 inch TV in the room. And I walk up, I put it on the screen. We had one more speaker to go for the whole weekend we were done. Everybody's tired. You know how it is. It's the last day of last day of a little boot camp mastermind. And I put it up on the screen. I said, guys. Some of you guys are tired and you're ready to go, but I want to show you this page of notes. I put it up on the screen and I said, uh, this is Doug's notes back there. Doug has no idea. I just took this picture five minutes ago. I said, Doug, I said, uh, what's your revenue goal this year? He said, $275,000. I said, $275,000 a what, Doug? He goes, a day. I said, for those of you guys who can't multiply real quick, that's about $91 million this year he's going to do in, in revenue. $91 million. How many of you guys like do 91 million in a year? And here's Doug acting like he's never made a dollar. And he's put himself in a room with those kind of people because he understands you've got to get around people who think bigger than you do. Um, Doug Boltsky, B-O-E-L-K-Z-E, I think is right. Abbas knows Doug real well as well. Uh, he's in South Dakota. He's got, he's got a very hard name, but it's it's Doug Bolsky. That's what <laughs> he's a stud. He is. Yeah. Listen, the first the first Zig Ziglar co- conference Doug went to, he was fourteen years old. This guy can quote people. It is I call him the sage of GSD. He is the wisest dude I've ever been around. You've got it. You've got to surround yourself. Um, is there a boss? Is there a way to do Q and A? Do they have to type? Yeah, absolutely. People can put whatever they want in the chat. Ask any questions you want. But before we do that, how many of you absolutely loved Ken's presentation? And this is one of my favorite quotes that he said: "Is is that you gotta want something for people, not from people." I always remember that because that's how he's been able to build these amazing relationships. I mean, people like Doug Volsky, people like Vic Keller, and all these other guys. Brent Gove, uh, by the way, and I, I met a bunch of these people through through. Can and I've been able to, uh, they've invested in my deal as a result of that, right? So it's all about being in the right community, wanting something for people. And that's how you establish these amazing relationships. But how many of you enjoyed that that talk? Put, put it in the chat, put a fire in the chat if you actually enjoyed what Ken was discussing. I'd love to see a fire in the chat. Let's blow up the chat. Come on. There we go. Oh, look at that. How'd you do that that quick, bro? 
That's Man, that's, that's that's quick. <laughs> I, don't, I don't I don't even I don't even know. I guess you got a little emoji button down there. That's right. Now oh. uh, we still have we still have a few minutes. We'll take some some questions. If anybody has a question for for Ken, put it in the chat. Can they, can they raise Can they raise their hand? In here yeah, or no? yeah, yeah, they could. Yeah, ra ra raise your hand if you've got a, If you've got a question, I'd, in the boss can unmute you. I'd yep. love to, I'd love to be able to take two or three questions from you guys. Let's do it. Let's do it. I gotta see how I can bring people up that raise their hand. That's the real problem. <laughs> I think when they raise their hand, it's gonna put. Oh, there you go. Put I got there. it. I see and it. You just yeah. Then you just unmute them. Yeah, Michael, we got Michael. Up? Hey, Ken. It's um, great, great talk. I mean, I appreciate what all what you had to say. I mean, you're you're on fire. You have a lot of energy, um, and I like your values. Um, but I, I'm curious. I don't really know a lot about you and your background. Like, can you tell me a little bit about you? Yeah, spent half the last 30 years in full-time vocational ministry, pastoring and planning churches. The other half, I spent a top producing mortgage broker from 01 to 08 when the world collapsed um, in the housing crisis back into ministry. And then from 2017 until now, back in real estate, I've got uh, teams with EXP in, Atlanta, in Georgia and in Birmingham. Uh, and I started three years ago. I met a little short, crazy dude named Grant Cardone. And um, my business just, I literally blew up. I made about a Made one hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars the last six weeks of twenty nineteen. Became a licensee with a Grant. Started my own consulting in GSD, and literally over the past three years, we've grown it. Um, I mean, we'll be multiple seven figures this year. Um, and I just I started the mastermind. I actually spoke at a mastermind in June. Uh, it was right the week after I had my thing in Scottsdale. I flew to another one in. Um, in Sundance, Utah, with Randy Garn. That's where I met Randy, and I met some really good friends of mine. And I knew that's what, okay, this is the next step of our community. Because I have an online community, but I knew the mastermind was the next step. And we started it, and we started our conference. And um, it's just- but, And by the way, I want to I wanna comment on, uh, Ken, do you mind if I share like what you did to put that event together? No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so this just shows you, I mean, this is a great example of putting everything on the line. I remember uh, the reason, by the way, I went to your event, Ken, I didn't know you at the time when you hosted your first big event, but I knew you were putting everything on the line. And I'm like, I got to meet this guy. I want to see what is he thinking. And what was going on is Ken literally put all everything he's saved, all his cash into putting in this big real estate. Not a, It wasn't a real estate event. It was a, it was a business event. And he literally bet on this, everything he had on the success of this event. He had, what was it? How much did you invest? Was it 200? Was about 250, about two, 250. I did it again this year. This year it was over three. And I did 300. the exact same thing. Yeah, I did the exact same thing again this year. But at the time, yeah. at the time when you first did it, that was everything he had. I mean, if that event had not it worked was, out, yes, it would have been a big problem, right? I'd, I'd have been, I'd so been in trouble. You want to be around people that are always pushing the limits like that. And that's why I came out. I wanted to meet. And that's why I ended up joining your mastermind for that purpose. I'm like, if this guy's doing this, I got to push. I got to push my limit. I got to get out of my comfort zone. And I think one of the biggest problems that a lot of us have is that we stick to our comfort zone. A lot of people would not take the, the risk that you took. But look at what happened since then. It's been a year and a half and your business has exploded. Oh, it's, it's, insane. it's insane. It's insane. Guys, I heard Grant Cardone say this a couple of years ago. And it's funny because it popped back up on a, you know, your Instagram stories, they pop back up. This was yep. like three years ago at GrowthCon because three years ago is the first GrowthCon I went to with Grant. And it was the, somebody asked him a question. They said, how do you know when you're close to making it? Like, how do you know when you're close to what you would say success? How do you know when you're close to breaking through? He said, it comes right after the moment you feel like you're about to lose it all. Mm -hmm. Woo! That's fire. Yeah. I'm telling you, even this year, I was on the phone with Vic Keller three weeks before my event. I'm going to do that. I don't yep. know if I'm going to be able to make it. <laughs> I don't right. know if I'm going to be able to get this done, dude. Like, this is like, I don't have investors. It's me. Yep. I don't. It's 350 grand. You start paying Ed Milet 85,000 and John Maxwell 85,000 and events and bands and production. And yeah, that's, that shit goes quick. And yep. it's, it maybe is, it's a risk. I continually go all in over and over and over and over and over. And you have to, exactly what a boss was saying. You have to take, you have to take risks. So how do we Michael, connect it with you? Um, do you have a website or? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just, just go, just follow me on here. I'll drop it in here. I, it's funny because this is a shortcut. I don't really use my card on. I don't even talk about being a card on licensee anymore. That's funny. That, that's how old this is. <laughs> um, just my Instagram is at Ken Johnson. Super easy. A at K-E-N-J-O-S-L-A-N. 
Okay. Um, just right there, boom, super simple. At Ken Johnson on Instagram is the best way. To yeah, make sure you follow on Instagram. Michael, appreciate that. Barry, let's let's bring up Barry. Yeah, go ahead, Barry. What's up, buddy? Yeah, yeah. You know, I just had a question. You know, I've noticed that preachers are really good. They're gifted, really actually gifted from God with relationship ability. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, not all personality types have that relationship ability. For those who don't really, you know, remember everybody's birthday, remember everybody's wedding, remember everybody's name, what city they came from, that stuff's so crucial. How, what do you, how, how do you recommend that the more analyticals or the more, the people that don't have that skill set by nature, what do they do to develop those relationships? Number one, I suck at remembering people's names. I'm the worst in the world. I absolutely suck at remembering people's names. If you're with me at an event, I, I, if you're with me in an event, Barry, I may go, Barry, go up and ask them what their name is again because I can't remember what it is because I suck at names. Like, so now I'll tell you, you mentioned birthdays. I'm tell you one thing I do, and this is great leaders are intentional in adding value. I have 5,000 friends on Facebook, so it's capped. Um, 5,000 friends in on my Facebook. I go every single day. I have 20 to 30 friends who's their birthday. I have a keyboard shortcut. Watch, boom. That's how quick it takes me. That's how quick it takes me to go. HB space. You see that? Mm -hmm. That's how quick it takes me to go down through there and DM everybody and say happy birthday. Y'all see that in the chat? Like it, boom, 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 boom. Takes me three minutes a day. Everybody that I has, a, I've already done it today. I've already went through it. I think I had 27 day. Boom, but took me three minutes. Boom, but, and they know. I Once or twice a week, people will say to me, because I don't care what your personality is. It's not a, do I have energy? Yes. Am I an extrovert? Yes. But I got lots of friends who are introverts who are great at building relationships. The key word for you is intentionality. So that, that thing, boom. Love it. I mean, literally, literally, this is how easy it is. It's like, boom, 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 boom. You're just Love going it. down through there. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Boom, 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 boom. This is part of my morning routine every morning. Part of my morning routine is I go on it on social after I do my Instagram. If you watch me, my morning routine is iron clad. Like I do not waver from my morning routine that you've heard John Maxwell say, you show me your daily or your morning routine. I can tell you how successful you're going to be. So I think in the relationship component, is it easy for me? Yes. But I think the number one thing, if you'll approach every relationship with that, that one principle, how can I want something for them, not from them? How can I be relational and not transactional? When you do that, I'm telling you guys, it's a shift in your energy and your energy will attract the right people to you. And so my morning routine, real quick, Frank, um, morning routine, I'm up at, I'm up at 4 a.m. I have an alarm at 4 a.m. It's funny, last week, I, and I say, if you need an alarm clock to get out of bed, your goals aren't big enough. I woke up at 3.59 the other day. I looked at my phone to see what time it was. As soon as I saw 3.59, I, I I snapped a screenshot. I'm like, yes. I put that on my Instagram. I'm up. I go straight to my to my playlist, whatever worship song. I hit it random or whatever I, whatever worship song pops up. I screenshot it. I go straight to my Instagram. I put that on my Instagram story. There's one on there from this morning. Every day, without fail, that's what I do. I go straight to my Uversion Bible app. I do whatever devotional I've got that day. From I'm usually while I'm listening, I walk downstairs. I grab my pre-workout. I've already mixed it up. My, my workout clothes are sitting in my chair in the corner of my room. I get dressed. I'm drinking my pre-workout. I do my quiet time. I walk in my podcast studio, flip on all my lights. I take my planner, goals, gratitude, affirmations, top three. Goals, gratitude, affirmations, top three. If you can't explain your goals to somebody that quick, they're never coming to pass. Uh -huh. They're never coming to pass. I have three different areas of goals. My real estate company, GSD, and personal. How easy is it? One 16 and 20, one person running my team, which I hired about two or three months ago, 16 million in transactions this quarter, 20 new agents to EXP on my team this year, 50, 100, 500, 1,000 for GSD, 50 people in my mastermind, 100 people in my community at 6K a pop, 500 people at my create conference, 1,000 of my courses sold. That's $5.192 million in revenue. Personal goals, lose 106 pounds. When I started three years ago, it was 66. When I got to 60, I moved it to 86. When I got to 80, I moved it to 106. 106 is where I'm stopping. That okay. time with my girls, I've got four daughters. Um, me, healed and whole. I have been on a journey. If you follow me on Instagram, you're going to see some very transparent stuff on me 
and I had my therapist at my conference. Like she came and shared about trauma and therapy and polarity in a relationship between a man and a woman. I mean, like some really, really deep, healthy stuff that you need to thrive in your relationships. And then I just set a goal. This is the craziest goal I've ever set. Right here it is. Look. It says 80s in 24. I started playing golf at 54 years old. I played six times. Uh, my goal in 24 months is to shoot in the 80s. Does anybody want to take a stab at why I set that goal? Who plays connect, golf in here? Connect, connect, connect with more people. Connect with more people. But this was even, this was a mindset thing for me. I wanted to dominate my mindset because golf is all about mindset. It is. It's everything right here. Yes, connect more people because all my buddies play golf and I don't. And I went to, I took my daughter to Top Golf one night. I did. I was pinging them. I've never hit a driver straight in my life. We went to Top Golf. I had a I had a, a, a little uh, mimosas, and I'm like, crap, I can actually hit a because I played softball my whole life. I can actually hit a golf ball straight. Went. I literally went from there and paid three thousand dollars, got fitted for clubs. I said, I'm going to shoot 80s in 24 months. So you got to check it. with me in about 18 to 20 months, and I'll tell you how that's going. Love it, guys. If you enjoyed Ken. Put a fire in the chat. This guy blew it out of the water. You want something for people, not from people. Always remember that. And don't forget to, to connect with Ken on Instagram. He's on there sweating every single morning. I see him sweating in the morning <laughs> at the gym. So uh, definitely connect with him on Instagram. Ken, appreciate you being here, man. You, you oh, blew it out of the water, man. I love you, man. I appreciate you. Hey, guys, <laughs> listen. Um, I'll say this again about a boss. There are very few people that I would – I, I mean, I've got some – close people that I would take time out of my schedule to do this. And all of those guys that I mentioned, I know Brent and Kathy, Brent and Kathy invested in what he's doing without even, he's like, do you want to see a prospectus? And he's like, Nope, we know you. We love you. We trust you. That, 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 That's that, right. That after we closed, after we closed, Brent called me and he was like, what deal did we buy? I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much love for being here. Thank y'all so much guys. Take care. All right, guys, if you enjoyed that, blow up the chat with a fire. I want to see how many people enjoyed Ken. He was phenomenal. I loved it. I loved it. Appreciate you, Ken. Uh, now, our next speaker, let me bring up this guy, Zach Hapnestall. If you guys don't know Zach Hapnestall, you're missing out on one of the biggest players in the industry. Zach got into the business literally just about five years ago. I think it was in 2017. And, uh, you know, it took him a year and a half to get his first transaction, his first deal in multifamily. But then since then, he, he grew from nothing to literally a billion and a half dollars in assets, a billion and a half in five years of being in business. When I actually first uh, made his poster for this event, he had 170 employees. And that was just about two months ago. He's already had 185 employees now, and he's expanded into multiple markets. I mean, this guy is growing rapidly. And this is one of the people that I personally learned from. I watch him very, very closely. He probably doesn't know that, but he's just, I mean, this guy is just on fire. So I'm going to bring up Zach. Uh, let me see if I could uh, add pin. You guys have to take notes during Zach's talk today. I and mean, this guy is just phenomenal. Zach, let me unmute you. There we go. Hey, what's up, Abbas? How you doing? Hey, great to see you, man. Are you at, are you, are you at your Dallas office or Phoenix office right now? No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually at my, my Phoenix home right now. I'm in my, my home office. So yeah, we're, Very cool. we were in Dallas this week though. We're in Phoenix right now. So Very cool, man. I love it. Well, I'd love to have you kind of introduce yourself and then just kind of tell your story and how you got to what, what you've got to and just kind of, you know, share with people how they could build, you know, another Rice 48 in the future. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on, Abbas. Really appreciate it. Thanks for making the time and excited to be here. And and yeah, I figure I can kind of go through my story, kind of, you know, how we've gotten where we are now. And then if we have time, um, I, I may, you know, share like a, a deck to kind of show you infrastructure we've created. We'll, we'll kind of play it by ear here. But yeah, so a little about a little about me. So, you know, my name is Zach Happenstall. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rise 48 Equity. So we're a value add multifamily company. So we're syndicators. We go out there and raise money from investors, you know, typically fifty to hundred thousand dollar checks to buy, you know, value add properties, renovate the interiors, exteriors, you know, increase the value and, and sell them. Um, and so we uh we now have done you know over 1.8 billion in, in transactions. We bought over 1.6 billion in um in acquisitions. We've done about 40 deals, you know, gone full cycle and sold 11 of those. And those have been, you know, strong returns for investors. And it's all been through what we call retail investors. Okay. We're raising money from, you know, everyday people, just like people on this presentation. We've never done any private equity 
um, joint ventures or anything like that. But, you know, a little bit about me, kind of how we got to this point. So, you know, I was just, I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, I just grew up in like a lower middle-class family, no real estate connections, you know, no rich uncle or anything like that. And probably like a lot of you, I, I was taught, you know, you need to go to school, you need to get good grades, get a degree, get a good job and et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I had a, uh, I had a, a football scholarship out of high school to like a division two school in Colorado. You know, I did that for a little bit, you know, realized I wasn't, I wasn't big enough or good enough to go to the NFL. And so I was like, well, I want to be a sports reporter then I really like sports. So I went and got a journalism degree. Um, I was a, a live news anchor and sports reporter for Arizona PBS um, and, and hosted a show on Fox sports network, Arizona. So that was really cool at first, you know, being on live TV and, and, you know, going through all that. But then I quickly realized I was like, man, you can't make any money doing this. And, and it's not as fun as I thought when it's your job. It's not like being a fan. And I was like, man, this sucks. I've got all this um, student debt, you know, and I'm, I'm barely getting by. I was like, I want to make money. And so when I was going to school, I was working full time nights and weekends delivering medical equipment, you know, just to pay for school. And so after I after I decided not to pursue journalism, I, uh, I, I went into healthcare marketing, okay, to, to just I needed to make money, I needed to pay off my debt, you know, get a better car, get get established, um, you know, financially. And so, um, of all things, I went into hospice marketing. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with hospice, hospice is like basically end of life care. So like mobile nursing, caregiving for people who have terminal illnesses that we go to their homes, you know, assisted living, things like that. So um, basically my job is I'd wake up in the morning and I would drive all around Phoenix and just cold call walking into hospitals, doctor's offices, assisted livings and build relationships with physicians, social workers, nurses. And when they had somebody who needed this hospice care, they call me. I'm the first person to meet with the family, you know, get them educated and get them signed up. And it's all paid for by by their Medicare. So it sounds really weird, but hospice is an extremely competitive and lucrative private business industry, you know, all reimbursed by Medicare. And, and Phoenix is actually the, the, the biggest market in the country for that. And so, you know, I was fortunate to really become probably probably one of, if not the top, you know, hospice marketers in the Valley here. And there's over a hundred plus companies. Um, and so by the time I was 23, you know, I was making like 150 K a year, you know, making more money than both my parents combined. Um, when I was 24, I got my MBA. Um, I was doing that at night and I, I paid off all my student debt, paid for my MBA cash. And I bought a house when I was 23. Um, and so I was, I was fortunate, you know, by the time I was 25, 26, I was making 200 K plus a year. I had no student debt, uh, no debt at all on my own house. And I was in a good spot. Um, but I was, I was miserable. You know, I got to the point where I was like, this is not what I wanted to do. This was supposed to be a short term thing. And I felt like I got caught up in like the golden handcuffs, you know, where you're making good money. You don't know, you know, where else you can make that kind of money, but you're just not happy. I didn't have, I, I was on call seven days a week. And so I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And so, um, you know, at January of 2018, I said, I, I said, you know what, I don't know what I want to do, but it's not this. I don't have any time to even figure it out. And so, um, you know, I worked my way up to director of marketing. I got sweat equity in that company. And so, you know, at that time, January 2018, I resigned and I sold my equity in that company and I had no idea what I was going to do. OK, I just knew that I somehow wanted to create passive income through real estate and I knew nobody in the industry. OK, I, I got my real estate license a couple of years earlier, but I never used it. It was just kind of like a backup thing I wanted to have. Um, and probably like a lot of you, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and kind of learned about, you know, assets and, and passive income. And so I quit the job in January, 2018, no plan. I had almost $300,000 of cash that I had just relentlessly saved for the past four years, um, do, like following the Dave Ramsey plan and getting a little bump from that equity sellout. And so at first I was looking at flipping homes and I was like, you know what, this is not what I wanted to do. This is transactional. It's the same thing I just left. And then I started learning about passive income and mobile home parks. And so I, my, my plan was, was like, you know what, I'm going to buy a mobile home park with my cash, my 300 K of cash and, and manage it. And that'll be my passive income and sail off into the sunset. So I, I, I cold called like 90 different mobile home park owners in the Phoenix area, trying to buy them on a seller carry. Um, and, you know, like six people actually answered my call or got back to me. Nobody wanted to sell. And, and it just didn't work out. It, I wasn't getting any traction. Right. And, and I started thinking about it and learning about it. And I was like, you know what? Well, if I did, if I did invest all my cash and bought a mobile home park, maybe I get like a few thousand dollars a month in cash flow, which is great. But, you know, that's not going to be like true financial freedom. At the time, it would have covered my costs because I was just a single guy. Um, but then I have no cash. Then what do I do? And so, you know, I was three or four months in now to have quitting this job and I was trying to figure out, you know, how can I, you know, really make a big impact in real estate? And so I, you know, I started listening to podcasts and I learned about multifamily. I learned about syndication and the whole, the whole premise of being able to raise money from other people 
and earn sweat equity or, or what we call, you know, GP promo and leverage my time and energy to bring opportunities to other people. And that really clicked because I was like, you know what? I have a lot of, uh, I have a network of like physicians, healthcare business owners, healthcare administrators who, you know, they, they hate their job and their life just like I did because they're constantly working, but they're stuck. They can't get out of it. Right. So they, they, they might need some type of opportunity. I could be that guy. And so then I decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to laser focus, lock in on multifamily syndication. So that was my focus. I started going to meetups, conferences. I started cold calling brokers, um, property management companies, attorneys, and trying to build out a team, you know, reading every book I could get. Um, Cause I hadn't, I had nobody, I didn't know anybody doing this. Okay. So this was literally just, um, just trying to, you know, create something from nothing. And so, you know, month after month goes by, you know, and, and now it's six months in, now it's eight months in, and I'm just burning through savings, right? Because I, I went from making, you know, fat checks every two weeks, making 200K plus a year, to now just seeing my savings dwindle down. And I had worked so hard the past several years to save up to that point. And it, and it was discouraging, honestly. I, I basically lost all my confidence. You know, I was like, I wake up in the morning, like, what do I do today? You know, like, like how do I move the needle? You can only call a broker, you know, so many times before it just gets repetitive. And so, you know, it was a lot of adversity that I went through um, during that time. But it really kind of hardened me and it kind of gives you that entrepreneurial mindset because you have a lot of people that tell you that you can't do it. You know, even my own family, like, what are you doing? Like you're making 200K plus a year. This makes no sense. And so it's kind of like making that sacrifice um, to knowing that I'm going to put in the work now because the upside is going to be so big that when I do it, you know, nobody's going to question it. Okay. But people don't see those times when you're going through the adversity on the front. And so, you know, long story short, it was 10 months until I got the first deal under contract. So it was October of 2018. Um, finally got a 36 unit deal under contract. And, you know, I was, I had just burned through a ton of cash by this point, like traveling around, going to conferences, investing in mentorship programs, you know, all these things um, that, that, and then having no income, you know, my mortgage and things like that. Um, and so, you know, I met, I met um, my first partner, Robert Shefchik. And so, and I had, I had no net worth of liquidity, keep in mind. Okay. My 300K was my net worth. Okay. And I owned a house. That, that was about it. So maybe I had like four or 500K of net worth. Um, and so I met Robert who his wife is a physician. You know, they had a decent net worth of a few million dollars, um, which would allow me to sign on the loan. So, so Robert and I tied up a deal, 36 unit deal in Phoenix, three, three and a half million dollars. And the plan was I had talked to all these people to, in the, in the previous months about, you know, this, what I'm doing. And they're like, yeah, I'm interested in investing. Let me know when you have a deal. So we get the deal tied up, you know, and, and 10 days go by, 20 days go by, 30 days go by. I'm $25,000 non-refundable now for earnest money. Robert's $25,000. None of these people want to invest that I went to. Okay. They, they, you reach out to them like, yeah, no, you actually haven't done anything yet. So I'm going to just wait and see how it goes. So, so we're like scrambling, you know, I'm like, oh crap, nobody wants to invest. What do I do now? So you know, we had to bootstrap this thing because we needed to raise $1.4 million. I've never done this. I had 165K left of cash. Okay. I put 160 into the deal. So I put all my money into this deal. Um, you know, I talked Robert to putting 275. I met a lady at a conference and, you know, talked her to putting in like 650K coming out of a 1031 exchange from a 12 unit she had sold. And then I met Bikron, our third partner, or who's now our CFO. I met him while we were in escrow. Like he had, we hadn't even met before. I talked to him to putting 150K and I found a couple other people. And long story short, it was a four month escrow. You know, it was a, a grind. It was really stressful, um, but it really, you know, grows you um, and grows your character. And we got that thing closed. Okay. So that was February of 2019. We got that deal closed. And so, you know, that was just a huge relief because it was 14 months from when I had, you know, quit the job to finally kind of getting the monkey off your back. And, and I kind of say, you know, you're quote unquote in the club, like you've done a deal, right? Because you go to all these conferences, these meetups, and there's thousands of people across the country that want to do this. But most people will will get discouraged and fall off. You know, it's just what I've seen from mentorships, things like that, these programs you go to. And so, you know, I felt relieved to have a deal, but I was broke. I had no money. Okay, I put all my money into that deal. And so I knew I wanted to scale and the plan was to syndicate. And even though I was going through the adversity in that escrow, that four month long, you know, grueling escrow, I knew that I wasn't going to stop. I needed to keep scaling. And I knew I had no more money left for earnest money because you have to have liquid cash to tie these deals up, get them under contract. And so um, I think it was like December of 2018. I was a couple months into that escrow. I was like, and I was, I was dating my then girlfriend now, now my wife, Grace. Uh, but I said, Grace, like I got to unload this house. Like I'm going to sell this house because I need earnest money. And that was my first house. I was never going to sell it. It was like a sentimental you know, value to me. So I listed that house for sale in December and I think it closed like March 
Um, and so I made like 120 K from selling my house. The next week we won a portfolio of two apartment deals. And I wired hundred thousand dollars, non-refundable day one into a portfolio of a 59 unit and a 76 unit. So I was like all in. Um, and I was like, we're going to, we're going to take these things down. Um, and so, you know, we actually did another, we, we did a tenant in common or a tick structure on that first deal, the 36 unit. We did another tick structure on that 59 unit deal. And then the 76 unit, we syndicated that. Okay. We, we raised money from investors and we figured it out. It was another four month long, long, tough escrow. And so you know, we got those first few deals done. And then in the summer, we got a 137 unit deal under contract summer of 2019. And we syndicated that and we closed it. So by August of 2019, I now was a general partner in $35 million worth of real estate, four different assets, right? Which was, you know, which, which seemed impressive. And I was like feeling good about it, but I was dead broke. I, I literally had no money. Uh, all my money was going to deal. I had $12,000 in credit card debt. Grace was covering our bills. Like she was paying everything with her job. And I had a non-compete um, with my previous company, the hospice organization, which was about to expire. And, you know, we weren't finding a lot of deals in the fall of 2019. I, I was feeling desperate, needed money. So I actually went back into hospice. So I, I took a position as a president and co-owner of a different hospice company in September of 2019. And I did that for 18 months. And so I had, a, I had another cushy W-2 salary. And basically the goal was to grow this hospice organization. When I started, we had 50 employees and we scaled that to 110 employees in 18 months and sold it to a private equity company. Um, but I was still running the real estate business at night. And so really, you know, really Bikram Sandu, our CFO, my partner and I run the company and he had a full-time W-2 job as well. And so from like September, 2019, all the way to February of 2021, we would be at our full-time W-2 jobs during the day. And every single night, you know, I shouldn't say every night, Monday through Thursday, we were on a Zoom call for four to five hours every night. Okay, just like from six to, six to 10, six to 11, going through, asset management of our current portfolio, underwriting new deals, acquisitions, you know, for, if we're doing through an acquisition of a deal, you know, I've had to go through all the lender paperwork, all this stuff to get that deal closed. Um, Cause we had no employees at that point. And so, um, so that was a grind too, where it's like, you're doing two things. And so a lot of people don't realize that I had to go back to work um, because I didn't have money. Cause people don't realize is that with these deals, investors have a preferred return. Okay. Which means hundred percent of the cash flow during the investment period is going to the investor we as sponsors aren't really making a lot of money until we've executed a business plan, sold the deal, given you, the investor, all your money back, plus caught you up on your preferred return. Then we start going through GPLP splits, right? And that's where we make our money on the back end, the, the promo or the carried interest, so to speak. And so, so you have to really invest on the front end um, to kind of just, I, my, my whole philosophy was like, I'm just going to barely stay above water personally. I just need to stay above water and survive because when these things start to sell, it'll start to pop and I'll, I'll, I'll be in a good shape. And so Basically, what happened was um, in the fall of 2020, we sold that first deal, a 36 unit. Okay, and we more than we've more than doubled the money, and so I was flush with liquidity, um, and and we started selling some other deals, and you started seeing this thing, you know, come to fruition. And so at the end of 2020, we converted our company to an S corp, um, so that we could start taking payroll, we start taking salaries, the three of us, um, and and really support ourselves. And so February of 2021. I quit the job again. And this time I was like, okay, I'm, I'm all in on real estate. Cause I was getting so busy. I, I was, I was not focused enough on real estate because I had this, I was the president and co-owner of this company. So it was like a consuming me and I was trying to do real estate as well at night. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't scaling the real estate company as well as we could have. And so February, 2021, I quit that job again. Um, and, and we were actually in the process of a sale. So I got cashed out, you know, got, got a few hundred K uh, which was nice. Um, from that hospice organization. And then I was all in on real estate. So we hired our first employee on March of 2021. Okay. So it's only been about two years now. Um, our first employee, which was an asset manager. Cause at this point, you know, we were getting, I can't remember, maybe a little over a thousand units. We started scaling, buying more deals. Um, and so we had an, we hired an asset manager. I hired a transactions coordinator who would now start doing all of the acquisitions paperwork that takes so much time, you know, working with the lender, the lender's attorney, our attorney, you know, all these different things that go in, go into that. Um, and we started building this out. So the, the good thing is those first couple of years, Bikron, Robert and I, we did every little minutia detail you can imagine with the company from marketing to asset management, to investor relations, to acquisitions, to accounting for the distributions. There's so much that goes into it that we knew every detail. So now we feel like we could start hiring people and training them how to do those detailed tasks because we had already been doing it, right?
right? So we could start to scale and build infrastructure. And so, so that's what we started to do is we started hiring people. We then hired a construction manager. Um, so we started doing construction management in-house. So we were still using third-party management um, at the time, but we first took construction management in-house, meaning that our staff is sourcing, bidding out, and managing vendors and construction crews daily on site. And so that was really critical so we could stay on schedule, on budget. And in 2021, we really caught our stride. Okay, so in, in the first, from like 2018 when I started through the end of 2020, so you're talking about three straight years, okay, because I, I started in January of 18. So like from when I started, it was three, it was 36 months. We had bought six deals, um, maybe like around 50 to 60 million worth of assets, okay, six deals. In 2021, we bought 16 properties worth 560 million just in 2021 alone. And then in 2022, we bought another 16 properties, just coincidentally, worth 860 million. And so, you know, we, we didn't have much to show. I didn't make any money the first three years. Um, but the last two years, we've purchased like $1.3 billion worth of real estate. And so what happened was, as we started to sell these deals and show that we were performing, we were getting flooded with referrals from investors. Okay. And it was a grind. Those first 10, eight to 10 deals was a grind to try to raise the money. And, and a boss knows it's tough when you don't have a track record, right? It's like, you can listen to all these podcasts. People say, oh, if you find the deal, the money will flow in. It's, it's not true. It's, it's never easy. It's always a grind. Um, you're raising millions of dollars from 50 to hundred K checks. So think about how many people you have to have in these deals. Like we have hundred to 500 individuals in every deal. Now a hundred is like, doesn't even happen. Anymore. That's low. You know, it's typically like 200 to 500. I um, mean, so it, it's a ton of a ton of networking, a ton of events that you have to do to kind of build your network. As we started to sell these deals and go full cycle and prove our track record, we started getting flooded with other referrals. We started to really ramp up, you know, our our marketing and, and things like that. And so, um, and so the, the biggest thing is like, okay, now we're getting a lot of equity demand, you know, we, so that people want to invest with us, which we're grateful for. But, you know, we have to be responsible if we're going to scale, meaning that we also have to scale our infrastructure, okay? We have to be able to operate these assets and not just get them over our head and, and buy a bunch of deals. And then we're not executing the business plan because anybody can buy a deal. But the real test is, can you do the value add plan? Okay, it's, it's tough. You're, it, there's a lot of logistics involved, a lot of admin involved. And so, um, you know, looking back, it was really a blessing for me to have to go back to the hospice industry because at the time I hated it. I, I, I did not want to go back into healthcare. I, even though I was, I was making like a 140 base salary as the president. So it was a good, good salary, I had bonuses, but I was just really unhappy having to do that because I was already focused on real estate, but I had to do it. But it was valuable because it gave me firsthand experience how to lead an organization and how to scale infrastructure very quickly. Because like, like I said, we went from 50 to 110 employees at that hospice company by 18 months. And so I learned how to you know, recruit, um, interview, hire, train, build infrastructure, delegate, you know, create different levels of directors and managers to build their teams from the top of a company. And so I was then able to apply that experience immediately to our real estate company. Okay. And so now, um, well, I guess I'll go into the fact that, you know, the next big step for us was that in 2021, we started our own property management company, okay, which is a beast of an undertaking. We had over 2000 units by that time and third party management was working okay up to that point. But what started to happen, as many of you guys know, depend, no matter what industry you're in, is that there was a ton of turnover um, at the property levels because there just wasn't a lot of talent out there of labor. Like people didn't want to work. They were all getting these COVID checks, you know, and stimulus checks. And so in a matter of five months, we had four different on-site managers turn over that were working for the third-party management company because other property management companies would just show up on site and offer them more money and pick them off and they would just leave. And so we were starting to have turnover at the on-site level. And I was talking to other people I knew in the industry. So yeah, same thing's happening to me where it's starting to become like a labor war. Like these people are just leaving for more money. And so we, I'm looking at the business model of third-party management. And let me tell you, if you want to make money, do not start a management company, okay? It's a crappy business model. It's, it's very low profit margins. And these third-party property management companies, you know, their whole purpose is to manage assets for a fee-based a fee service, okay? And so they simply cannot afford to compete by offering the best compensation, the best benefits to attract the best talent. And that's why we we're having turnover. So in 2021, we said, you know what? We're, we have too many units. We have to keep scaling. Um, and, and fortunately, our asset management team was micromanaging. Like our employees were micromanaging the property management staff to make sure that the properties were not negatively impacted. But then it was distracting our asset management team. And so um, we said, we got to take this in-house. So we started our own property management company. 
Um, and we started, you know, hiring maintenance, all these different staff. And so, you know, we, we immediately scaled, you know, to a, a lot more employees. Okay. And we started building that up and, you know, it took us almost 12 months to break even. We invested about $800,000 of our own personal cash into that management company. But the whole philosophy of us starting the management company was that we don't need to make money off of this company. We just want it to break even and support itself because we want to be able to offer the most competitive compensation in the industry and the best healthcare benefits in the industry to recruit and retain the best talent. Okay. And so that's what we do. So we're, we're extremely aggressive with compensation. Um, we'll pretty much match or beat anybody if they try to counter us. We cover 100% of all the medical, dental, and vision for every single employee. And now we have over 200 plus full-time W-2 employees on full healthcare benefits. Okay. So we have like 190 full-time W-2 in Phoenix. We now have a little over 20 in the Dallas market, which I'll kind of talk about. We've expanded to recently. Um, and then we cover 50% of all the benefits for, um, or I'm sorry, 50% for dependents um, for all of our employees. So these are very, you know, competitive, attractive things when employees are, are looking to leave. And, and again, I had been an employee, right? And so I know what golden handcuffs feels like. And, and we want to golden handcuff our people. We want them to be happy and enjoy the company, right? With, with the culture, of course. But we also want them to know you're not going to make more money going somewhere else if you leave, leave Rise 48, right? We want to be the best. And, and the message that we constantly preach at these all staff meetings is that, you know, we want to be the best company. So we want the best people. And if you're an elite talent, we're going to be compensated like an elite talent. Okay. But if you're not, you're going to be held accountable and we're going to let you go. And, and it's just very, you know, it's very straightforward with kind of how we run the company. And so it's, 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 it's all kind of, you know, it attracts the best people. And so that has been critical for us um, as we started to scale, because now, you know, we've purchased 40 assets, about 7,000 units. Um, like I said, $1.6 billion in acquisitions. And, um, and I think that if we didn't have the control of the property management, the vertical integration, I think it'd be very difficult for us to succeed now because, you know, what you're seeing now in, in Phoenix, Dallas, across the country is that, you know, since 2022, really since like, you know, second quarter of last year, organic rent growth is normalizing and decelerating across the country. Okay. And so operations have never been more important and construction management has never been more important. You know, the last five to seven years, anybody could buy a deal and call it a value add deal and buy a deal, do nothing. Okay. And then organic rent growth will increase cap rate, cap rates will compress and you sell the deal in a couple of years and you hit a home run and you look like a genius. Right. And, and we've been benefactors of that as well, but you know, we've been fortunate to be able to build true infrastructure where we do all the construction management in-house. So we're sourcing, bidding out and managing all of our own vendors and construction crews, manage them daily on site. The last couple of years, one big thing that we've done as well to make us competitive operationally, we purchase all of our materials directly wholesale from an overseas manufacturer, okay? So, and we do a much higher level scope than most of our competition. For these 80s value add deals, most people are just resurfacing countertops, they're painting cabinets, they're putting in black appliances because that's, that's all you can afford to do. It, it doesn't make sense economically to spend more money um, to get X rent, rent bump, right? Well, what we did a couple of years ago is we transitioned to controlling our supply chain completely, okay? So we buy all the materials directly wholesale from overseas, and we do a much higher level scope. So we do, you know, brand new gray vinyl plank flooring. We do a real quartz countertop with undermount sinks, modern plumbing pull-down fixtures, subway tile backsplash, stainless steel appliances, brand new cabinet boxes, you know, LED lighting package. So it's a, it's a class A luxury interior finish, but it's in a workforce housing type of product, which is still affordable and where the bulk of the people live. So that allows us to, you know, really increase those rents, which increases the value of the asset and get the, the profit margin for the investors. And so, you know, all these things that we've done operationally have made a huge difference from taking property management in house, controlling our supply chain, doing construction management to allow us to, to continue to scale going forward. Um, and so and those are some of the, the big things that have that have really helped out. And we've had kind of give people an idea, like we've had the equity demand now for over two years to expand to a new market. Okay. Cause you know, we pretty much done everything in Phoenix to this this point. Like I was born and raised in Phoenix. We have a corporate office in Phoenix. We bought 39 deals, you know, over 6,500 units. We're the number one buyer of apartments in Arizona over the last year. And we're the number three buyer the last five years. Okay. And we didn't even start five years ago. So we're right up there. Like we just passed Blackstone, Goldman Sachs, life insurance company. So, you know, we're by far the biggest, you know, private retail syndication group raising money from retail investors. And we're competing with the biggest private equity groups in the country. 
Um, and so we wanted to make sure that before we, we scale or, or we expand to a new market, that we truly have our infrastructure built out and that all of our systems and processes are, are built out. And so that's what we've been focused on. And so in beginning of 2022, the plan was that in 2023, we were going to expand to Vegas because Vegas had a very similar you know, fundamentals to Phoenix and it was close. But once interest rates started to go up and we started seeing a recession coming, we're like, you know what? We don't want to touch Vegas because it doesn't have a very diversified employment base. It did not perform very well during COVID, whereas Phoenix did very well during COVID because we've diversified employment. And I'm just like, you know what? We, we, we can't go to Vegas. Um, what's the best market? Like, what do we think is the best market in the country as far as diversification of employment, you know, strong population growth? We think the best two markets in the country are Phoenix and Dallas, Texas. Okay, so we just expanded to Dallas. And so in December of 2022, we opened up um, an office, a 9,000 square foot office in downtown Dallas. We started hiring out all of our leadership staff. So we hired like a regional vice president who has 20 years experience in that market, you know, a, a regional director for our management company, an asset manager, um, and, and the full office staff, HR, you know, HR coordinator, marketing coordinator, IT person. And so we started to build out that infrastructure. Uh, my wife and I bought a second house in Dallas in December. Um, and so because so Bikron and I, you know, our, our CFO, we have biweekly operations meetings with our entire staff in Phoenix. So we go through our, our VP of ops, Kaylee, you know, she's in that meeting with our four regional directors, our marketing director, and we go through every single asset and we go through various metrics to make sure that those deals are performing as schedule. Well, we want to have that same accountability and, and schedule in the Dallas market. Okay. And so, you know, we bought a house in Dallas because we're there every couple of weeks now. You know, I was just there this, this week, you know, a few days ago, we were there two weeks ago. And so we're, we're going to be there and we're splitting time in Phoenix and Dallas going forward so that we have that same accountability in that same exact platform that we have in Phoenix where we're vertically integrated. And our supplier, one of the big reasons we went to Dallas as well is that our supplier has two warehouses in the United States. One is in Phoenix, one is in Dallas. Okay, so basically we're buying everything directly wholesale. We'll give them a forecast of, hey, we're gonna buy these hundreds of units worth of materials months in advance. They manufacture it in their overseas um, manufacturing plants. They ship it to their warehouse here in Phoenix and Dallas. And then they'll create these custom kits inside the warehouse where they drop two pallets inside the unit. And, and, and our guys just come in and unwrap that unit or that pallet. And it has everything already custom measured and cut for that unit, as far as the exact flooring, the prefabricated quartz countertops, all the hardware, the cabinets are already built and assembled. And so we have that same, you know, kind of like assembly line type of supply chain, we can just continue to crank through these renovations and to give people an idea. I mean, I have no doubt that we're renovating more units per month than anybody in Arizona right now. And right now in February, we're renovating 240 units, you know, just this month alone, um, we're doing another 200 units next month in, in March. And we've done well over a 1000 last couple of years. And so you know, the expansion to Dallas is is really, you know, a continuation of, of what we've already been doing um, and kind of having that same vertically integrated model. And, and we like Dallas um, just because it's, it's diversified. You know, like I said, strong job growth, strong population growth. Our goal this year in 2023 is to acquire 3,000 units in the Dallas market. Okay, so we, we just bought our first deal um, two weeks ago in Dallas. We got a couple more under contract um, to close. So we'll have about 850 to 900 units um, by end of April. And, and right now, you know, boss, I can kind of give people an idea of kind of what the, the competitive landscape looks like. Um, Cause some people might say, well, how do you enter a new market? You know, if you've never been there and get that kind of scale. So in Phoenix, we we've been, you know, really, we, we, we've, we've been really good at building relationships with local real estate brokers. Okay. So give people an idea when you're talking about the hundred plus unit space, I mean, these deals that we buy are anywhere from at least 20 to $100 million uh, purchase price. Okay, so we're raising anywhere from 15 million on the low end up to 30, 35 million of cash equity from investors per deal. Okay, so like it's a very competitive, you know, and, and sophisticated institutional type of competitive landscape. And so there's like five to seven brokers in the Phoenix market who have each been doing this 10 to 20 years and they control 90% of the inventory. Okay, so like they just are basically gatekeepers. So if you don't have relationships with these brokers, you're not going to see a lot of these deals. You're not going to be able to close um, on a lot of these different deals. And so, um, you know, basically the majority of our acquisitions now have been completely off market through these broker relationships. And so what we've done is we went to these Phoenix brokers and we said, hey, you know, tell us who are the top brokers, who are your colleagues in the Dallas market? And they've referred us to those top people in the Dallas market. And in November, we went in there and we talked to all these top groups 
and basically, you know, said, hey, this is our track record. This is what we're doing. And, and you know, it's kind of cool that we already had a lot of built-in credibility um, because a lot of them had already heard of us and we were kind of already endorsed by those Phoenix brokers. So we've started to get a lot of good deal flow in Dallas and and we feel strong, you know, go, kind of going forward um, in, in regards to that. So that's that's kind of like the uh, the overview of, of kind of how we've gotten to where we are now. And I don't know if there's questions, boss that we want to go through or. I, 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 you know what, Zach, I could talk to you literally all day just asking questions, but I am going to give the opportunity to everybody else uh, for everybody else to ask questions. But you know what I want to emphasize is that you guys have absolutely crushed it since you started just a few years ago. But if you think about it, when you first started, you didn't start where you're at right now, where you have hundreds of employees, you've got all this money to build, you know, take out a 9,000, you know, square foot office. He started with nothing. I mean, he literally had to sell his house in order to have that 150,000 so he could put up 100,000 into these apartments. So you guys got to focus on that. Because a lot of us are not where Zach is currently, but he's he's a role model. He's somebody that you could be like if you work as hard as this guy does. I mean, he's he, I see him all the time. He's constantly working. He's he's constantly hiring people, taking massive action, and most importantly, putting it all on the line. And so that's important for a lot of you guys that are just getting started into this business. Because like I remember on my first deal, I I was buying a six and a half million dollar deal. We had a two million dollar raise, and it was a struggle. You know, it was a big, big struggle. The second deal I did was 30 million. We had to raise eight. Same exact thing. I mean, I remember waking up in the middle of the night, just shaking, thinking, how far away am I from that $8 million raise? And so I'm sure you went through a lot of that same same stuff, um, but everybody does. You know, it's just part of the process. But what I want to ask you, Zach, is you've got amazing partners, right? You've got Robert, you've got Bikron. How did you meet these partners and how did you realize that they were a good fit for you to work together? Yeah, and that's a great question, Abbas. And so, yeah, I mean, your your partners are so critical because um, you can't do everything on your own, right? It's like I like I underwrote the first few deals we did, um, but you know, Bikron is is a lot smarter than I am, you know, and a lot more intelligent when it comes to underwriting things like that. And so, I met Bikron and Robert at a conference in Dallas, and before we decided to partner up, I had like quote unquote, you know, dated seven or eight different business partners up to that point. And by that, I mean you you meet people at conferences, you meet them at meetups, you meet them through virtual meetups like this. And you say, hey, do you want to work together? Which market do you want to do? And you say, yeah, okay, let's start underwriting deals together. Let's start touring some deals, making offers. And so what I started to realize is that some people don't want to work as hard as you. Okay. Yep. So they'll talk like they have big goals, but then when it's time to grind, you know, they're not there. Okay. So you don't want to be the one that's always doing it. Um, you know, some people were really experienced. I don't bought a thousand units, but then you realize they're just kind of take advantage of you because they want to be in a market. They want you to do all the work and they don't really do anything. And then like I had one guy where we got along really well, you know, super hard worker. We had a nightly call for two months where we were going through deals and underwriting. And then I got to the point where I realized I was like, you know what? I told him, I said, you and I have the exact same skill set. Okay. So like I need a true elite finance guy. Okay. Like you and I are both kind of like the acquisitions guy raising capital. And I need somebody who's truly elite because like, I hate underwriting. Okay. I hate sitting in front of spreadsheets, drives me crazy. It's not something I want to do. And so when I met Bikron, Bikron was truly the ultimate complement to my skill set. Okay. Where, you know, he has an economics degree. He's a CPA. He worked at Price Waterhouse Coopers as a corporate auditor for a number of years. So very elite financial analysis background. And he doesn't want to talk to people. He loves spreadsheets. Okay. So it's kind of like the opposite. So you have to find those complementary skill sets. Um, and, and Robert, you know, Robert has a, a construction background. So Robert's our chief construction officer. So he has a master's degree in architecture, strong construction background. So he's overseeing all of our large capital item projects, as well as the interior renovations, making sure those are staying on schedule and on budget. So yeah, it, it took time. It's not like we just find these people and it, and it instantly clicks, you know, and I've had other partners on, a, on the first few deals that you don't work with anymore, you know, for different reasons. Um, we had a couple of deals where we took pref equity from some people and they were, you know, nightmares to work with. And so it's, it's never, you know, all, all happy times. It's, it's, it's a grind and you have to really, um, you know, be careful who you partner with and you want to find people who, um, that you like, who have complementary skill sets and who have the same goals as you, um, because it, it takes everything you've got, you know, to really, you know, buy these properties. It's a lot of work. 100%. No, I, I love that. I mean, finding people that have different skill sets is very important. I think one, one problem that everybody has is that, 
you know, because you prefer to do a certain role, you tend to gravitate towards people that are just like you, because naturally we like people that are similar to us, that have similar values, similar beliefs, right? Similar focuses. And so I notice I notice that all the time, people that are good at investor relations, partnering up with other people that are good at investor relations, but there's nobody that's bringing in the deals and doing the acquisitions and so vice versa, right? So you have to find people that are complementary to you. My other question is, you know, you've been you've been doing this now for a while and you've you started hiring in March. How has hiring changed your business and ha- helped it explode the way it has? Yeah, it's 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 been critical. And so, I mean, you have to find the right people that have the right skill set for what you need to do. And so um, and, and initially it was getting like bogging us down so much because it's like, you know, initially Bikron and I were putting out ads. We were you know looking at all the all the applications that were coming in, screening oh. resumes you know, doing phone calls and then having these in-person interviews. And it became too much, especially when you start to scale with a property management company. And so the biggest thing we've done really in the hiring department is that we've hired a full-time in-house recruiter. And so, you know, Asha is our recruiter. Basically, she's putting up Indeed ads literally every week for different different positions on the corporate side, the property management side, where she's screening these, these resumes, making sure that they meet what we need. She's doing initial phone calls. And then we'll have like three steps typically, depending on the level of the employee of that position in order to see if they are the right person, you know, for that job. And so you have to be able to continue to build that infrastructure and delegate different tasks because you only have so much bandwidth, you know? And and one thing that comes with hiring too, is like, you have to understand that it's literally a labor war right right now. Okay. Especially in this multifamily, especially in property management. So you have to be, be an attractive company to work with. Like we have a 401k program now. I mentioned all the benefits that we cover. Uh, we now have a, a corporate bonus structure where employees can earn 20% annual bonus of their of their salary. And so all of these different things are, are really important. And I mean, as, as far as like what's been the most successful is, you know, Indeed is, is where we get the most leads. You know, we, we do um, ads on LinkedIn as well. Um, but really like referrals have been super successful, okay? Especially in property management where people have worked with strong leasing people, strong property management staff at other places and bring them in. But at the same time, you have to realize property management is a very high turnover industry, okay? And so like a lot of these people are entry-level employees. And so if in the first 90 days, if they're not working out or they're not the right one, then I mean, Arizona is a right to work state. We'll just let them go. And, And you have to be willing to do that and you have to empower your staff to do that, okay? And, and there has to be, we've got four full-time people just in our HR department um, with, with everything that we have going on. So you have to make sure that you're complying with all those HR regulations, but you also have to make business decisions where, you know, maybe this guy started a month ago and, and maybe you want to give him an, an, an extra chance, but he keeps messing up. Um, and if I keep him on, like we just had this conversation last week with, with somebody, a maintenance guy, you know, he's creating issues with other staff. Do we want to give him another chance or is he just a cancer? Do we just, do we just cut him right now? You know what I mean? So these are the different things that you have to make decisions on as you're scaling a company and kind of building out the infrastructure. I love it. And it seems, I mean, I want to reemphasize to everybody, you're hearing Zach talk. I want you to think of Zach as who you'd want to be in the next five years, not who you're going to be right now when you start out. Because when you start out, you're not going to have the HR, you're not going to have the budget to do all of that. But you start from the beginning and then you just kind of work your way up. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes skill. And that's why you want to attend meetings like this and hear from people like Zach so you can see where he's at and start modeling your business to follow along the same path. I'm going to open it up for questions. If you guys have any questions, by the way, before we ask any questions, how many of you are enjoying this? Put a fire in the chat. We've got some trolls in the chat we want to ignore. Put a fire in the chat if you're absolutely loving Zach and he's added value to you and your business. I want to see fires in the chat. Let's blow up the chat. He took time out of his busy day. It's a Saturday. He's on here, you know, adding value. I I didn't pay Zach anything. He's just doing it to help people out. And so, Zach, I I appreciate what you're doing, man. Um, But I want to open it up for questions. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to pull up a few of you guys. So go ahead and raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, I'm going to be able to see who you are and I'll unmute you. And uh, you could ask Zach any question you want live. Uh, We've got Rob. Sitting in, a, in an empty office, it seems like. <laughs> we can't hear you, Rob. Let me unmute again. Let's see. Maybe. There we go. Maybe? Perfect. Hello? We can hear you now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the UK, so everyone's at home on Saturday, so I'm just chilling. But Zach, oh, an absolute 
value, man. Un- insane, insane insights. Really appreciate all of that and so much to like to learn from. Like honestly, absolutely incredible. Um, but my question was kind of because I'm I'm much earlier on in, in in my journey than you are, and I was wondering when you were first getting started, were you making your own underwriting models or did you use somebody else's? Because I'm in the process of building my own out, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts or advice around that. Yeah, no, no, great question, Robert. Thanks for joining, man. Really appreciate it. And so, yeah, we actually initially I bought. I don't know if you've heard of Michael Blanc, uh, but he's got like a podcast. So I, I know I think a lot of people have, are familiar with his his what he calls his SDA, the Syndication Deal Analyzer, and so. We used that initially and it was it was somewhat helpful, but as we started kind of getting deeper into it, you know, my partner Bikron created his own model, you know, which is more sophisticated. And, and that other model you know, just started kind of seeming kind of kind of wonky, you know, here and there. But I think that I think, yeah, when you're starting out, you're not going to know how to create your own model. And I don't I, I could not create an underwriting model myself. There's no way I could do it. That, that's not my skill set. And so, um, yeah, I think that initially there's different models that you can buy through, whether it's through Michael Blanc. I mean, there's a bunch of different mentorship programs that have their own model. Um, there's I think someone bigger pockets. So, yeah, I think initially it's a good idea. When I when I bought that model, it was like 120 bucks or something. Right. So it's, it's definitely an investment that makes sense so that you can at least start to run the exercise of understanding how different assumptions affect the economics, things like that. I love it. No, and we, we, we did the same thing. When I first started, I used someone else's model and then I built my own. I think that's kind of a natural path that everybody does because the way you underwrite is kind of different. And then you, you start realizing, oh, I need this other feature that this model doesn't have and this model doesn't have, right? And so as you switch models, you just start seeing deficiencies, but you're not going to start there. You're going to start with someone else's, start the easy way, and then just kind of build up your way to it. Um, any other questions? If you guys have any questions, uh, raise your hand and I'll be able to pull you up. But I'm I'm personally enjoying Zach's stock. I'm learning a lot. Uh, we've got another person. Let me unmute. Perfect. I don't see your name on there. So I see Dorian, but I know you're not Dorian. You're unmuted now. Hi, my name is Ray Chorfi. Uh, thanks, Zach, for all the information. I appreciate it. Um, I think it's very inspiring what you've been able to do. And I'm in the Dallas market as well on the uh, students of a bus. Um, question for you. Do you think that uh, it's harder in today's landscape, in today's uh, you know economy, to raise money or to raise capital, or do you think there's plenty of um, capital to be raised and you know private money and you know and, and things? And also the second thing, as far as strategy, uh, I know there's a lot of construction in the Dallas market, multifamily in the DFW market. So is that a concern at all, or do you think you rent growth? should be able to um, continue and be sustainable. Yeah, no, no, thanks so much. I appreciate you joining. Great questions as well. And yeah, I'll, I'll touch base on your question in regards to, you know, what is the challenge right now of raising money and, and why is that a challenge? And I'll kind of also go into, I know, I know I'm reading all these comments and I know, I don't know if it's one guy or a couple of guys who, who are saying, oh, everything's been, you know, hunky dory the last few years. It's been a strong market, makes anybody look smart. And so, hey, man, that, that's fine. You know, bring it on. That, that's what we always been hearing. And we'll talk about what we've done operationally to why we're still doing really well and why we can still raise money and what the differences are. And so to give people an idea, um, you know, the market's been really strong the last several years. But obviously last year, the Fed started hiking rates in March of 2022. And this has been the most drastic increase in interest rate hikes in this short amount of a time since the 1980s. Okay, and so what's happened is interest rates have shot up so quickly that a lot of deals right now across the country are negatively cash flowing. And in the last eight weeks alone, there are big name sponsors across the country doing capital calls, very widespread. Okay, and for those of you who aren't familiar with what capital call is, it means that your property, you've run out of liquidity at the property level. So now sponsors are going to investors and asking them to infuse more money into the deal. And when you do a capital call as a syndicator, it's, it's a huge black mark on your reputation, okay? It's basically like career suicide because that's the biggest thing investors wanna know is that I'm giving you 50K up front. I don't, I don't have to put more money in later on. And so what's happening is that there's a ton of capital calls going on. We're starting to see distress throughout the market. I spoke on a few panels about five, six weeks ago in uh, Laguna, it was a private equity conference. And so I was on a panel with Blackstone and other big you know, private equity REITs and a lot of these guys I was talking to throughout the, the conference said that these biggest private equity companies in the country are doing are doing capital calls right now, okay? Because they didn't see these interest rates coming. The difference is, is that private equity groups, institutions are very sophisticated. They're just going to infuse more capital. They're, they're very well capitalized. They, they have a ton of money. They understand what's happening. 
with retail investors, if you do a capital call with a retail investor, they're going to get pissed off, right? They're not going to want to put more money into the deal. And so what's happening right now is that across the country, especially the last eight weeks, what I've been seeing, because we've give people an idea, we have over 5,000 individuals on our investor list, over 4,000 have actually invested so far, 4,000 individuals. So it's a lot of people, a lot of our investors have invested with different sponsors throughout the country. So we always are getting feedback. We have a good pulse on what's happening to different people. There's a lot of hesitation right now throughout the country with retail investors because people are wondering, hey, is a capital call coming? Is this deal going to fail? And so literally last week, I decided let's do a, a live state of the portfolio webinar to our entire investor base where we make it very clear. And the whole point of that, that whole, the whole point of that entire webinar was that at Rise 48, we've never done a capital call. We have no plans of doing any capital calls and any deal in, in all of 2023 or 2024. And we showed people, you know, the, the three biggest things that we've done to put ourselves in this position now. Okay. So the biggest things are is that we've always been a lower leverage group. We've always been between 60 to 70% loan to value. So we're not highly leveraged. Where a lot of these groups that are in trouble, they took 80 to 85% loan to value, very high leverage deals. Okay. The second thing is that we've always purchased three-year interest rate caps on every single deal, no matter of, what, of the timing, okay? Meaning that your interest rate cap is capped for three years. A lot of groups the last couple of years have bought one to two-year caps, which are now expiring. So people that are doing capital calls right now, they're actually doing the capital call because they need an infusion of cash into the deal to buy a new interest rate cap, okay? And so that's a big thing too. The third thing is that we've always raised significant cash reserves at the front end of every deal. So we overcapitalize a deal on purpose so that you have rainy day liquid cash in place, okay, in case something like this happens. And a lot of groups haven't done that. And so, you know, in your model for these groups, it's like your NOI is right here in the model, right? And your debt service is here, but it's floating rate debt. You have an interest rate cap up here. And we all use these forward looking interest rate curves, which show us interest rates weren't supposed to go up. Well, even the biggest private equity companies in the country did not see this coming, okay? And they, they, and they should have insider knowledge, you would think, but the Fed has just aggressively hiked. Your, your interest rate has shot up to the cap so quickly above your net operating income that these deals are now negatively cash flowing. And so they, they need an infusion of cash. And so, you know, th these are the biggest reasons. If you don't have cash reserves in the property level to cover that delta, then you're in trouble, right? And so that's what's happening, right? That, that's why it's, it's, it is difficult to raise capital across the country. You know, we've been fortunate that, um, you know, people have been saying this since last summer, a lot of syndicators I know, and I know a lot of the top guys, I'm friends with a lot of the top sponsors throughout the country. And they've been saying since last summer, it's tough to raise money. You know, we've been fortunate. We've still had really strong demand. I think we've closed probably at least four or five deals, you know, the last six months or so. We have a few more under contract right now. And so we're, we're still getting strong demand, but we're making a point that since last summer, we, we do monthly investor reporting. Every report we show investors, here's the cash reserves at the property, you know, here's the interest rate cap, and it's very detailed, you know, intricate reporting. And then for every new deck, for every new deal, you know, we're showing investors, hey, this is these are our assumptions for rent growth, et cetera, et cetera. And so this this kind of leads into your second question, which was, you know, are you concerned about, I think you asked, are you concerned about, you know, new supply in Dallas and in Phoenix? Um, and you know the economy overall. And so the thing about multifamily is that you have to constantly be adjusting your underwriting to the current economic conditions. Okay, so I can tell you right now, for every deal, like well, we just closed two deals and we have a few more under contract. For every deal that we're doing right now in Phoenix and Dallas, we're assuming 0% organic rent growth in year one. Okay, so we're assuming there's no organic rent growth. And we're assuming about 3% organic rent growth um, on average per year, the next five years. Well, we use CoStar data and RealPage data. So CoStar and RealPage are two of the leading multifamily analyst companies. We have subscriptions to, and we show investors in our deck. We say, hey, this is what we're projecting. CoStar and RealPage are projecting higher organic rent growth the next five years. They're projecting more organic rent growth in year one. We're more conservative than both of them. And so, yeah, it's a great question because like I said earlier, the days of relying on organic rent growth are over, okay? The last several years, you know, organic rent growth can cover up your operational blemishes, but going forward, it's extremely critical. You have to be able to execute a value add plan by renovating units on schedule and on budget to force the appreciation. You have to provide a higher quality product in order for tenants to pay more. Okay, you cannot rely on this organic rent growth. And so what's happened is that, you know, really last year, starting second quarter of last year across the country, 
you saw a significant deceleration and normalization of organic rent growth after we've come up after that that huge you know post COVID surge um, of, of rent growth that you saw. And so, um, in regards to kind of new supply, I can tell you in Dallas and in Phoenix, you know we've never competed with new build Class A apartments. The cost to build the last several years has been so expensive that in order to in order to make a deal pencil when you're doing new development, and we know because we actually tried to pursue new development. I'm glad we didn't we didn't actually go through with it. In order to in order to make a deal pencil, you have to command very high premium rents. Okay, and you're and you're not building a Class B type of product. You're building a luxury apartment which is very amenitized and has very high rents. We don't compete with those types of apartments because our tenants can't afford those rents. They, they literally can't. Like we're focused strictly on, you know, workforce housing, the bulk of the demographic, those, those new build apartments, they're competing with single family homes, okay, for what those people can make. And so um, we like our space, this B-class 1980s vintage workforce housing, because you're very well insulated. And if you look at 2008, 2009, when everybody lost their single family homes and they can't afford those luxury class A apartments, they trickle down into this B class space because it's more affordable for the bulk of the population live. And in Phoenix right now, I mean, we've sold 11 deals so far. We, we still have 5,500 units under management right now. We've already started to see these class A tenants trickling down into our space because they're still getting this, this class A luxury interior finish with quartz countertops, stainless steel appliances. They don't get all the sexy amenities you get of a class A. But our average rent right now in Phoenix is twelve to thirteen hundred dollars a month, whereas you go do a Class A apartment, you're looking at you know anywhere from twenty five to thirty five hundred dollars a month. So to answer your question on supply, we really don't compete with brand new new build. We're competing with other types of properties like ours. But like I said, because we have the wholesale buying power and controlling our supply chain, we have a much higher level scope. So we're getting we're giving them a better interior product, and we're only focused. We've always said, like, I know some people like to go to tertiary markets so they can get a lower basis, they can get a higher cap rate. For, for years now, people have been telling us, hey, you should go to Tucson, go to Tucson, Arizona instead of Phoenix because you get a, you get a lower price per door, a higher cap rate. You know, I was born and raised in Phoenix. I want nothing to do with Tucson. I'm not saying it's a bad market. I mean, it's, it's um, national context, you know, it's, just, it's, a, it's a good market compared to a lot of places, but we want to be in the most prime markets in the country that are, that are very well insulated. I'll pay a higher price per door. I'll pay a lower cap rate for diversified employment. Like if you look at COVID, you know, Tucson got crushed during COVID, did not do very well. You know, very blue local legislation, tough to evict people. You know, Phoenix, Dallas, very landlord friendly, very pro business. And, you know, in, in a downtime, you have diversified employment so that you're insulated. And in a good time, you have this explosive rent growth. And so my point in saying that is that we're only focusing on true infill metro areas. There's been a lot that's been said in Phoenix, like, oh, there's no, there's all this new supply, all these new apartments are being built. Are you concerned? No, because where we're buying properties in infill metro Phoenix, it's completely landlocked for miles. There's no land to buy new, buy land and do, build new apartments. It's all on the far outlying Southwest and Southeast. Same in Dallas, you know, it's, it's all landlocked when you're infill metro Dallas. Um, and so, you know, we want to be in the prime locations and, and make sure that we're insulated. So that, that's kind of our strategy. And so, yeah, to your point, you have to adjust your underwriting, right? So you have to really shave down organic rent growth, but everything is relative because, you know, values are down anywhere from 15 to 25% right now from where they were in Q2 due to interest rates, which means that we're buying higher cap rates right now going in. And so it, it, it makes sense when you have more conservative assumptions. I love it. I love it, man. That was great. Now, just I just want to re-emphasize a few points. He said year one, zero percent organic current growth. And then year two, three, four, five, and six, three percent all across the board, for example, in Dallas market. So that's very important. The other important piece that I want everybody to pay attention to is overcapitalizing a deal up front. So that way, if you have any issues in the future, you could always draw from your reserves just in case you need it, rather than having to go back and do a capital call. I think that's very, very important uh, that people note that down. Um, Andrea, I'm going to have you be the last person that asks a question. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, since you're in Phoenix there, are you working with uh, Pace Morby at all? Yeah, good, good question, Andrea. Thanks for joining. No, I, I'm not. No, I don't, I don't. I don't know Pace. I've heard of him, but um, no, we're not. I don't know him. I think he's more in the single single family space from what I understand. Um, yeah, you might be right. Yeah, no, I, I know he has a big name, though. Yeah. So Zach, if somebody wanted to reach out to you or Rice48 or, or get on your investor database, how would they go about doing that? 
Yeah, th thanks so much, everybody, for reaching out. Really appreciate it. So um, you can email me, Zach, Z A C H, at rise48equity.com. I'll, uh, I'll put that in the I'll chat. I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat okay. for you. Okay, cool. Thanks, boss. Yeah, you can just email me and say, you know, hey, send, add me to your list um, or, or set up a call. Um, and then you can go to our website. And so if you want to, if you want to get into new deals that we're doing, go to our website and set up a call with us because we do um, primarily 506B offerings. So we, we have to establish a relationship, you know, get on an introductory call with, you know, me or somebody on our team. So go to rise40equity.com. And on that website, you can go and, and set up a call. I'll type, I'll type the link to set up a call here as well. A boss. I got it. And, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's count. I'll, I'll type in the calendly. So you guys have that as well, but you yeah, know, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to join the presentation. And again, I'm, I'm always accessible. Okay. So if you want to get on a 30 minute phone call with me, you just click that link that I just typed in there. You can set it up for the next week or two and, and we can get on phone call to talk about how we can work together or if I can help you out in, in your journey. So really appreciate it, boss. Great job. Abbas. And Zach, I appreciate you coming on man. you crushed it. And, uh, and I super appreciate how inspiring you are and how all well you've done. Yeah, no, thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Zach. It was, what a journey, and I love it. Oh, my God. Guys, if you enjoyed you this, it. let's blow yeah. up the chat for Zach. Put a fire in the chat if you love this presentation. I mean, he's added a lot of value. This is years of experience in, in a very short amount of time. So I really want you guys to blow up the chat for Zach. Zach, we appreciate you, man. No, yeah. thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Abbas. Thanks. Thank Absolutely. You. We'll see you. All right. Bye. Great. Man, that was awesome. Are you guys enjoying this so far? It's been, we've only had two speakers. We have a lot more speakers and this is going to be freaking awesome. I, I love it. So before we go further, I would like ask, I would like to ask everybody, please change your screen name because we are getting some <laughs> not good comments in the chat. So if you can change your screen name so we can monitor who's putting what. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, it's very easy. Go to your uh, picture, go to the right corner, the three dots, click on that and click on rename and put your name. So we'll know who you I are. I don't know why Zoom is having issues. It's nothing that we could control, unfortunately, but it is what it is. Uh, but we will ignore the trolls. We will ignore the trolls in the chat. It doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, appreciate appreciate that. That was, that was awesome. Um, but no, I mean, if you haven't changed your name, I see a lot of you guys have already changed your name. If you haven't done so, click on the three little dots on the top of your profile, and then you can click on rename, and that's where you can change your name. And one of the other things I want to say is that I encourage you guys to put your pictures on. And also, um, every once in a while, I'll put in the chat your, your Calendly link or how people could connect with you and why they would connect with you. So that way you can, you can network with other people and establish more connections. I mean, we've got 184 people on right now that are all in real estate. You want to use opportunities like this to network with others, build new connections, build new relationships. So that way, you know, whether you partner with people on deals or you raise money from people, you know, that are here um, in the future, that that's a, a great opportunity. So I highly recommend you put your information, your Calendly link if you have one and give a reason as to why people should connect with you. Yeah, and you can save the chat too by clicking in the three dots in the chat at the bottom, save the chat that way. Maybe you wanted to do it multiple times because yep. people are adding information as we go along. So uh, should we move on to our next session now? Yep, let's do it. All right, so I hope- By the way, I'm so sorry, let me, let me, just, let me just pause here. Um, so, so we're gonna have one more session and then we're gonna have a one hour networking slash break. During the networking session, I'm gonna divide you guys up into groups of five or six. So then you could either go on a break or um, you could network with other people while you're eating lunch or doing whatever you're doing. And that's a great opportunity, again, to find new partners, find new investors. So I would highly suggest that you don't actually leave your computer. If you have lunch to grab, grab it. If you want to use the restroom, do it, right? But it's an hour long thing. And so you could you get to connect with other people just as if you were doing it in real life. So I highly suggest that you actually um, use that time. We're going to start that at 12 to 1. Uh, so just keep that in mind. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. So everybody's pumped up, right? For the next session, as well as the networking, I think it's going to be a great networking session. Uh, like you said, we'll have a small breakout rooms. But before that, um, I know a couple of people asked me about the bio breaks. So we can use the networking session for the bio break as well. 
a small break and we can come back and network with others. So our next guest is a very special guest. I hope you all enjoyed Zach and learn from him. No more golden handcuffs and might want it to look to become a full-time entrepreneur. And multifamily real estate investing is an excellent option. It not only provides multiple sources of income, but it also offers economies of scale, long-term wealth building. And now, uh, but you know, uh, when I started, I always thought that buying multifamily is kind of a daunting task, and especially if you're a first-time buyer. So Abbas Muhammad, our youngest entrepreneur, has figured it out, and he will take us through our entire process of buying a multifamily property from start to finish. And he will also provide us uh, with some valuable insight and some great actionable trips. And then Abbas, time is yours. Take the floor. Perfect. I appreciate it. Well, I, it's going to be difficult to try to match up to Zach. However, I'm going to try my best. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm, what I'm going to talk about is how to buy multifamily from start to finish. And I think this is a great segue after Zach, because Zach took us to what you could do in five years, what you could do in six years, right? He's at this level now where he's got hundreds of employees, but a lot of us, you know, we're not at that stage yet. Doesn't mean we won't get there because you got to remember when he started, he started at zero, um, but he got there over time. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back to ground zero to the beginning and walk you through how to buy multifamily real estate from start to finish. And then eventually you could start modeling after other people like Zach. And tomorrow we're going to have Dan Hanford in here, who's also done over a billion dollars in acquisitions and raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So you could model after these guys in the future. Uh, but having said that, I appreciate you all being here. So let me go ahead and get started. What we're going to talk about today is I'm just going to kind of give you an intro of who I am. After the intro, we're going to talk about what's going on with inflation and the, the upcoming recession that everybody's talking about. Then we're going to talk about single family versus multifamily, because I know a lot of you guys that are on here might still be investing in single family. If you're investing in single family still, write, write the, the, the phrase single family in the chat. I want to know how many of you are still investing in single family. But I'm going to talk to you about you know what is the difference between single family versus multifamily. And then I'll tell you how we choose markets. Like you saw, Zach, for example, is investing in Dallas. He's investing in Phoenix. I'll tell you my criteria. So that way you can choose markets based on our criteria if you choose to do so. Then we'll talk about syndications and raising equity and, and you know raising money from investors. He talked about how now he has about 500 investors per deal. So I'm going to tell you how he does that. Um, and then how you could make money as both a passive investor and as a general partner. So anyway, I'm going to start off with an introduction. For those that um, haven't heard me speak before, my name is Abbas Muhammad. And, um, you know, originally I was born and raised in, in Iraq. And I remember growing up, we were extremely poor. I remember my family was so poor to the point where we literally couldn't afford to have beds. And I slept on concrete for the first like nine years of my life. Um, and then after the Iraq war, I, we left Iraq, we went to Syria and then lived in Syria for two years, seven of us in a 500 square foot apartment. And then when I was 11 years old, I came to the US. And I remember when I first came to the US, this is the house I lived in. It was a $600 a month rental in Memphis, Tennessee. And we couldn't even afford to pay $600 a month. We literally had housing assistance. We had food stamps. I mean, you name a government welfare program, we have it uh, at the time. And so, and so I just, you know, we started from the bottom and I always, to be honest with you, I hated it. I always remember hating how um, I couldn't do all the things that other kids could do. And we didn't have, you know, a nicer house. We didn't even have a car. This, this right there is not our car. This is just from Google Maps. I remember when we came to the US for a year, we had to walk everywhere. And so I always remember as a kid, I'm like, man, the minute I could do something to change my, my financial situation, my family's financial situation, I will work as hard as possible. I will go all in uh, to make sure that I, I change that in the future. And so um, anyway, what happened is by the time I was 18, I was going to college and uh, I realized that going to college wasn't going to change my life. I didn't want to have the golden handcuffs that Zach was talking about, because I knew if I go to college for four or five years, eventually I'm going to get a job. I'll have a comfortable salary and then I'll just be the same for the rest of my life. And so I wanted something different. And so what I did at the time is I got my real estate license. It was the only thing I could afford. I was 18 years old. 
I had a, a credit card and on the credit card that I had a $5,000 limit. So I looked at my options. I'm like, well, the only thing I could really afford to do is I couldn't buy houses. I couldn't buy multifamily at the time. I didn't even know what multifamily was, um, but I, I knew I could get my real estate license because it would only cost uh, $2,000. So I got my real estate license, got in the business. I thought I was gonna make a lot of money very quickly and I failed miserably. It was the complete opposite of what I expected. Uh, when I first got in the business, I didn't have any connections. So I remember I, I went out door knocking every day from nine in the morning to five o'clock in the evening. For three months, I didn't get a single transaction and I ran out of money. So I had to go back to my car sales job at the time. And while I was selling cars, I remember, this was me at 18, I remember going like, you know what? I have two options. I could either go back to college and give up on my dreams, or I could just try to figure out a different way to make this work. And you've heard now, Zach, you've heard Ken, they, they both did the same thing where they just decided, you know what, there is, there is no going back. We're just going to go all in over and over and over again. And so that's what I did. I literally had two headsets on. I started cold calling every day from the office for 12 hours a day. And it took me 12 months before I got my first transaction as an agent. Um, so I got my first transaction and then I got a second and a third and business was starting to go up within, within two years of being in business. I was 20 years old. I was making about $350,000 a year. Then I started learning how to hire virtual assistants. And so then I built a team of 25 virtual assistants and I went from 350,000 a year to making $1.7 million in net profit in 2021. So I really expanded that business a lot over time. I became top 50 agents in the country. I was making a lot of money, but then I didn't know what to do with it. I had, I, I had a lot of cash flow, but it was just sitting in the bank. And I remember at some point I had close to a million dollars in cash and just sitting in the bank doing absolutely nothing. And so then that's when I started investing in multifamily. So I invested passively at first, but then I started actively buying deals. My first deal was called King's Landing. This was a six and a half million dollar deal that we bought 64 units. It's a C-class building. This is where everybody starts, right? With these C-class assets. And we raised $2 million on that. And then afterwards I bought a 30 and a half million dollar building and we raised $8 million. This is not me bringing in all the equity. This is me putting in some money and then going out and raising the remaining amount of uh, equity required from other people, which we'll talk about how you could do that as well. So we bought that building at the end of 2021. And then for the first six months of last year in 2022, I completely stayed out of the market. I thought the market was way overpriced. I didn't buy anything. Um, and then I started buying again in July and we bought, we bought this deal, Parkwood Townhomes for 12.1 million. And we raised uh, on this deal, we raised $8 million. And uh, we actually just closed on this two months ago. And we yesterday sent out $23,000 uh, to our investors. So we just started distributing two months after purchase. And so that's what I did. And so I, I quit my real estate sales business. My full focus now is just on model equity, my multifamily business. And, and that's, that's my full focus now. But having said that, let me talk to you about why I started investing in multifamily. Because like I said, when I first started, I was a residential agent and then I became a broker. But for some reason, I decided not to invest in single family. I'll tell you why I did that in a bit. But the first reason I started investing in general is I wanted to replace my income. I think a lot of us have one main source of income and we rely on that source of income, just like Zach, just like Ken and a bunch of others, where if that source of income was to disappear, we wouldn't have a way to pay bills. And so I was in that same position. My business was my main source of income. And if that business was to go down for some reason, I wouldn't have a way to, to, pay, to pay my monthly expenses. And so I wanted to replace my income. That was my number one priority. Right now, you might have a job. You might be working for someone and that's your main source of income, right? And so to me, that was my number one priority was replacing my income because I wanted more stability. The second thing is I wanted to, to invest in a safe, reliable, investment asset that could grow steadily over time. I wasn't interested in getting 50, 60% return and having all this volatility that you might have with, with, the, with crypto, with stock market, or any of these other assets. I wanted something that I know over a 10-year time horizon, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it's always going to be there, and it's safe, it's reliable, and I don't have to worry about it because I wanted to compound my growth over time. 
And then the third thing is I wanted to build generational wealth for my family. I didn't want to be in a position where my kids would have to sleep on concrete in the future like I did growing up. I didn't want to be in a position where we would have to rely on welfare ever again in my life, whether it's me or my my family in the future. And so that was my biggest thing is I wanted to build generational wealth for my family. And that's why I started investing in multifamily. So having said that, I committed to it. When I first started investing, I I said, you know what? This is not going to be easy. Just like you heard from Zach, he struggled a lot when he started. And I knew that going because I struggled with my sales business. And so I'm like, you know what? However much work it's going to take, I'm just going to be fully dedicated to this. I'm going to be fully committed to being in this business. And so having said that, that's why I started investing. But now I want to talk to you about inflation. And what's going on with the recession? If this, by the way, if what I shared with you resonates with any of you guys right now, uh, tell me which one of this resonates with you, whether it's building generational wealth, replacing your income, having safe, reliable investments. Tell me which one of this you most resonate with in the chat. I'd love to hear what you guys think. So having said that, let's move on. While you do that, I'm going to talk to you about what's going on with the inflation and recession. So if you look at the value of the dollar, this is a graph that shows the value of the dollar since 1950 up until 2022. And as you can see, the dollar has lost 92% of its value since 1950. So a dollar back in 1950 would only be worth, actually, this is a little outdated now, it would be worth less than eight cents today. So imagine if you have money sitting in the bank. A lot of people think, that we started, inflation started happening after they removed the gold standard, but that's actually not true at all. We've always had inflation. In fact, it's part of the economy because if we don't have inflation, people wouldn't be incentivized to go out and invest their money. See, when I had at the time close to a million in the bank, I started investing because I knew inflation was eating away at it every single day. And so if that wasn't a thing, I would have just kept it. It wouldn't have been a problem. And so the government wants inflation to happen. It's part of uh, it's a a motivating factor for people to start using their money and not just store it in, in banks. Um, And so, you know, now the problem is they don't want it to be 6%, 7%, 8% like it has been. They want it to be 2 to 3%, not 6%. And so that's the problem we're facing right now. Now, why do we have inflation sitting at the numbers we have them on right now? If you look at what's going on with the amount of money we have in circulation, prior to COVID, we had $4 trillion in, in the U.S. economy. Since COVID, we printed a lot of money and we literally went from $4 trillion to $20 trillion in circulation. That's a, that's a 5x increase. So if you think about it, if you have $100 in, in cash, $80 was printed just in the past two or three years, which blows my mind to even think about. $80 of $100 was not there in the economy just two years ago. So we we're having inflation, but in my opinion, I think we're not having as much inflation as we should have had, uh, to be honest with you, if you think about how much money we actually added to the economy. So we had 7.1 core uh, inflation, we had 6% core inflation, we have very strong jobs report that just came out. So in my opinion, I think inflation is going to be a little harder to subdue than a lot of people think. We're we're still going to see numbers uh, not look as great as uh, as we want in, in the future. In fact, we just had a, uh, the labor report come out. We were expecting 117,000 uh, and and added jobs. We had 500,000 uh, and added jobs. And so what that tells you is that employers now have to compete to to get people and because they have to compete they have to pay more if they have to pay more now they have to charge more for their products which then adds to even more inflation that's why the stock market just went down recently so having said that we know inflation is a problem and we're not going to be able to fix it we're not here to fix the u.s economy we're too small to do that but what we can do is we can fix our own personal micro economies And so now that we know inflation is going to be there anyway, and we know it's going to be very sticky, the question is, how do we benefit from inflation? And so this is a a chart that shows you what's going on in the rental market since 2018. As you can see, in 2018, we had average increases of about 2 to 4%, 2 to 4% in 2018. In 2019, it was about 2 to uh, 1.5%. Right, 2020 is the first year where we actually dipped below zero and we went down about one to 2% in rental. And then 2021, after the government started printing a lot of money, we noticed that rental prices skyrocketed and we had about 18, 19% over here. 
And now in 2022, it went down to more reasonable levels, which was right about 4%, 5%. And so we know that rental prices have gone up significantly because of the amount of demand. And because houses have gotten very expensive for people to buy, so they have to go out and, and rent somewhere. So we know that there is inflation and inflation is actually helping rent go up because the more expensive things get, right? The more expensive houses get, the more people have to rent. And because they have to rent, then you see start, you start to see rental prices going up. And so in my opinion, I want to position myself in a way that, that would benefit, that would help me benefit from inflation, not the other way around. So I don't want cash. I want to be in a position where rental prices would help me increase my, my value, my assets. And so 2023, in my opinion, is the, is the year to buy. I remember in 2022, I told a lot of my investors, I'm not buying anything for the first six months because the market was way overpriced. And so to me, when interest rates started going up, that was the best time to start buying because everybody started sitting on the sidelines. We started seeing discounts in the market. And now in 2023, it's even better. And so the reason I'm telling you 2023 is the year to go all in. This is the year to be buying right now is because we have a lot of over leveraged investors in trouble. Zach just talked about it. He said there are a lot, there are a lot of people that didn't have reserves that bought and bridge debt and they're, they're in trouble right now. So these deals that were over, overpriced are going to get back on the market and you're going to be in a position to acquire these deals at huge discounts. So that's number one. The other thing is that we have a lot of investors still sitting on the sidelines. This thing drives me kind of crazy with investors where I see when, when it's super competitive and prices are too high, everybody's jumping into the market. Everybody's excited. Everybody's in a frenzy. But when prices actually go down for whatever reason, people start to get afraid and they just decide to sit on the sidelines. In my opinion, if you're going to be buying, you might as well be buying when the market's gone down, not when the market is at, is at its peak. And so we have a lot of investors sitting on the sideline right now, which means there's a lot less competition for you if you decide to be buying right now. And then finally, discounted assets. Zach just said it, 15 to 25% discounts right now across multiple different markets, right? And so if you're going to be buying the same exact asset today, you would have, bought, you would have had to pay an extra 15 to 25% just a year ago. And so again, we have this unique opportunity in the market to pick up assets at discounts that we would not have had had, had interest rates not gone up the way they did. And so I, I always remember this quote from Warren Buffett where he says, to me, buying stocks is like buying groceries. If groceries go down in price, I'm not going to stop buying groceries. I'm going to go and buy even more groceries. And so when the stock market goes down, he goes out and he buys even more stocks. And so I'm not in the stock market. I'm in the real estate market, but I apply the same strategy. If real estate assets go down in price, I'm not going to stop buying. I would go and buy even more during times like this. So this is why, in my opinion, 2023 is the year to buy. If you agree with me, tell me in the chat whether you agree or disagree that 2023 is the year to be going all in. I'd love to hear your guys' feedback. I'm looking at the chat. Love it. Love it. Lots of, lots of comments. But having said that, let's move on and talk about single family versus multifamily. Because like I said, I know a lot of you guys are in single family still. I started with single family as an agent, as a broker. And I, I will tell you, I never bought a single family house. I skipped straight from not owning any rentals to, to investing in multifamily. And I'm glad I did. I'll tell you why I did it. Because the reason I, I didn't buy single family houses is number one, it's like a job, right? This is the first problem with it is that you have to deal with tenants on your own. If they have an issue, you have to get the call. You have to change the toilets. You have to change the light bulbs. You have to deal with all of these different things. And I just didn't want to deal with tenants. I was busy at the time at my sales business and I was making a lot more money per hour. And if I was to pick up just one call from a tenant, I would actually be losing money on an hourly basis. And so I didn't want to add another job to my daily schedule. So that's why when I first started, I realized, look, I don't want to deal with tenants. The other thing I didn't want to deal with is management companies. A lot of times management companies just don't operate that well because it's not their property and they're not making as much money. You know, if they're charging 10%, for example, on a $4,000 a month rental, that's only 400 bucks. So there is very few good management companies out there. Very, very few. A lot of them just don't pay as much attention as, as they should be. And I didn't want to deal with that because they're not making enough money off of you. The third problem is you have unexpected repairs 
that eat up all of your cash flow. You know, I hear people say all the time, oh, well, I'm making, I'm making $200 a month. I'm making $300 a month off of my rental. But then 12 months down the road, they have an AC issue and that AC issue costs them 10 grand. And so now they're in the negative again. And so you have this stuff happen all the time with single family houses because you've got multiple roofs, you've got multiple ACs, you've got multiple boilers and, and all these different things that you have to maintain. It's also very limited to where you live. You know, I live in California and California is not a good market to invest in, in my opinion, because it's very anti-landlord. And so a lot of times if you're buying single family, you have to be within an hour distance of where you live because, you know, if there's a problem, if you have to talk to a tenant, if you have to repair an issue, you want to be close. And so it's limited to where you live. And so I didn't like that. I wanted to be invested in markets that, that have population growth, that have rent growth. I, I wanted to make my decisions based on data, not based on where I am geographically located. And I know a lot of us live in markets that are, that are good markets to live in, right? Like I, I enjoy living in California. I just don't think it's a great, a great location to invest in. There's no diversification. If you have a tenant and that tenant moves out, you're 100% empty. And so until you fill up that unit again, you're literally paying 100% of the mortgage on your own. And to me, that's another problem. If a bunch of tenants leave, then you're just, you're just kind of screwed because you have a lot of money going out, but no money coming in. And there's just, you know, just too many, too many issues with it. No diversification, no control of the value. The value is based on interest rates going up or down, as we, as we recently saw. San Jose, for example, where I live, had the biggest crash in prices because interest rates went up. And so I'm just not a fan of that. And so I personally decided to go all in on multifamily apartments. And multiple reasons why, but the main reason, number one, is you have on-site property management. Like the deal we just bought recently that we closed in December, it has two employees, and those two employees literally live on-site. They live at the property. And so if there's an issue, I'm not getting the call. They're getting the call. And if they can't handle it for whatever reason, then they meet with us you know, over, over a Zoom call or whatever, and we have people that live on the ground that could go check it out. But the, the point of that is that you have on-site property management and they will do a much better job than even you could do if you live nearby because they're literally on-site. And so to me, that's a huge value add. The second thing is that I'm a very analytical guy. You know, I, I love looking at data. I love looking at where people are moving to. I love looking at appreciation numbers and all these different things. And so I want to choose where to invest based on numbers, based on what's happening, not based on where I live. And so to me, I could, I could choose any market I want in the US because I have on-site property management companies. Huge benefit, huge benefit in multifamily. Uh, and the third is that you have diversification. If we're buying a hundred unit building and one of the tenants decides to leave, it's like, it's no problem. That's only 1% of your income. But if, if one tenant leaves a single family house, that's 100% of your income. So to me, I just like the diversification. You know, it, it, it adds a lot of safety to the deals that we buy. And then you have the forced appreciation. The nice thing about multifamily is that the value of the asset is based on how much income it produces. Interest rates also play a factor, but the biggest factor is the net operating income. And so if I buy a property where, like the property we just bought, we looked at the rents, the rents were averaging about $1,300. Now we're already renewing leases at 1,600 and 1,650. And so what that means is that literally just by renewing the leases at that higher price, I'm pushing the income up, which then pushes the asset value up, that pushes the price up. We bought a deal about a year and a half ago at the time we bought it for six and a half, we just got a broker price opinion and it's already worth 8 million, which we brought in 2 million of equity. That means that's another one and a half million dollars added of equity to our investors, meaning we could sell it in a year and a half and, and get basically like a 75% return just on that one asset. And so to me, I like that forced appreciation where I could control how much the value could potentially be worth based on what I do to the property, not based on the market and, and what the comps are selling for. And then also tax deductions. In 2021, I invested money in, in multifamily and I was able to get an, close to $800,000 of write-offs. And that brought my tax bill to almost $0. And I also ended up getting, um, I ended up getting a $258,000 refund from the government. How many of you would love to get a $258,000 refund just for investing in real estate? I mean, to me, it's insane because every other year I wrote a big check to, to the IRS. 
In 2021, when I filed in 2022, I ended up getting a big check from the IRS, which was a reversal. It's usually the opposite. So to me, just the tax returns and the benefits of that have been phenomenal. And then obviously you get the cash flow. Like I said, the last deal we just bought, we closed it two months ago. Investors already are getting cash flow on every single month. They're going to start getting cash flow on that deal. And so to me, I like that because now I can predict how much passive income I'm building every time I buy a deal. So moving on from that, let's talk about real estate syndications, because if you look at some of these deals, you know, like the, the first deal I bought was six and a half million. The second deal was 30 and a half. The third deal was 12.1 million. And so I'm not bringing all that money in by myself. What I do is we do these, call, these things called real estate syndications, where you bring in a bunch of people that could invest together into these assets. So for example, on a building like this, I mean, this is in, in Phoenix, this might be a 50, $60 million building, maybe even more than that. And so a lot of us don't have 10, $20 million sitting in the bank. So what we do is we just simply go out there and we find a bunch of investors that are looking to place money because they don't want to deal with inflation. They want to put their money in safe assets. And so we just raise money um, from these different investors and buy these deals. And that's called a syndication. Um, and so that's how people like Zach do it. That's how people like me do it. We just, we go out there and raise funds from private investors. So now we know what syndications are. We know that multifamily is great when it comes to building value over time because you could control the value and inflation actually helps us because that helps rental prices go up. But now the next thing we got to talk about is how to choose the right markets. Now, when it comes to market criteria, in my opinion, this is probably the most important part of investing, choosing the right markets. And Zach talked about it. He likes primary markets. I do as well for many reasons. But number one is I want to see population growth. Anytime I'm investing anywhere, I want to see population growth. I want to see more people moving in than people moving out. And the reason that's important is because, you know, real estate is all about supply and demand. And if you have if you have a lot of demand because people are moving somewhere, then you're going to have a lot more appreciation. You're going to have a lot more rental price increases than if you didn't have any demand. So, for example, like you look at a market like Detroit, they have negative population growth, which means there are more people moving out, which is why prices have been plummeting for the past decade. And so you want to avoid markets like that. California right now, we have more people moving out of California than we do people moving in, which is why we're seeing prices go down like crazy, both in San Francisco and in the Bay Area in general and a bunch of other markets, LA, because there's negative population growth. So to me, this is the number one criteria. And we use websites like U-Haul, Van Lines, uh, where they actually publish where people are moving to. The other report that I like to read is, is called the Urban Land Institute. This is a free report. You could Google ULI report. And this is about 120 pages. It shows you uh, all these different markets, all the population growth, all the job growth, all these different things. I highly recommend you get this report um, down the line. So write that down, ULI report. I also like to see rent growth. And so what I mean by rent growth is if I'm looking at a market and it has population growth, then it should have rent growth as well. And so I want to see, you know, 2%, 3% or more per year, every single year, um, historically. Now, there are times like this where, you know, rental prices have kind of slowed down. And so that's fine. But I want to see historical constant rental growth. Same thing with appreciation. I want to see historical appreciation over the past you know, five years, seven years, 10 years, is that market going up or has it been going down? If it's, if, it's, if it's going down, there's nothing you could do to fix the market. You just want to position yourself in the path of growth. And so I want to see appreciation. I also want to see friendly landlord loss. This is one of the biggest reasons why I would never invest in California. I would never invest in Washington. I would never invest in Oregon because they were just very anti-landlord. And if you want to evict a tenant, you have to go through, you know, a six month process, a nine month process where you might not be making any income and you're just paying the mortgage every single month. And so I don't, I don't want to be in that position. Um, New York, I was literally reading a report about New York yesterday where um, Andrew Cuomo signed this bill that, that limits how much you could increase rental prices. And a lot of people that bought there over the past few years can't increase rent beyond a certain limit. And so now their property values have gone down drastically because nobody wants to be in that market anymore. So you do not want to be in markets that are anti-landlord. That is one of my most important pieces of advice I'll, I'll ever give you. 
Now, just to give you some markets that have had a lot of rental growth, Dallas, Fort Worth, Nashville is phenomenal. They had 25% rent growth. This is 2021 numbers. Uh, Phoenix and Tucson had about 30%. And Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville, Florida had about 22%. These markets are all great. They're phenomenal markets. Um, and so I personally like to invest in Dallas for many reasons. But but these, if you invest in any of these markets, you'll you'll have, in my opinion, probably more success than uh, than people that invest in other states like, like New York or California or any of these other states. So let me show you this other map. This is a map of what happened with population growth in 2021. And what's interesting about this is that you will see that these states that had the highest percent of population growth, the population change, also had the highest percentages of rent growth. Remember how I just said earlier, if you see population growth, you should see rent growth, you should see appreciation. Well, let me show you, these states have the biggest rent growth. And now let me show you on the map, these are the exact same states that had the highest population growth as well. So Texas, for example, Arizona, Texas, Florida, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, South Carolina, North Carolina, Utah, and Tennessee also almost made the list, but you know it's been, it's been doing really well as well. But these markets that are in green have the highest population growth and they also have the highest rent growth. So those are the markets I personally would choose to be investing in. This is called, you know, the, the, the Sunbelt states, right? The Sunbelt states. These are the, the markets where people are moving to. And so I want to be in markets like Texas, Florida, um, Arizona, you know, South Carolina, North Carolina. If I'm going to be investing, those are going to be the markets I would choose to invest in. Oh, in Tennessee, actually, it's right there. Anyway, now after you choose after you choose a market and you choose you know an MSA, right? So for example, if you choose Texas, Texas is not all good. There are parts of Texas on this side that are just not very good to invest in, and then there are other parts like you've got Dallas, you've got Austin, you've got San Antonio, you've got Houston. Those are called MSAs, and so you want to choose the state, but then you also want to choose the MSA. And to me, the MSA requirements are the same. I want to see population growth, rent growth, appreciation, so on and so forth. Now, having said that, how do you choose neighborhoods? So when it comes to choosing neighborhoods, I like to be in neighborhoods that have $40,000 of income or higher. Why is that important? The reason that's important is because when you buy a property, you want to increase rent. And so if the tenants, if the neighborhood income is very low, you can't afford to increase rent because the, the tenants can't afford to pay it. And so to me, I wanna see a $40,000 income or higher, I want to be close to jobs because if people are too far away from their jobs, they're just going to leave at some point. And then you constantly have to fill up the units and, and do a bunch of work. And it's just not worth it to me. Um, I want to be close to shopping centers. I lived in a, in a house that was about 18 minutes away from the closest plaza. And I hated it. You know, it was fine for the first month. But then after a month, I, I just got super sick of it. And I decided to, to leave after a year or two. Um, so you want to be close to shopping centers because tenants will have the same experience. They might be okay with it at, at first, but eventually if they're not close to shopping, they're going to leave. And so I like to be maximum 10 minutes away from, from a major store, but ideally much closer. Um, if you could be close to schools, that would be very good. I was looking at a deal the other day that was literally right across the street from, from an elementary school. And so those are great because if somebody goes to a school in that area, if their kid goes to school, they have to stay at your property for multiple years because they don't want to be moving around too much, right? So being close to schools is very, very helpful. I like to avoid up and coming areas, areas that have low income, that have high crime. You know, you tend to get stuff cheaper, but in my opinion, it's too risky because, you know, you're, you're betting on the fact that it might go up in the future and they might clean it up, but that may or may not happen. So I, I like to avoid up and coming areas. I just invest in premium locations that have high income and solid tenants. And I want to give you this website. This is a website I use all day long. It's called City Data, city-data.com. And it lets you find out the area income and the demographics of every single neighborhood you choose. So this is completely free, very, very useful website. We use it all the time because, because if you want to find out the income of the neighborhood, you could go on there, put in the neighborhood, and, and it will pull up all the data that you need on that neighborhood. And it's completely free. I don't know how they make money, to be honest with you. Kind of, it's kind of crazy. They don't, I don't, haven't even seen ads on the website but it's a, it's a phenomenal tool that we use. 
So property business plans. By the way, I hope this is helpful. Has this been helpful to you guys? Can you let me know in the chat if, if this is adding any value to any of you guys? I hope this is helpful. But anyway, uh, perfect. So I love it, love it. So property business plans, property business plans. Let's talk about how we increase the value of these assets. So the value of multifamily deals is based on the net income. And so this is an example of what a deal would look like. Because remember, the more you could increase the income, the higher the value of the deal is gonna be. So let's say you buy a deal and that deal is producing $200,000 a year of income. And then forget the after side, we're gonna go on, on that later on, but I just want you to focus on the before side. So you buy a deal, it's producing $200,000 a year. Your expenses might be a hundred grand, so now what is your net income? Your net income is 100,000 because you, you brought in 200 from the tenants, you spent 100,000 to you know, run the property, hire employees and all these different things. And so now you've got $100,000 of income. A cap rate is based, basically what a cap rate is just to keep it simple, that is the multiple of the price you're gonna get when you sell the property. So the way you figure out the value in multifamily is very simple. You take the net income that it produces, and you divide it by the cap rate. Now, 5%, when you put 5% on a calculator, that's 0 0.05. So if you take 100,000 and you divide it by 0 0.05, you're gonna get a value of $2 million. And that's how we come up with the values of multifamily. Now, the process is a little you know, more complicated. You could use tools and everything, but this is, this is the gist of it. This is you know, how we do it in, in a very plain type of way. You take the income, you divide it by the cap rate. So $2 million. So let's say you buy this property, right? And maybe it's been owned by the same owner for 10 years. Maybe it's not been updated. Maybe they haven't done anything that they're a mom and pop type of owner. And so you buy it and you take the income up from 200 to 220. We're only talking about a 10% increase. Does a 10% increase sound realistic to you guys? Can you tell me if a 10% increase sounds realistic in five years? This is over a five year horizon. Can we increase rent from 200 to 220,000, right? Very, very realistic, very realistic. We've done way more than that in a very short amount of times. And so then we look at the expenses. The expenses are 100 and we take them down to 90. That's only a $10,000 decrease, that's 10%. Is that realistic? 100%. In fact, on this last property we bought, our insurance at the time, the property insurance was, uh, I believe it was like 110, 120,000. Literally with one phone call, I took it down from 120 to $80,000 a year. So just by doing that, I saved the property 40, $30,000 of expenses per year. And so we could do way more than just 10% very, very easily in a lot of cases. Now you will have situations where taxes go up and all these different things, but that's a whole other thing, right? Um, so now we took our income, we increased that by 10%. We took our expenses, we decreased that by only 10%. So now we're producing $130,000 of income. So if you take 130, that's the new income. Remember, this property used to do only 100, now it's doing 130. If you take that and you divide it by 5% cap rate, that's 0 0.05 on a calculator. Let's do that right now. Take out a calculator, right? And then just put 130,000, do it right now, just so you see how the numbers work out. You do 130,000 and you divide that by 0 0.05 that will give you a value of 2,600. So we bought the property at $2 million just by doing these little changes, we're at 2.6. And so we've had a $600,000 increase just by slightly increasing the income and slightly decreasing the expenses. And by the way, this is over a five-year time horizon. You could do way more than that if you actually operate the property well. And so if you think about it, when we first buy a property like this, you might only need to bring in about 500,000 is the down payment. So we brought in 500,000. Now we've increased the value by an additional 600,000. And so what we've done here theoretically is we've basically 2X our investors equity. Because remember the 500,000 is still gonna be there, but now we added an extra 600,000 to the value, which adds another 600,000 to their equity. So now their total equity is up by, uh, by two, uh, 2X, right? So that's a 2X increase. We went from having 500,000 to $1.1 million of equity just by doing this change. 
All right, I hope this is helpful. Do you guys get this? Do you guys understand how this works? I want to make sure everybody understands how this works before I move on. Can you let me know in the chat if this is if this is easy to understand? I want to see what you guys are saying. Perfect, perfect. Andrea gets it. Love it, love it. Perfect. Mary gets it. I love it. Perfect. All right, cool. So this is pretty simple. So now moving on, how do you increase income in apartments? Well, there are many different ways. There are so many different ways you could do it. One is you could renovate units like this deal we just bought. It was, it was built in 1980 or I think 1982. And so a lot of the units are still classic. So we're going to go in there, renovate the units. You could add valet trash. You could add a technology package, right? People like to go in and out of their houses with their phone nowadays, and they want to control the thermostat with their phone and Wi-Fi. So we could add a technology package. Um, you could add private yards. You could add covered parking. You could, you know, um, change the toilets so that way the toilets spend less money when you flush them. Um, you could optimize management. You could add Wi-Fi. There are so many different ways you can increase income and reduce expenses. And again, this this is how syndications work, right? You you find a property, and then you bring in a bunch of investors to invest alongside with you. And what you want to do is, if you're on the active side, is you want to take investors' money and double it over three to five years. That's really the target that you should set. And so, in syndications, we have two roles. We have the general partner role, right? That's people like myself, people like Zach. And people like Dan Hanford, who's going to come in tomorrow, he's going to crush it. He's raised $300 million just last year. So those are general partners. And then you've got the passive investors. And the passive investors are, you know, they're maybe busy building their business. Maybe they're busy in a job and, and they don't want to do general partner type of work. So they're just investing capital. Now, I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I, I'm a passive investor. I invest my money passively, both in, in my deals and other people's deals. But I'm also a general partner. And that's my full-time focus. And so let's talk about the different things you have to do as a general partner. Uh, number one is you have to understand multifamily. You have to understand how this business works. The second is you have to find deals, right? Because if you understand multifamily, but you can't find deals, there's you're not going to be able to add any value to people. And if you don't add value to people, you're not going to make money in this business. And besides finding deals, you have to also learn how to raise capital. Right. Like people like Zach, for example, have raised a lot of money. People like Dan Hanford has raised a lot of money. And so you have to know how to raise capital to buy these deals that you find. And then afterwards, Zach just said it earlier. He said, look, I mean, you have right now operating a property is very important. You have to understand how to do it. So you have to close and manage the deal after purchase. It's not just about purchasing the deal. It's about improving the property afterwards. So that way the investors make money. Moving on, so passive investors, what is your job as a passive investor? Well, number one is you, you choose which deals you wanna invest in, you provide the capital, and then that's it. You've just, at, you know, from then on, you're just getting cash flow, you're getting appreciation, you're getting tax savings and a bunch of different things. And so that's your job as a passive investor. It's, it's passive for a reason, because you're busy doing something else. As a general partner, you're busy putting the deals together, operating the property and doing a bunch of different things. And so let's talk about how much money you could make as a passive investor versus as a general partner. And you can make money doing both, by the way. I think they're both great. That's why I still passively invest and I focus on being a general partner. But let's, let me just kind of give you an example of the last deal we just bought. It was a $12.1 million deal. And this is over five years, right? So let's assume you put in $100,000, whether it's, and by the way, I'm just using this to kind of give you a rough example. This could be 50,000, it could be 25,000, whatever it is, right? It's up to you. But I'm using 100 to make it easy. And let's say you also put in 100,000 as a passive investor, right? I'm just gonna show you the difference. So at the time of closing, we make an acquisition fee. And the acquisition fee we charge was actually 3%, but let's just say it's 2%. That would be $242,000 upfront at the time of closing. Now, for a lot of people, by the way, this is a game changer, right? Because this could help you quit your job. This could help you quit your business. Like Zach, for example, was you know making about, he said 120 plus bonuses. He was making about 200,000. So one deal with, an, with a two person acquisition fee like this would have replaced his entire income for a full year. Now it's not easy to do one deal, right? It's not hard, I just wanna clarify that, but one deal could help you replace your entire income. You get asset management fees, right? Because you have to manage the property. You have to do well for your investors. And so uh, that's about normally about 2%. You know, all these numbers could change, but it's about 2%. So over five years, that's $165,000. 
Now, as a passive investor, you're not putting in the work to find the deal, so you don't get acquisition fees and you don't get asset management fees. However, both you as a general partner and the passive investor get the same treatment on your investment. So if you put in 100,000 and the, and the project generates 5% of cash flow, that's $25,000 in cash flow over the holding period. And then at the time of sale, really, you know, and, and Zach mentioned this as well. He's like, look, we make the most amount of money at the time of sale, right? And that's the truth. So if you look at this deal, for example, if we hit our projections, and I think we'll exceed our projections, because when we bought the deal, we were projecting, uh, we'll take the rent from 1300 to 1500 or 1550. We're literally two months into the property and we're already taking rents up to 1600, right? So I think we're going to exceed our projections. But having said that, we should be able to make as a general partner team, two and a half million dollars at the time of sale. This is not based on our investment. This is based on the fact that we were you know, the people that found the deal, managed the deal, sold the deal, right? So we would get a two and a half million dollars. You get, you get flushed with cash at the time of sale. Now, as a passive investor, you also get that, right? You're, you would get an additional 79,000 at the time of sale because, you know, you're, you're investing in the deal and you share the profits. And so at the time of sale, assuming everything goes well, you should also get your initial investment back, which is 100,000 for both. And so at the bottom, as you can see, on the general partner side, you have 2.9 million. On the passive side, you have 200,000. So we went from a general partner having 100,000 to 2.9. I do wanna clarify, you will have multiple partners and you will share this with your partners, right? And so, you know, whatever your share is gonna be, whether it's gonna be 10% of that, it might be 20% of that, it might be 30. So that really depends on what structure you set up and how many partners you've got. So just keep that in mind. This doesn't all go to one person, it goes to multiple people. But as a passive investor, your investment also went from 100 to 200. How many of you guys would be happy if you could take 100,000 and passively change it to, to 200,000? Put that in the chat. Let me know if you'd be happy with seeing your 100,000 turn into 200,000. I want to see how many people would love to see that happen. But having said that, as a general partner, you have to understand the multifamily business. You have to understand how the business works. And so that's the number one thing. After you understand the business, you have to understand how to value apartments. What I just showed you today was a very brief overview of how we do it, but you know, there's different things and there's analysis sheets and all these different other things, right? So you have to understand that. You have to know how to make investors money. If you wanna be a general partner, you're not gonna make any money. All this money I just showed you guys right there, that's based on profits. And so if you don't make your investors profitable, you're not gonna make that money. And so part of being a general partner is you have to make investors money. And this is one of the quotes I really like from uh, Zig Ziglar. He says, you can get everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. And I think Ken mentioned that as well at the beginning of this event. So that, that to me is phenomenal. Now, everybody wants money. So if you, could have, if you could help other people make money, you will make money as a result of that as well. So that's number one. The second thing is you have to know as a general partner, if you wanna be a general partner, you have to understand how to find deals. And finding deals is a skill on its own. Um, so you have to understand how to choose markets, how to get deal flow, build relationships with brokers and all these different things. You have to understand if you have a relationship with a broker, how do you want the deal? Because that, again, that on its own is another skill set. You, you know, you're not just going to get the deals because you look at them. You're going to get the deals if you, if you could show the broker that you could close on the property. So you have to understand how to do that as well. You have to understand how to raise capital. And, and when you raise capital in a deal, you have two phases of it. You have the debt, which is the loan program that you get. So if you buy a property, you're going to have about 50 to 80% of the purchase price in debt, right? So on a, on, a, on a $10 million deal, you might be able to get $6 million loan, but then you also have to raise the other portion of it in, in equity, which means private money from investors like you and me. And so on a $10 million deal, you might need to bring right now, nowadays it's about 60, per, uh, 40%, 50%. So that would be $4 million on a $10 million deal of equity. And so a lot of people say, you know, you, you find the deal and the money will come. And to me, that's complete BS. That is the opposite of the truth. Um, if, you, if you don't know how to raise capital, you're not going to be able to close the deal. You have to have an investor database. You have to know how to add investors to your database and build relationships 
And that way, when you find a good deal, then you could go out and raise the money. If you're only going to raise 50,000 in total, yeah, it's not a problem. I could do that in my sleep. But if, if you're going to raise millions of dollars, you need to know how to build an investor database. And so that's very, very important. Investors first, deals later, right? Just keep that in mind. But the fourth thing, and this is becoming very important because the market's changed, is that you have to know how to close and manage the deal. So you have to have a business plan. You have to do due diligence. You have to know what a PPM is to get investors on board. You have to set up entities. You have to know how to hire property management companies that are going to you know, operate your project well, how to do asset management, investor management, property reporting. Like we just sent out a report. I got an investor that called me. He's like, man, I, I love this report. You know, Who's doing it for you? I'm like, I'm doing it myself. It's taking me two hours a month because I want to make sure this is up to the highest standards I could do it. Right. Uh, you have to know how to distribute cash flow. We just sent twenty three thousand dollars to our investors yesterday. So you have to understand how to do that. And so, again, when you when you choose what you want to do in multifamily, you could choose multi. You could choose being a general partner or a passive investor. You'll make money doing both, but you'll make way more money doing general partner work than you would passive investor work. And again, I do both still. I still invest passively and I still um, focus, obviously, full time on being a general partner. So. Again, those are the different roles that you have to focus on. You could 14X your investments as a general partner, but you could 2X your investment as a passive investor. So let me know down in the chat. I'm going to read the comments. How many of you guys would be happy to 2X your money every three to five years as a passive investor? Meaning you literally put no work and you, you 2X your money every three to five years. How many of you would be happy with that? Let me know down in the chat. If you'd be happy with 2Xing your money, I'd love to see, to see you put that in the chat. Perfect. Perfect. Jacob is happy with it. Uh, Marcus, Marcus is not happy with it. Marcus wants more than that. Very cool. Very cool. So now the other question is, how many of you would be happier to 14x your money every three to five years? Let me know down in the chat. Put 14x. If you're happier 14xing your money, put 14x in the chat. I want to see those 14x's in the chat. How many of you guys would be happy with that? Love it. Love it. The chat is blowing up. Chat is blowing up. I love it. See, I'm on the 14X side because I want to grow my money faster. I'm not, I'm not worth a billion dollars. So 2Xing is too slow for me. I need to 10X it, 20X it. And so, and so that's why I ended up choosing the, the general partner side. If you're a billionaire, if you have hundreds of millions of dollars in cash, 2X is phenomenal, but it's not phenomenal for a lot of us that are not at that level yet. And so you have to be able to do it faster. So moving on, this is why we started our multifamily investor tribe mastermind, because I wanted to be able to help other people get into the business and not just invest passively, but learn how to 14x their money and become a general partner. And so we started this mastermind and we actually just started it about a month ago. We already have uh, right now we have 14 or 15 people in the mastermind. But in this mastermind, you're going to learn how to make money in multifamily, the ins and outs of being a general partner, how to, how to do value add business model, how to find deals, how to choose markets, how to find and win off market deals, how to underwrite and value multifamily, um, how do you calculate cap rates, NOI, analyze financials, how to raise capital. You know, I, I'm growing my database right now exponentially. We're getting literally three, 400 new people in my database every single month. And that's on a low month. Like this month where when we're advertising this event, I've added about a thousand people to my database. So I'm going to teach you how to do that as well. How to raise millions of dollars from private investors, how to build your investor database, how to set up a CRM, um, how to choose the right loan products, right? How to close and manage the deal, asset management, and all these different other things. How to increase the property income, reduce its expenses, and manage the asset successfully. Now, this is a 20, in, in the future, I'm going to be charging $20,000 for it. We've reduced it to $10,000 for this event. And on top of that, I wanted to help you guys further get started, right? And so if you, if you recall with, with Zach, when he first started, he had to figure out a lot of things on his own. And so I want to accelerate your, your, your process. So I want to add some more value to you for those that are interested in being a part of the multifamily mastermind. And so number one is I would share with you our model equity multifamily deal analyzer. We actually built this for my business myself. And so I hired this guy, paid him 5,000 bucks because I wanted to build the best multifamily deal analyzer out there. And so we've hired the guy, he built it for us. And now if you become part of the mastermind, if you join in, you will get access to that multifamily deal analyzer for free, as well as I'm going to give you the broker database 
of major markets in the US, whether it's Dallas, Florida, Phoenix, Tucson, right? Vegas, a bunch of other markets. So that way, when you choose a market, you could build relationships and start to get access to these off-market properties in the future. And then finally, I'm going to give you access to our senior analyst, Dorian Hamonic. He's the guy who, he started with us actually since the beginning, and he's been on the underwriting fund since day one. And so if you have a deal that you want to write an offer on, you could run it by him, and he'll review as many deals as you want um, as part of the mastermind as well. So you'll get unlimited deal underwriting review from someone who's very, very qualified, who's been doing this now for years, and he's looked at thousands of deals over the past two years he's been with me. And then finally, this is a final bonus. I'm actually removing this bonus after, after this event. We're, I'm never going to do this again. But what we're doing right now is we have a one-hour planning session with me directly. So if you join in, I want you to succeed. And so we're offering everybody a one-hour, one-on-one Zoom call where we just sit through, look at where you're at right now and where you want to be over the next 12 months, over the next 24 months. So that way we can help you set up your business plan. So that's a one hour call directly with me. After this event is over, this is getting removed. And so this is a testimonial I'm gonna share with you all. Let me know, can you guys hear the audio? If I share the audio? Mind, would love to kind of hear your feedback. Let me know down in the chat. Can you hear the audio? Okay, perfect. So let me, let me uh, show you a testimonial from one of our members right now. You, Joe, and our mastermind would love to kind of hear your feedback on what your experience has been like. Content is very solid, very kind of real world in terms of current situations. As you know, there's been uh, some unique changes going on in the market. I think for each module provides a clear delineation of the process and the protocol of what it would take for you to get in, understand your target market, figure out who you want to partner with, know your role, and take action. That, that's what it's all about. The access to you, right? The communication, the real time speed of communication in terms of, you know, we got a question, you answered, right? Had the opportunity to meet new individuals who I hadn't met previously, potentially can partner on some deals, understanding their roles, finding the right team. So honestly, I see an opportunity within the next quarter or so if something comes about. I know who's who in the mix in terms of the overall mastermind. It's a small camaraderie to be able to put a team together and go take action, go go do a deal and take it out. So, I mean, the trajectory of what we've done since we first kind of jumped into multifamily, which was May 2022, the fact that we're 2,200 doors passively, wouldn't have never dreamed that. The fact that we got a GP opportunity in, at the end of 22, wouldn't have thought that. And here I am, got two more potential GP opportunities to lead, learn. I mean, it's it's, it's priceless, man. It's pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool. I love it. I love it, man. I'm very excited for you. You're going to crush yeah. it. And I'm glad to be there with you. Love it. So that's Melvin. He's actually our first member. He joined in when I first launched this. He was the first guy that picked up the phone. He's like, hey, how do I get in on this? And so uh, Melvin, I appreciate you being there. We have other, uh, we have Noah here. He joined in as well. He's like a boss's direct reach out method in less than six really works. We had 86 calls scheduled. Now that's 86 calls with investors scheduled in 12 days just from following his system exactly. Huge game changer. 100% never been thought to do that. That's another message. He says, that's incredible. I'm so impressed with the action or repeatable approach you take towards everything you touch. I'm so happy I joined your mastermind program. This is from a different uh, person who's also in the mastermind. And they're all on this call, by the way. Uh, but having said that, so this is, this is direct testimonials from people that are in the mastermind right now. And so again, you're going to learn how to buy your first multifamily deal from start to finish. That's my focus for everybody that gets in is that they understand how to buy their first deal from start to finish as a general partner. And so on top of that, we're obviously giving you the bonuses, the equi model equity deal analyzer, the broker databases, the unlimited deal underwriting review with Dorian Harmonic as the senior analyst, and then you'll have a one-on-one -on -one planning session. Now I texted Vinky, who's the co-host on this event yesterday. And I'm like, you know what? This is a one year mastermind, but I feel like for some people like Zach, who it took him 14 months, right? It took him 14 months to get his first deal. Imagine if he was, if he was to quit at 12 months, he would not be where he's at today. And so what I wanted to do is instead of offering this for 12, 12 months, I'm going to do an extension for those of you that can't get your first deal in the first 12 months. I'm going to increase increase your, your mastermind duration from 12 months to 24 months for free. So it's basically a guarantee, or if you can't get your first deal in 12 months, we'll work with you for another 12 months until you could get your first GP deal because it's exact 14 months to do it. And so if it takes you 14 months, I wanna make sure we're there with you until you get it done. And so if that's 12 months, great. 
If it's longer than that, we'll be there with you until you do it. It took me six months to do my first deal, right? And so it's different for everybody, but one deal can be a game changer for every single one of you guys. And so if you want something you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done. That's a quote by Thomas Jefferson. A lot of us might have not been in masterminds before. I joined Ken's mastermind recently. Uh, a year ago, I paid him, him 25,000. This year, I paid him 50,000 because I want access to information I don't have. I want access to people that have done what I want to do. And so if you want something you've never had, you must be willing to do things you've never done before. And so if you're interested in being a part of the mastermind, this is a QR code. You could scan the QR code to join. Again, we're only offering that 12 month guarantee extension if you join in during this event. So if you're interested in joining, scan that QR code, or you can go to the website modelequity.com forward slash mastermind, fill out your information and join the mastermind. And then we have an event every single week. We have a weekly call where everybody gets on and we, I teach you a different thing. And then we have 23 recorded modules um, and a bunch of different things because I wanna make sure that the people at Joe and have all the tools they need to have in order to get their first deal done. So it's not just about the education, but we're also very focused on the networking and building a group and everything in between. So that way, not only do you, you have the education, but you have the network to go take the deals down together. So if you're interested in that, I'm gonna put the link in the chat it's modelequity.com forward slash mastermind. And again, you're only going to get that 12 month extension if you join in during this event. So if you're interested in that, go in the chat, hit that link and, uh, and join the mastermind. If you have any questions, post them in the chat and, uh, and we'll reach out and answer any questions you've got. But any questions right now, post them in the chat. I'll, I'll reply right now while we wait. And then afterwards, we're going to go on a, on a one hour break. But I hope this was helpful. Whether you joined the mastermind or not, I hope this was helpful to you guys. You know, I shared a lot of info about how to choose markets. And, and I, think, I think that's very helpful for a lot of you guys. Why I chose multifamily over single family and inflation and all these different things. So I hope that was helpful for a lot of you guys. But if you choose to join the mastermind, that's the website. If you have any questions, post the questions in the chat. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Let's see what questions we've got. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Noah is saying course is amazing, really. Uh, uh, course is really amazing. I appreciate that, Noah. That means a lot. Uh, BD is saying that's $800 a month. What a deal. 100%. I mean, dude, it's, it's insane. I've paid about $200,000, $250,000 in masterminds over the past two years. And that has helped me exponentially grow my income. I mean, I was making a lot of money, but now I'm even more so than ever before because of access to people that are doing better than, I, than I'm doing. Uh, the access you get when you join these type of masterminds, especially if they're focused on something that you want to do, like multifamily, for example, um, the access and the information you get will help you transform your life. And it's, it's a complete game changer. When did the mastermind start? Have any of the members got their first deal yet? So we started just a month ago. And so we're literally just starting and we've got 15 people in there right now. And, you know, none of them have done their first deal yet. Some of them have done deals before they joined in, by the way. Uh, like some of my partners on previous deals decided to also join the mastermind. But I can tell you they're on their way and they're going to crush it. Core, great information course has a lot of information explained in simple language. So I think uh, that's Udar. He's a part of the mastermind. Uh, perfect. Any other questions? Post them in the chat. Sharad is in the, in the mastermind. She's, I'm in this mastermind. I've been in other masterminds, but, but this level of guidance and active guidance a boss is giving is invaluable. I recommend everyone who, who is serious about this business to join. I appreciate that. I'm a happy investor in a boss's project. Happy to receive my checks every month. I invested in three of his projects. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for investing in there. That means a lot. So anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. If you're interested in joining the mastermind, Go to that link, join in, and uh, I would love to uh, get started with you guys. Again, we're going to have our next call this Wednesday. We do a weekly active call, so you'll be invited to that. You'll get added to a group chat. You'll get added to 23 uh, modules that you could watch, plus previously recorded weekly calls that we've got access to. Um, so if you're interested, join in. Having said that, that's pretty much it for my talk. I'm, I'm a little over time. My apologies. <laughs> that's good one, Abbas. It was very insightful session. Uh, can you put the link in the chat as well? So if sure somebody thing. wanted to join the mastermind program, um, easy access for everybody. So now yep. we're going to be breaking into the networking session. And also um, 
please take the bio breaks or lunch breaks, whatever you need. And then if you need to take some time because the afternoon session is gonna be action packed as well. We have a top notch speakers uh, in the afternoon as well. So this is your time. You can take a short break, come back and network with the people. I'm gonna be creating the small breaker rooms for you guys. So you can network with each other, exchange information, get to know each other, do deals together. That's the whole point of this conference is to bring everybody together on the same portal. Yeah, we have amazing speakers coming in. Uh, Vinky, don't we have, uh, who do we have coming up? We've got, um, we've yeah, got a panel Wes. on SEC. We've got Wes. Wes will be talking about what's going on in the market right now, both in Dallas and on a national level. And I'm bringing in three attorneys that will talk to you about some changes that are happening with the SEC law. So you want to stick around for that as well. We also have, who do we have going going today? We have Rob, who is going to be talking about how to make a relationship with the family offices. And also we're going to have Badri here, who's going to talk about the fund structure, how mm -hmm. to create a customizable fund. And not, last but not the least, we're going to have another networking session toward the end. Yep. Yeah. So you want, if you want to learn about how to raise money from family offices, we have this guy, he's He's 26 years old and he's crushing at raising money from family offices. So he's going to share his process. He definitely want to stick around to that. But for right now, we're going to go on. We're going to go on basically a break slash networking. I highly recommend you stick around during this. I'm going to divide you guys into groups of five or six. And uh, I would recommend that you just kind of eat lunch, you know, at your desk, take a quick break and then come back. So that way you can connect with other people, share your information, build relationships and, uh, and then just kind of go from there. So we're going to break you guys out. And it's important to have your camera on, talk to other people, build relationships, because this is how you build your database. This is how you find other partners. This is how you find people that are going to invest in your deals. So don't take this time to, to leave or anything. So how many rooms should we have, Vinky? So I think I'm going to have about 30. We have 48. I think I'm going to have about 32 rooms at this point. Okay. I think maybe 33. And okay, 33, perfect. 33 rooms. There's going to be four to five participants in each room. Cool. That. So I'm going to set up the rooms here. So uh, there you go. Perfect. All right, cool. So you guys are now getting broken up into different rooms. And uh, we'll be back at 1 o'clock Pacific sharp. So 1 p.m. Pacific, that's in about 45 minutes. We're going to bring everybody back into the main room. So don't leave and just stay uh, stay on the on the Zoom call. Yeah, but we are not. We just like, it's a 10 minute kind of break a room for you guys to get to know each other. Then you come back when it's over and then we'll reshuffle and put you back in the breaker rooms again so you can get to meet more people. So it's not just one room. So we're gonna do it at least three times. So you get to meet more people today. Let's do it. The mastermind group, my husband and I were considering it, but we were wondering, do we have to pay separately in order to no, it's just no so it's a husband and wife thing um so you could join in if you have a business partner it's just an extra thousand bucks and you can bring in a business partner if you're doing business together but if it's a husband and wife it's the same price okay. okay and when you were talking about the people in the groups i know you say you've had some people who've been in it about 14 months or so i think is what you said no no we started a month ago uh so what I was saying is that like, for example, someone like Zach, when he got in the business, it took him 14 months to get a deal. And so it took me six months to take some other people longer, some shorter. So I want to make sure that before the end of that, um, that 12 month, if you haven't done a deal yet, we'll give you a free extension for another 12 months for free. Okay. Would you recommend for people like us that would be complete novices, like we just woke up one day and we're like, we need to do something different. Like this is not working, that this would still be something that would be a good choice for us. Or should we learn something prior to getting into something like this? Is my question. Yeah, no, that's how I built it to teach you how to go from nothing to doing your first active deal. Once you can do your first active deal, the second, third, fourth, it's the same process, but okay. doing the first is really where you need the most amount of education. Okay. Okay. And is there a reason why one would not be successful in that? Like why you would have a holdup or a stall or you don't see as much progress as you'd hoped? Would there be a reason that you're having that particular issue as you go through the program? Yeah, I tell people all the time, it's like, I'm going to teach you how to do things the way I'm doing it. And it's working for me. And it's the same process that, you know, that Zach does and other people do that you'll hear speak. 
it works for everybody. You just have to put in the work. It's not easy. You know, it's definitely not easy. It's, it's all, it's going to be a lot of work. This is like, sometimes I hear, you know, people speak about what they're doing. They're like, Oh, anybody could do it. It don't, doesn't require much work. You just make a bunch. It's like, that's not true. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of work, but it will be very rewarding. I mean, it's like, if you do one deal and you know, maybe that could replace your entire income, then you could focus full time on it. I didn't personally quit my sales business until I did two deals. Then I quit my sales business. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very nice. Thank you so much for your transparency. We really, really appreciate the knowledge here. Can Absolutely. I Abbas, can I interrupt in between? Sure. I used to go to, I, I to, go to the seminars every week and get myself fired up to buy, get a deal done. And then it would switch off. You know, this went on. It's, it's normal. Six months back and forth. Don't worry about it. And the good thing about Abbas is he's experienced and he's new now. So he has a time to leverage him. Later yeah, on. I think I think that, you know, I remember, um, I think the biggest problem that a lot of people have isn't just necessarily the information, because because if you get information, but you don't have community and pe- this is why I decided to do weekly calls with everybody where we hop on. It's like all of us come on. I teach a new subject. The point behind it isn't necessarily just the education, but I want to see where everybody's at, where everybody's getting stuck, what they need to do to move to the next level. And so if there is no accountability in these weekly meetings, I know people just start coasting along and then kind of start going downhill. So to me, the community that you get is just as important as the actual education part of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with that a lot. I think yeah. that's been our biggest hang up is trying to figure out how to surround yourself with other people mm-hmm. with the same like-mindedness that are trying to go the same way when it's not as prevalent. So you're right. learning learning you're learning but there's no it's like learning a second language right if you don't have anyone to speak to how are you maintaining it and how are you growing it and that's been our biggest concern as we've been moving forward as of late um which is why we want to ask you how does it work with the mastermind like you know are you going to have people that as much as you are plugging forward are actually helping you kind of guide your way and say you're reading but you're kind of going the wrong way like if you just head this way this is a more direct path do that that's exactly what we do and sometimes i'm a little blunt because like people tell me they're doing things i'm like no just you know that's the waste of your time you need to Mm -hmm. do this instead and you can do it however you want i'm just telling you how i've done it that's working for me and you can do it it, that's why yeah i'd rather listen to who's done it you know that makes more sense can i can i input a little bit yes please so um i'm in that group with the boss but prior to that i've been in several mastermind groups Uh, I've been training and educating myself since 2006 with various mentors. Uh, What you get with a boss is that weekly call is the part that I see the most value in. And uh, you don't see that even in the $40,000 mentorship group that I sign up in. Hmm. So uh, take advantage of that. Um, I don't think a bus will be able to carry on this for years <laughs> because that is very involved and he makes more money in the deals than the training, mm-hmm. but he's giving back. And then, you know, uh, in my heart that what he's charging is actually, uh, it's, it's nothing. Just a, it's, it's nothing. It's not a money uh, mm-hmm. in compared to what he could make in that one hour. Absolutely. So no, just, I appreciate just, that. And Sharada was not paid for that testimonial, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm not paid. Five <laughs> percent discount. Honestly, about that's one thing we were hoping to get in the breakout session is maybe some testimonies from people who may have been a part of the programs, but we we couldn't seem to get any connection in our breakouts here. So thank you, yeah. Sharada, for that contact. Thank you. I appreciate that. I remember when I first started, I, I just, I struggled with so many different things. It's like one of the things I really struggled with, that I'll tell you guys about, is that people say you find a deal, the money comes. That's not true at all. That's complete BS in my opinion, um, especially if you're raising large amounts. And the thing I struggle with the most is how do you build a big investor database? And it's like, like this event, for example, we had 700 that registered. Out of the 700, we, we had 185 earlier on that were on the call. And so... That's now how I build my database, how I grow, um, you know, how much we could raise on each deal. 
And so I remember when I first got in, I would ask people, well, how do you do all of this? How do you raise money? And people would tell me, well, it's, it's the mindset. It's like, dude, the mindset is not the problem. I, I have the right mindset for it. I'm just not getting the right direction. But people didn't want to share what they were actually doing that was working for them. They wanted to hide you know, the stuff that works. And so I struggled for the first year because I would go to all these networking events and add people one-on-one. -on -one. It would take forever just to build any sort of database. And so then I learned the system. And so now, you know, we're hosting events and like my database actually just over, we built two databases. I'm going to share this with you guys live. This was not planned, but I'm going to share it live. So I have two databases that I'm building separately for, for just different reasons. But like this database has now 4,422 people. It grew to 6% in the past month, 235 more contacts. Imagine if you could get 235 new potential investors in your database every single month. That's, that's just one of my databases. The other one that I'm building as well, oops, we grew, let me see what the numbers look like. This one grew by 34%. I started this only three months ago, this new database three months ago. We're almost at 2000 people, 34% growth, almost 500 contacts newly added in the past, uh, just, you know, month, 30 days. So this is the stuff that's about, what is that, like 15 new people per day? This is the stuff that people don't share with you often because they don't want to share their secrets. And so that's that's the stuff you'll see in the mastermind, how to do that, how to underwrite deals, how to build relationships with brokers and all these different things that you need to actually be successful in this. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for sharing. I don't know if this was supposed to be a QA, <laughs> QA session, but we may have turned no, it I mean, it was, That's it, the way I have this is this is a middle of the, the day game plan change. <laughs> Wes and I did that a lot on the last deal <laughs> when we were uh, we were working in the deal and the market was changing, the, the lending environment was changing, and we would jump on and have to like just make you know changes in the middle of the deal to get it to closing. And so but it closed. So you have to adapt a lot in this business. And so that's just part of the process. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question. Sure. I don't know who that was. Hi, my name is Maria. How are you? Hi. Doing well. How are you, Maria? I'll raise my hand so you can see who where I am. Hi. Oh, there you go. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm transitioning from the real estate world in the sense of you know residential sales. Um, I've graduated to commercial sales. Um, but I'm bored. Uh, I started out in life as a teacher and I did great things with kids there. And so, but the thing is, then I kind of felt like I was in a box all day and then I needed to move. So I keep getting bored. I get bored. So now I figure, oh, let me um, try something new and work my numbers through um, multifamily investment stuff. But it's a little intimidating, I have to admit. Um, I know that that beautiful couple, husband and wife, I love that. So I aspire to have that in my life. Thank you for the inspiration. Um, I just, um, I don't have a, a sounding board. I don't have, so I think the mastermind would be, a, would be a great thing. I do meet a lot of people investing, but how do you, uh, real quick in a minute and a half or so, whatever, how do you suggest making the transition, learning the language, uh, LP, GP, uh, Capri, you know, all yeah. these wonderful things, how, how do you suggest making the transition? Yeah, I mean, you have to, it really starts with education. And, and I think being a part of like a group that's dedicated to what it is you want to do really helps because everybody's on the same page about what they want to do, what their roles are, how committed they are. Like, you know, sometimes if you just go to events, you might find people that are committed, some that are not committed, some that work hard, some that don't. But if everybody's in a close mastermind with a higher barrier to entry, you'll notice you'll find more committed people because the price is higher. Like for example, I paid, <clears throat> I paid Ken 50,000 to be a part of his mastermind. You can, I can bet you that I'm very committed to be at the events to implement the things I learned and all these different things because there was a higher uh, barrier of entry. But I mean, that's, that's the way we've designed it is to kind of take people from start to finish and educate you about the whole process, whether it's and like, actually this is unplanned as well, but I'm going to do it right now. Uh, like just to kind of walk you through what the modules would look like. What is the website? Uh, multifamily. Oh, I have to go to Kajabi. So the way we've got it set up is to kind of take you from the basics and then go to like the mediocre type of stuff that people should know. And then it goes up to, um, it goes up to the more advanced stuff. So 
you know, you're going to learn first is going to be the introduction, then the multifamily business model, then choosing markets, the three roles in multifamily, building your database, the initial steps, and then finding partners, vendors, brokers, and dealers, and, you know, finding deals, property management, financing. And then it goes into, let's see, let's see, let's see. Each one of these lessons is about an hour. So it is pretty extensive. And then we go into underwriting. So underwriting is a, in this case, it's a one, two, three, four, it's a, it's a five module type of thing because, uh, you know, underwriting is a very important skill that takes a lot of time. And then it's, you know, I have an example of me actually doing um, comp studies and calling other properties to verify the rents that we could get and all that sort of stuff. So this is like a live recorded call, how to write an offer, contract to close, capital raising, and then here we start getting into building your lead magnets, the automations, how to, you know, get a lot of people to sign up for your events and all these different things. So you can find more investors in the future, um, you know, finding investors, asset management, building a business. I, I want people that get in to not do it as just syndicators. I want them to build another, you know, Rice48. I want them to build another passive investment, investing.com. I want them to build what I'm building, model equity. So I'm going to teach you how to do it as a business. And then, that, then there's the final wrap up. So this is about 20, 25 hours of content, I would say right over here. Plus you've got the weekly recorded calls as well. Um, we have them live, but if you can't join, you could watch the recording. So that's how that goes. So it takes you from start to finish. That's impressive. Yep, I appreciate that. Yeah, I was gonna say that is very impressive for, for sure. The last month, yeah, the, to the week each, here a little bit, but what's your what's your general time frame on your weekly calls? Uh, we're, we're West Coast here. Yeah, so it's five Pacific okay. on Wednesdays. So okay. that's if you're Eastern, that's eight. No, no, we're we're here in LA, so that's perfect for. Oh, for cool. Yeah, I was trying to juggle the kids. Like, <laughs> are they at school? Are they not? Do we need a babysitter? Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, so that's five every week. Okay. Very cool. Seems like so. If, if anybody's interested in joining, I'm going to put the link in the chat again. Modelequity.com forward slash. That's right. So this is recorded, not live, or is it are the 25 hours live? So the 25 hours is pre-recorded, and then the um, then the weekly calls are live, but they're also recorded if you miss them for whatever reason. Now the, the 25 hours of pre-recorded content is like really high quality um, type of content. Like I, if I'm underwriting a deal, I share my screen and then people could see how we're underwriting the deal and then the numbers and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, cause I want it to be timeless for many more years. And so I spent a lot of time making it really nice. It's probably so the highest standard. Oh God. Yeah, it's probably the highest standard content I've seen uh, specific <laughs> to multifamily. Yeah, Noah is, is a part of the mastermind as well. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like sometimes I would record a module and it's like an hour long, but it takes me about five hours to come up with the content and then about two hours to record one hour. Then I record it, I watch it, I'm like, nope, this is not as good as I want it to be, delete, restart. So it might take me like a whole day or two days to finish one module because I want it to be at the highest it could be. Very cool. So it seems like everybody's hopping back on. Let me send out a quick email. Uh, we're going to get started in about two more minutes. Wes is, like I said, one of the top multifamily brokers in the Dallas market, but also nationwide based on his numbers. I mean, this guy's just crushing it. We just bought a deal from, from Wes, and uh, this guy's one of the smartest multifamily brokers I've ever dealt with. So I'm, I'm super glad to have him on. I'm going to bring him up in a couple of minutes. So I just want to send an email to get everybody to, to come back in. Hey, uh, Abbas, uh, do you have a template? Um, like if you want to uh, pitch something to a sponsor uh, on a property, is there sort of like a template or what do you recommend? Uh, when you say a template, a template of what? Well, I'm like, uh, how would you present a, a prospective deal to a sponsor? Um, so I would present it the way I would present it to an LP, right? Uh, when you say a sponsor, you're talking about like to get partners on your deals? Yeah. Yeah, I, would, I present my deals the way I would present them to a, a, a regular investor. And, and that way I make sure that they really get it because they're going to get the same questions that, you know, that from passive investors 
in the future. So I want to make sure they really understand the deal at a deep level. And so I just presented at a very deep level and, and walked them through it. So what he meant was you need the script. You want your script. Oh, an example of a pitch. Okay, like a pitch deck. Yeah, so we have, a, we have uh, I could share with these, uh, like the presentations that we use where we go through, you know, the deal, the team, the deal, the market, and all these different things on how we set that up. So that's part of the modules as well. All right, okay, cool. See, see, it seems like a lot of people are back. I just want to send a quick email to make sure everybody gets back before we bring Wes on. I'm excited for Wes. If you're excited for Wes talking about what's going on in the market right now, this is stuff you're not going to see on the news. This is stuff you're going to see only if you speak to brokers directly. And so I'm super excited. If you're excited for Wes, put that in the chat. Tell me how excited you are. Wes, I appreciate you jumping on. It's a it's a Saturday. He could have done other things today with his day, but he chose to join us. I didn't pay him or anything, so I appreciate you, uh, you know, adding all this value. Uh, of course, the boss. Uh, and so, can you guys hear me? Everything okay? Awesome, perfect. All right, cool, guys. Everybody, can you hear me? yep, we can hear okay. you just fine. Good. We're gonna get started, everybody. Let's get back in. Let's get back in the seats. Wes is gonna start. So, just to kind of give you some background on Wes. Um, he's one of the top brokers in multifamily, not just in Dallas, but also nationwide. And these, these, I mean, his team is doing 30, 40, 50 million dollar deals. And uh, wow. one of the biggest, like I said, so we've just closed a deal. That's probably one of his smallest deals. It was only 12.1 million, but, uh, but you know, he paid as much attention to that as he does his 30, 40, 50 million dollar deals. And so you're going to learn a lot from him. He's had a lot of experience. He's been doing it for a long time. And so uh, he was able to help us navigate many different issues that came up during the transaction. And I think if we didn't have him on board with us, we would we have not had the ability to come to the same uh, same outcome. So uh, it's great to have you on, Wes. Uh, the floor is yours. Boss, I appreciate it. Um, lots of kind words here, but um, that transaction went through because of you. And uh, I guess we'll do a little Q and A on that as we uh, you know as we get going today. So appreciate everybody's time um, being in uh, you know, Texas right now. It's about 40 degrees, so it's not, a, you know, not ideal weather, but you know, glad to be inside presenting. If you guys hear kids in the back room, I am sorry. They are told to be quiet, but it is Saturday and I'm home. So uh, pardon the noise. I'm going to go over um, about 15 to maybe 20 minutes of information if I run over. Um, or if I went too fast, because I want to respect everybody's time, trying to you know stay between 30 and 45 minutes. Um, feel free to email me a boss or anybody for this content. But I'm gonna dive into it. If there's questions, uh, send them in the chat. I'll review it. Um, I'll put my contact info in in there as well. But let's get into this. So, like a boss mentioned, um, I am part of a national firm called Marcus and Millichap. Um, we touch every single investment type, industrial, office, hotel, multifamily, net lease, you name it. We are in that space. Um, all we do, though, is investment sales. And so what that looks like is we are not doing third party. We're not doing equity raising. Um, all we do is sales. And so why that's important is because in times like these, when markets are challenging and there's not a lot of deal flow we're actually very busy because this is our only focus this is all we do is sell real estate um we don't do leases we're not you know trying to raise funds which allows us to focus on what we do best which is selling real estate um looking at that from a national level we just put out our multi-family uh investment forecast we also have it for the other product types but i'm going to focus on multi-family since that's what i do and that's what we're talking about today I'm not going to spend too much time on the overview for multifamily because there's not a lot of info to cover um, in this format. I have a pitch deck what we're going to go over, but I wanted to present this so you guys, if you're in Charlotte, if you're in Vegas, if you're in another market, you have the resources available for you to look at through our firm um, and reach out to brokers in that firm. I did take down a couple notes um, that is extremely valuable on knowing who to talk to in each market. Um, breaking into a market is extremely challenging. I 
started off in single family and I could never get into a market, uh, even being in DFW. And the reason that's difficult is because as brokers, we protect our inventory. And so that information that a boss has put together for you, knowing who to talk to is just as important as knowing what you're talking about. If you're not talking to the right people, you could be potentially wasting time. A couple of people have mentioned, oh, well, you know, the program, my first deal might take 14 months to, uh, you know, 20 months. That's very typical. Um, it is very uh, uncommon for somebody like a boss who did it within the first couple of months. In, in real estate, we're taught it's about location, location, location. Yes, that's true. But I almost think in my career now, it's timing, timing, timing. Um, it's all about how much time you spend and into it. When did you get into it? How are you selling? Timing is so important. So do not become discouraged if it takes you 14 months, 15 months. Remember, the deal is for you. It's not for uh, your uncle, your best friend, your competitor. It's how long does it take you to get into multifamily? And it might take you 14, 15 months to learn the uh, MSA that you decide to invest into. This resource will give you a lot of high level inter, uh, information on which markets are right for you. And you know, what's your market looking like? So we've covered that here in the national investment forecast. Um, I'm gonna scroll down to page seven here. Um, let's see, I think that's, let's see. All right, here we go. So here's uh, the metros ranked. Um, you know, I'm blessed enough to be in DFW. Uh, but as you can see, I think six, six of the top markets in America right now are in Florida and Texas. Um, I don't think that's any coincidence uh, because of both states, how they responded from the pandemic. And we're going to go and see, you know, how that, what that looked like from a statistical perspective. But if you're focused in those markets, that's a very strong, all those markets are very strong. Um, you look at the, some of the bottom tier markets, those are some of the markets that did not respond well from the pandemic. And that is why they're still challenging. They're still fixing issues um, with how they responded. Going to slide 23. Um, since we're gonna be talking about Dallas, that is slide 23 down here. Let me count that. By the way, I will say this is one of the best reports you'll find on multifamily out there. Yeah, and we do this for every market. So it's very detailed. Um, so here's Dallas's, the start of Dallas's market. All right, that's Columbus. And then our DF. So Detroit, Denver. DFW should be, there you go, DFW. Okay, I was right. So DFW is right there. And we're gonna review this information right now. Um, and again, this slide deck is available for everybody, but this is high level of what you're going to see on each market. So if you're deciding, hey, boss, which market is right for me? This is good info to have right off the bat. So you can see um, what markets are doing differently and comparing it to others. So I'm gonna now go to the slide deck. Right. Okay. Can we still see my screen? Yep. Looks great. Excellent. So this presentation was put together by our IPA guys. Um, they focus on institutional product. Uh, Marcus and Millichap, we are, you know, same company, just different lanes of focus. So Greg Willett put this presentation together uh, a couple weeks ago, like a boss mentioned. Very detailed. We're going to start off on a national front. And then I'm going to work into DFW since that is what I focus in. And that's where our boss has bought here recently as well. So if you're thinking about getting into DFW, this is a good slide. Um, but this is also a good, real, uh, a good slide on why multifamily um, from a national perspective. So um, doing this off my iPad, so it's gonna, we're going to bleed into several slides here. But what are we focused on? What is our challenges right now in multifamily? Um, yes, all eyes are on the Fed. It's all on inflation. What are we going to do to, to reduce 
the amount of inflation we're seeing and bring it into a level that is standard uh, that we've seen in the past. We've seen the Fed raise rates from three, you know, three times, four times, five times in a year, which is, you know, not typical, but we have seen a lot of flattening over the last, you know, last rate hike and this past rate hike. I do anticipate there being several more rate hikes this year uh, with a total of 75 basis points. And that's mainly because of where we're seeing the, the overall unemployment number still remaining very low. Um, the, the, year, the gear for inflation is to bring it down to a normal level that you see here, just below 3% around two. From a year over year perspective, um, we're still around six to 7%. And from a month to month perspective, we're very close. But from a year per to year perspective, Chairman Powell wants to bring that down to a more standard level of around two. So we're still not there. And his idea of doing this is increasing unemployment. The thought is by increasing unemployment, it's going to reshuffle the slide deck of employment and bringing high level jobs down and then increasing productivity. That is what he's trying to do by increasing the Fed funds rate. So hopefully over the next quarter or two, he's able to accomplish this and the Fed funds rate comes back, comes back down or stays flat. That is what we're praying for um, over the next two to three quarters. By increasing the Fed funds rate, we are seeing that it's becoming more expensive for people to buy housing. This is why we are continuing to see multifamily rents continue to go up. Um, if you take into an account, which we'll go into later, the average cost in DFW, um, you can do it in your metro, the average cost for an entry level housing in a PITI scenario is over 3,000 bucks a month. It is way cheaper to rent. And we're seeing that continue to happen in DFW. And that's why we're still continuing to see rent growth. Even though we are seeing the Fed raise rates, you can see here that housing consumes around 42% of someone's uh, monthly spending or annual spending. And as purchasing of new homes continues to be more difficult, we are continuing to see rents increase because of this. Now, we are continuing to see rent growth increase, but that is more of a function of people becoming better at their jobs and across the nation. We are still seeing economies expand. Um, I wouldn't say this is true for every market, so you're going to want to see each market uh, individually, but we are continuing to see rent growth happen to help employees pay for the cost of living, whether it's food, um, education, housing, you name it. We are continuing to see rent growth, which is good, um, but we do want to see it be brought down to something that's normal, that it's easier for most consumers um, to digest. Remember, a big component of goods is labor, and as long as we see wage growth increase, we're going to continue to see inflation increase. So that's kind of how Powell's viewing this uh, from his level and how to manage the economy. As we can see, all eyes are on the Fed, just kind of recapping that. Um, any questions so far, Abbas? What, do you, what are your thoughts so far before we- uh, I love it. If you guys are liking the content, can you blow up the chat with fire emojis? I want to know how many people are actually seeing value out of this. To me, it's, this is super, super valuable. If you're a guy like myself who enjoys understanding what's happening in the market so we can understand what to do in the future, this is this is invaluable info. So you have, you have to be paying attention to this. If you like this, put a fire in the chat. I want to see how many people are liking this info. I love it. It's blowing up. Love it. Any questions so far? If you have any questions, post them in the chat and I'll ask, I'll ask Wes on anything you've seen already, not, not, nothing general, just on the stuff we've seen. No questions yet. Cool. All right. That's good. perfect. Good. All right. So now we're going to go to absorption, which is another key metric that people look at when seeing, okay, what's down the road? What is, am I going to be inundated with a lot of vacancy? Where's my occupancy? Um, this is a big question. And again, look at your market, but we're going to go over a national point of view first. So as of right now, we're, we're saying that 218 deliverable units are going to be delivered over the next year. That is a lot of units, but it's also, we're trying to see household formation grow. Um, you know, 
with immigration, we are seeing people continue to come into America. Um, America has been the leader on COVID coming out of it, and people are still moving here because of that. And so people, as they move to America, the amount of people moving here and the amount of products being delivered or the amount of units being delivered are still at a negative. We are seeing more people absorb these products than we are seeing builders being able to produce. And it's not necessarily how much material is our issue. It's we can't get enough labor to move fast enough to build this. We just don't have the amount of bandwidth to produce that. And yes, there are some issues with you know uh, supply chain, but the majority of this is labor constraints because we just don't have the employees. With COVID, we've moved into more of an IT business and that is pulled from the workforce for building property, which is good if you currently own it, but it's bad if you're constructing. Here's a graph, a graph on the absorption. We can see that net absorption is decreasing, but that's because of the amount of units that are being pushed to be online. There is a big push from builders to finish what they have in the pipeline because it is extremely difficult to borrow money at 8% interest on a construction project since most of the time during those projects, you're not getting cash flow. So you are having to budget on a monthly and annual basis on what that cash interest payment is going to be. And builders are saying, hey, we have to finish what's in the pipeline before we can jump to a new start. So as absorption goes down, we are going to see projects that are in the, that are in the ground with an incentive to be finished before they can start to the next. And I'll discuss how that's going to impact um, 2024 and 2025 later here. Okay, while we uh, continue to see demand rebound, uh, absorption and short term will not keep pace with huge deliveries. That's true. This year, we're gonna see a push for absorption to happen and we're gonna see vacancy increase, but that's short term. We will not see the amount of completions happen that we need to happen to have that absorption be wiped out in a instant or in a year. The amount of deliverable units in DFW, if we were to just worry about those units and not have any net migration to DFW, it would take us 18 months to finish that product. It's not going to happen. We have more people move in DFW a year than we, than we have products being built over the next three years. So if nobody were to move to DFW, we would have all that product filled in 18 months. Bad news, people are moving to DFW. So that product is still not going to be uh, able to be absorbed fully for years. Property performance and fundamentals. Um, one of the one of the topics that we're seeing here in, I would just say specifically DF, multifamily and DFW, is that we don't have an ownership issue in DFW, or we don't have a property issue in DFW with bridge loans coming due. We have an ownership and lending issue, and that is what you're going to be experiencing across the nation is that multifamily product has never been stronger than ever. And that is mostly because of the increase in interest rates and the fundamentals are doing so strong in DFW and in multifamily. You are gonna find most markets are strong, but most markets aren't as strong as product in the Sun Belt. And you'll, you'll see that as you dig into reports, but you will also see variances in asset class. A class product, we'll see a higher vacancy this year than past years. You're gonna see B-class vacancy and C-class vacancy tick up, but in 2024 and 2025, you're gonna see that vacancy wind back down because the amount of deliverable units will be decreased since shovels are not gonna be in the ground. Here's rent growth from a national perspective. As you can see, the majority of the markets on the left-hand side are in the Sun Belt. You have Miami, Tampa, Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, um, DFW, Jacksonville, all Sun Belt markets that are leading rent growth across the nation. 
Um, one of the questions that we get answered or quite asked a lot is, man, why did I not win a deal? Why did I not? How did that guy win the deal? And how did I not win the deal? Well, the good news and, and what to focus on here is that we are seeing rent growth, not negative rent growth, but rent growth. And sometimes our headlines can be misleading because you'll see rent growth is down across America. The focus is we have rent growth. And that's, that's the focus. Yes, it's declined. Last year, we saw 10, 11% rent growth. That was phenomenal for most owners and most owner operators, but that's not standard. But what the good news is, is we're continuing to see rent growth. So in some markets, like you see New Jersey, uh, the East Coast, the West Coast, rent growth is not happening at the pace that it is in the Sun Belt. But that's just because we have more people moving here than we have products available. Here is the performance by asset class. You can see the vacancy. Again, you can see class A is going to have a higher level of vacancy, but that's because they have an incentive to get units done this year. Abbas, that's the national level. Any questions so far from that point of view? I love it. I have some questions I want to ask you, but I'm going to keep it till the end. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Now getting into DFW. Since this is where a boss and I have done transactions, um, just some really good content, really good uh, information to have. Let me go to my notes. Okay. So, um, absolute change. This is just the amount of people who have changed jobs since the pandemic. Lots of shuffling of the employment workforce. Um, not a bad thing. It's just people are moving jobs, whether it was they're in construction, now IT, um, they were serving tables, and now they're back. Uh, doing something else, it's just a lot of change in DFW, and that's healthy because then you get better employees and you get better suited tenants because they're a lot they're a longer, which is good. Um, now, if you saw it the opposite way, um, that'd be concerning. If you didn't have change, that means people aren't increasing their skill set, and the job the job market there is stale. You want a market that is vibrant, a market that um, is seeing change and growth. So. While that's like, what do I do with you know job changes? It just means we're having a vibrant market that change is happening, and that is good. Anytime change happens, opportunity awaits itself. The next slide is really what I would focus in on is what is the absolute change? Now that is a huge number of jobs added to a metroplex, and this is why we're seeing continuing to see rent growth happen and people's wage growth happen. You, you can't have this much income growth and wage growth and absolute job growth without seeing income growth as well. And so, yes, Dallas did make up over 5%. DFW did make up over 5% of the jobs added, but it, it's also jobs are changing. So as I said before, we're in a market that is vibrant and changing. This is the markets that you want to invest in as a limited partner. If you're doing a general partnership, as a co-GP, find markets that are vibrant. And statistics like this show how vibrant DFW is. Employment growth, this is what we are projecting in absolute change. Now, I, I like that I have both slides up here. I find it hard pressed, and this is being very reasonable, and this is being very conservative with what we've seen historically. So again, this isn't post-pandemic, this is more historic. I find it difficult to believe that we are only going to have 28,000 jobs added in DFW. I, again, this is us forecasting. Over the last decade, we've seen over 100,000 people a year move to DFW. Now, yes, those are kids. Yes, those are non-working um, individuals to the workforce. But, you know, if one job's added, another job is going to be coming from that. So I do think we're going to see more than 28,000. But again, the focus is we're adding a lot and we are not slowing down like other markets. You know, take, take a market like San Francisco, only eight jobs or 8,000 jobs are being added compared to DFW, that's 28. These are good indicators as to where the jobs are going and where people are moving. This is the amount of people that we've seen migrate since 2022, 
as you can see, the Sun Belt is extremely hot. You saw a lot of growth in markets like Nevada, um, Arizona, even you know Utah. You saw a lot of growth. But what are the top markets right now? Georgia, Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, Texas. All of those markets have seen really good growth. But again, those were all markets that responded aggressively from the pandemic. The next slide is extremely important. Okay, why are people staying in apartments? This is the affordability gap I was talking about previously. As you can see right now, this isn't how much it costs. You can see here on the line what rent is on the left hand side over here. The difference between entry level housing in DFW, your entry level average house is 383. That is over $1,800 difference and gap between apartments and, and houses. So while, woe is me, the Fed is raising rates, remember what it's doing to those tenants who are looking to buy a home. They can't afford to buy, so they're going to have to move. And most people who own these homes that bought in the pandemic or bought recently, they have mortgages at three and 4% interest, not 7% interest, which is being offered right now. So we are creating a next year, future year tenant because of this Fed funds rate. So yay, we're in multifamily. Yes, it's tough, but this is why we're in it because we need tenants. And so we're continuing to keep a nation of full of tenants. This is median home price, just like I was referencing earlier, 383. That's 3,200 bucks a month if you put 5% down. Most people aren't putting 20% down when they're buying their first home. So look at your property, look at the assets you're buying, look at your tenant base. And this is a huge affordability gap difference between renting an apartment and owning a home. Vacancy again, as we can see, A-class product um, is 6%. B class does have some and C class does have some as well. In this graph, B, B class does have higher vacancy. But keep in mind, when you're buying B class product, your vacancy might be higher, but that's not for extended periods of time. There's B class is that product type that moves up and down and very fluid. And that's why historically B class, you do have longer term tenants, but you do have a lot of changing of the deck in that, in that time period as well. Now, I do see a class having a higher rate of vacancy because of the amount of deliverables coming online and actually C class having a much lower vacancy because those tenants who live in those properties don't have anywhere else to go to live. But this is where, you know, if you're taking a snapshot in time, this is a good metric to have for DFW. Expected vacancy is supposed to be six and a half. But again, each product type is a little different. All right, vacancy, where it's risen and how it's been. We are seeing vacancy increase, but keep in mind that is because we're seeing a lot of new deliverables come online. This is rental growth over the past year. Like I said, it was over 10%. We're penciling 4%. Everybody's market is different. But from a DFW perspective, we are, we are penciling around 4 to 5% for B-class property rent growth year over year. As you can see here, 4.5 is what we have penciled. But again, this is where it's been. This is where it was. And this is where it's going. In DFW right now, we have 65,000 units in construction. In construction is not, does not mean delivery. That means how many sticks are in plans or in the counties. We will see of that 65,000, maybe 25,000 be delivered this year. This is comparing the different Sunbelt metros and the percentage of inventory growth. You can see DFW in Houston right there. A lot of people invest in cross markets, but we do have 
more product being delivered online. Comparing this. Here's our 25,000 units. And some people might say, well, well there's 53,000 you know, in construction. Well, why can't you guys just deliver those you know, this next year? Or how do we get through with that? We just historically, DFW cannot build any more between 20 to 25,000. 25,000 is actually a very aggressive number uh, for DFW. Historically, we've been around 15 to 20,000 units delivered a year. Um, and I don't see us really hitting 25,000. But if everything can happen perfect in, in a world full of uh, issues and things that come up, then we're hoping to deliver 25,000. It'll be interesting to see where we actually are able to do that. Cap rates, this is where we've seen them. This is where they've been. Average price. I will say this is extremely accurate and Greg did a great job putting this together. Um, we just had call for offers on a deal. 1980s product, core Dallas. Um, the offers we are getting tax adjusted right now are four and a half caps. So it is, it's interesting to see this, this slide deck was put together last month, but this is very real time information on where we're seeing cap rates trade. This was a fully marketed um, value add deal with what we would, it, it varied down the fairway for most investors, most people investing. And so we are seeing DFW cap rates for 80s, 90s product in that four and a half uh, cap tax adjusted cap rate range. A class is going to be just over four, uh, maybe four. C class product, probably six, five and a half and six, depend, depending on what is the actual uh, makeup of the product. Is it chiller? Is it boiler? Is it individual? Is it flat roof? All those factors come into play. And so cap rates change as you're discussing the kind of product. You Can you explain real quick what for people that are on what tax adjusted means when it comes to cap rates? Yeah. So tax adjusted, um, and this is again, region specific in Dallas or in Texas for a matter, is when you buy a property, you will more than likely see a huge jump up in taxes upon purchase. Um, so when you buy a property, when you're talking about um, a boss's mastermind, a boss knows who to talk to in, in DFW for the tax consultants. What's the groups that a boss likes to talk to? Because that's who you're going to get your information from. Um, so say you're being charged, say your property is worth 20 million, but it's only being assessed at 10 million. The tax consultant will say, you know what, Mr. Buyer, uh, we expect the taxes to jump up to 16 million. So whatever that uh, annual rate is, for property taxes, you're going to want to get that annual rate from the tax adjuster or from the uh, a place that we use, Control McCullough, and say, Mr. Tax Assessor, what are you seeing as far as a increase in value for this year? And you're going to want to plug that number in. So whenever you're underwriting a deal, make sure you adjust for those in the model. Some brokers don't. We do um, because we see most buyers adjusting for that, for that as well. Yeah, and we we just had a property we bought last uh, last year, twenty twenty one actually, and end of twenty twenty one, and our taxes we under for this year to be uh, it was six hundred and sixty thousand was our our uh, pro forma our expectation, and the tax consultant was able to fight the city and get it down to five hundred and twenty five thousand, which is below what we uh, what we had at the time of purchase. So those guys are super, super important. I mean, that's like $160,000 a year in savings just by using a company like that. Yeah, and in most companies, it's kind of a win-win situation. Whatever they save you, um, they get paid in some form of percentage. So it's, it typically doesn't cost you anything. It typically saves you a lot. Right. So um, moving on from cap rate, again, this is averaging all product types, A, B, C. Um, and so our, if you're looking at C-class property, it's not 198,000. If you're looking at A-class property, it's not 198,000, even B-class. So this lumps in your 600 square foot units to your 1200 square foot units, your class A product and your class C product. So again, just kind of a, a frame, you know, a good moment in time to see where we are um, in a market perspective. Good news is that you can see Dallas isn't 
fluctuating. Dallas has been a very steady market. Markets like Phoenix, you can see that it's coming down from where it was. Um, so you want to be mindful of that. You don't want to be catching a market that is falling down. Some takeaways uh, from the slide today, you know, just recapping what we've spoken about. Um, but that is, it's already taken me 30 minutes of boss. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, you're good. You're good. You're, we're good until uh, for 20 more minutes. So you've got time. Okay, good, good. So um, Abbas, what questions do you have? Um, I know you see the chat room. So what, what do you guys, what do you want uh, to talk about from here? What do you? So, so I would ask you a question because right now we're having, obviously we have a lot of deliveries happening in some markets. What are your thoughts on A class, B class and C class assets in terms of like, what would you feel most comfortable positioning yourself with in the next few years? So um, I think there, there's challenges on each product type. So I'll, I'll kind of go from there. Um, a class product, I mean, you're looking at very, very low uh, loan to values. Um, yeah. I mean, low historically, um, we were looking at 70, almost 80% loan to value. Um, so you're bringing a lot more money to the table. So it's going to be a different internal rate of return when you sell in three or five years. Might not be as high. You might have to have a shorter hold. So it's a different business plan uh, for A class property. Uh, I'm going to go down to C class. C class, you might get a better overall loan to value because the NOI there is just a higher cap rate. So you're going to get much. You're going to get much more amount in proceeds from a lender because you're looking at a six cap or a six and a half cap deal where you're borrowing at five and a half. So your amount of leverage that you have is much greater. And then B class is in between the two. So, you know, maybe you want something that has a little bit more runway. Maybe it's not as aggressive as a business plan. Um, and you're not focused on cash flow, but you're focused more on internal rate of return over a three to five year hold. And so maybe a B class product might get you 65 to 70% leverage. So fr from that standpoint, that's what is your threshold as far as what you want to invest in? Are you looking for something that's more cash flow heavy? C class. Do you want to just make all the money in the end? A class. Are you looking for a blend between the two product types? Then B class could be the way for you. That's awesome. Now, for those that are just starting in this business, you know, I mean, we see people like Charlie Young and Madeira buying up all these A class deals. They're hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars. I, you know, I would say for those that are starting out, what are your recommendations on what they should be focusing on, whether it's A class, B class, or C class? So um, the things you should be focused on is partnering with somebody who has done it before. Yeah. That is probably the biggest thing to focus on somebody who it's a partnership. It's not a marriage. So there, there's a big difference. Everybody in this game has a role to play. Partner with somebody you like. And yes, it's okay not to make all the money up front. You might have to have several co-GPs. You might have to be giving away equity. That is fine. You want to get in and out of deals. You want to build a track record that says, hey, look at me. I know what I'm doing. And there's so much value in partnering with the right people that you like. Because it is going to be a three to five year hold. So um, I have seen deals go sideways because there's too many people in a transaction. I have seen deals go sideways because there wasn't enough. There was only one person, two people driving the ship. And it really needed a lot more. So be mindful with who you partner with. That is, that is significant. Um, if I'm starting out, I'm probably going to start out in a market where I live. It's, it's challenging. Um, a boss does a great job on being in DFW. He's here very, very quickly. So, um, you know, but most of us, you know, some of us have jobs, some of us have kids, and it's not easy to do. You know, a boss is able to be in different markets because he can hop on a plane in 12 to 24 hours. I'll be there Very tomorrow. Flexible. That's my line with brokers. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I mean, and that's true. I mean, when we were ready to meet, a boss was there. So be in a market that you can get to. Maybe you don't live there, but be in a market you can get to in a day um, because deals happen that fast. Yeah. Uh, I would say another, uh, you know, another note for somebody starting out is ask the right questions. You will not get responses from brokers if you're not asking the right questions. 
questions that you want to ask is when you're when a deal is brought to you or when you're asking about a deal, what is the whisper? How is it being offered? Is it an assumption? Is it free and clear? Right. Learn about the assumption. If it is an assumption, what is the current debt on the property? That's a good question. Uh, when is call for offers? That's that's something to know because not every property that is brought to you has a call for offers. Some owners, if it's off market, are reviewing it upon receipt. Sometimes when we're doing a marketing, it's just first come, first serve, or we haven't announced a call for offers. So ask when is the property available, you know, to be submit an offer to be submitted. Um, worst thing could happen is you really like a deal and you didn't know the owner was reviewing offers upon receipt. Right. We've seen that happen. Um, I would say the last question is ask the broker, what's the opportunity? What do you, where do you see the upside here? Um, and that, that'll give you a good start and then plug in what you like about it. Because what we're selling is the dream. You might not believe the dream and that's fine, but ask them what we think about it because we're going to tell you where we think all the opportunity is. Right. And different brokers will, will give you different answers. Some like, like for example, Wes, in my opinion, you're very realistic on, on the expectations of what could happen on a deal. I've seen some that are very unrealistic and they give you numbers that I just don't see any way you could do. So you have to do your own due diligence on deals as well, but, but the brokers will be able to help you out a ton. Um, the chat is blowing up with questions, but before we go through all these questions, I'd love to have you basically go through those key takeaways so that way we don't miss that part. Yeah. So I think, you know, and again, I'm being biased because I'm here in DFW. Um, yes, there is somewhat of a disconnect um, in the market, but that's not, that's not a function of reason not to invest. That means keep on going and keep on underwriting until it makes sense for you as a buyer. Um, yeah. Let sellers adjust, but do your homework because if you're not doing your homework, then you're never going to know when to jump in what's right for you. The Fed will be raising rates. Again, that's just my gut. Um, not trying to be pessimistic, but I'm just, I can just see how Powell reacted when they got the jobs number in and the, uh, and the unemployment number last week and the inflation number. That's not what he wanted. So I'm just saying, well, if, that's, if this man doesn't like that, his powers control the Fed, he's going to move the needle to get what he wants. Um, I hope it doesn't happen, but I'm just being realistic. Um, DFW, amazing market. We are not seeing uh, a market issue right now. We're just seeing an operational um, and call it a lending concern. But once that gets put through the meat grinder, it's going to be back to normal. So don't, uh, you know, again, now is the time to get in because you are on the same page with most of us. You know, we just brought out our fully marketed deal and we're finding out where the market is too. Um, I can tell you this, the amount of inventory we have is by far more than any other shop in the Metroplex. Um, I, I see that and I hear that from, from clients. So we're all in price discovery phase. So you should be too. Don't be getting in once everybody else knows. Um, I do see North Texas continuing to do well um, without a doubt. There's nothing changing our market. Um, there's legislation even being proposed right now that's even gonna be making our market stronger. And we're trying to get that legislation proposed. Uh, so those are my takeaways. Again, awesome. I'm, I'm not with IPA, I'm with Marcus and Milichap, but that is our sister company. Uh, Greg does an amazing job on report, on um, you know, putting this research together. Um, he's with us, but he's the guy that puts this together. I wish I could be responsible for it. But they do a great job for us. Yeah, no, this was this was awesome, man. If you guys are loving this, I could I literally could listen to this stuff all day long. I was telling Wes yesterday, I'm like, I was on the phone with a broker for an hour and we were just chatting about the market. I could have done that for the whole day. Uh, but if you're enjoying this, put a fire in the chat. I want I want Wes to see how much value he's added to all of you guys. Blow up the chat with fires. I see some fires going in. I appreciate I appreciate awesome. it. It's been it's been awesome. But I have some questions. Yeah. If you still have time, by the way, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. This is yours, brother. I'm Perfect. Here for you. Perfect. So, so we have some questions. Uh, one question from BD is thoughts on rent to build communities out of construction. What do you think of that? So that was actually a very big topic at NMHC uh, build for rent. There's definitely an opportunity there, but. Um, without being able, to, I, I cannot speak to it intelligently. I can speak speak to it from a uh, from an outside point of view. 
I'm invested in a couple of belt for rent communities. They're doing very well. Um, the challenges become the municipalities. Um, how do you navigate that? But you know, from an ownership perspective, I, I wouldn't be able to guide you since I focus on more of the core, perfect, uh, more core apartment kind of, kind of investing. But I do know that that is a space that is extremely hot right now. Um, I'm invested in it. I believe in it. Um, but I can't give you really a real guidance on what that looks like, you know, past besides I like it and I'm, I'm invested in it. Got it. That's, that's awesome. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to bring up a couple of you on uh, online. Just raise your hand in the chat and then we'll be able to see you and pull you in. So I've got Ray over here. Ray, I'm going to unmute you. You're unmuted. Hi, Wes. Thanks for the, the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, quick question for yeah. you. You got that uh, off-market deals. Um, how do you decide which uh syndicator or which investor you guys are going to present the deal to uh that's my first question and the second question um you know what advice do you have as a broker to new investors that want to invest um how should they approach a broker how do they establish credibility uh to be you know taken seriously thank you yeah so i'm gonna i'm going to uh answer your, your second question first. Um, kind of like what I was mentioning before, um, when you're approaching a broker, be personal about it because we are people. Um, the worst thing you could do is uh, send us some generic questions. Um, the ways to turn me off, and I can speak to a lot of other brokers, is don't ask us what cap rate is. Like we don't, that we're not, you look at it yourself. Like do yourself a favor because you should know that. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Like, it's because it's like that means you, you just haven't done any homework if, if you're asking these basic questions like that. Yeah, I mean, you should know the market cap rate because you're in the market. Uh, you're doing deals like that's a that's a big question. Cap rate is just one indicator of 20 million different metrics. Um, so that's that's probably a bad cap question. Um, another question not to ask is why is that owner selling? Because he wants to. Uh, it, it, you know. Yes, that you might want to be diligent, but when you're presenting an LOI, maybe you ask, what is important to the seller? That's a better question. Um, but going back to the other questions, what's the whisper? Um, how is it being offered? Is there a call for offers? Uh, what is the marketing timeline? What is the opportunity? Those are the questions you want to be asking from the broker or when you get a deal. Um, off market. So off market is, is kind of reserved for those people that we know. And it's not because we don't like people coming into our market. It's just, it is difficult in an off-market scenario because we don't have all the information. And what we don't wanna do is, hey, Mr. Owner, let's get 20 million questions answered for you for somebody who's not in the market. You need to fill in the gaps in off-market. And that's where it becomes challenging for somebody who's not in the market because they're going to have that information. They're going to own the deal across the street. They're going to know what's going on. And in an off-market scenario, it doesn't mean it's a discount. It just means the negotiation is different. You don't have to compete with 20 million people. Um, I would say that's how you, you know, that's how you get off-market deals. Is start building a track record because they're typically reserved for guys like a boss that, you know, are loyal to us and we're loyal to them. And they know the market. Right, one hundred percent. I I love that. Anybody else have any questions? Raise your hand, and we'll we'll answer them. Uh, let's see. Why do you see commercial listed without pricing so often? So in Texas, we are a non-disclosure state, and so the last thing you want to do is have those county folks see how much you paid for the property. So it's a little bit of a game we play. Uh, but then again, that's why we that's why one of my recommendations is ask the whisper. And for those that don't know what whisper is, it means asking price basically and, and multifamily. Yeah. All right. Any other, any other questions? If you have a question, post it in the chat or just raise your hand and I'll ask it for you. I mean, actually, it's the opposite way. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. All right. We got Marie. Good. There you it's go. It's been Marie. great so far. I appreciate it, man. Is, is there a book out there for multifamily slang for the average person? 
because you guys um, have, you have your own language. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, I, you know, that's a good question. Um, you'll, you'll get with it. You'll, and I just ask, what does that mean? Like, there's nothing wrong uh, with asking, like what that question is. I remember the first time when I, when I just started brokering, um, I got some PLs from a guy and he goes, it's ABP. I'm like, what is ABP? Like, I have to look it up. Like, I'm like, you know, and all bills paid. So you typically, I think bigger pockets, uh, you know, multifamily slang, you just, it, it's, you know, what is whisper for multifamily? I'm sure it'll come up with a, you know, it, it'll tell you what it needs. Right. If you don't under, understand something, uh, try a quick Google. Yeah. And, and you could, yeah, if you Google all this stuff, you're going to find out, but eventually you're going to get in the business. And my recommendations when, when you get in the business, you want to start using the slang as well to let other people know that you're actually in the business and you're not a complete outsider. Like if you're like, for example, if I'm asking, you know, what, what, when was the property built? I wouldn't ask what year was the property built. I would say, what's the vintage of the deal. Right. And so that way you kind of get in there and build better relationships with people. I think stuff like that matters. Do you, do you, yeah. Oh yeah, well, it, it tells me that you're speaking my language. Right. Um, we can we can rock together. We can do things, um, but we're you know I'm not having to educate you. I'm we know what we're talking about. Um, a word to stay away from is what is ARV? Uh, we don't have ARV. It's not flipping reversion. business. <laughs> yeah, we have reversion cap rates, um, which is you know it's it's learning a different language. Um, yeah which everyone, you know, whether you're getting into multifamily or whether you're in single family, getting into multifamily, uh, that vernacular translates, but you have to learn what's, what it's translated into. 100%. Um, let's see, Anjali, I got you unmuted. Hey, um, I would like to ask the thing that uh, you provided the questions to ask the broker. Those are all great questions. Thank you so much for that. I uh, yeah. would like to that for example if i got a deal i underwrite it i underwrite more than hundreds of deals but it doesn't look like into appropriate or seeing the cap rate or it's actually you know like cash flowings or worthwhile for me to invest so how do i follow up with the brokers because i feel very disrespected if i'm not you know I, hey i present you to deal i answer you questions but you didn't follow up but I was embarrassed to call the broker and say, hey, you, your number, your, your deal is not working right. So, so yeah. can you advise me on how to more appropriately communicate with brokers to follow up? Because I don't really know. I just say thank you. And I'm sorry, it doesn't, the number doesn't work for me, but I want to keep yeah. a good relationship with you. So, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So don't, don't say anything, don't respond. Um, and that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Now, if a broker reaches back out to you and says, hey, what are you thinking because of this now? Then you can say, you know, unfortunately, I am, I'm projecting this NOI. Um, and, and you can even provide a quick response. You know, what helps me sometimes is share, you know, share, my, share your underwriting with us. And we can maybe help identify how to push, um, you know, income or reduce expenses. So don't, you know, don't feel bad about saying no on a deal. If this is not yours, just don't respond, especially if it's marketed. Um, but if we're in a relationship, like if I send a boss a deal, I think I've sent a boss like, uh, I think four or five deals this week, right? Each one of boss said, this one's not working because of X. Okay, perfect. Like now I know why it's not working. And so it's fine to say that, um, but just, you know, be, be direct. Um, and say it's not working because of X. And, and that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what I personally do. If it's a marketed deal, they're blasting that to their entire database. You don't want to bombard them with emails about why you don't like the deal, just move on. Um, if someone like what sends me a deal and it's specifically written by him to me, then I, I do respond and just say, listen, I, this num the numbers don't work on this deal because of X, Y, Z, but I don't like, I don't direct it towards the person. I just direct it towards the deal and why it doesn't work. It might work for someone else. It just doesn't work for me. Right. Um, I would say the, the worst thing you could do is, and I've seen sometimes this happen is that the brokers try and follow up with you by calling you and, or texting you. And then people just ghost them because they're too shy to say no. You know what I mean? That I think is yeah. a, mistake. a quick, a quick no is better than a long, painful no. Right. Right. 100%. We got a few more people. Let's see. User, I don't see your name. You're on. Yes. Hi. Uh, this is uh, Prasad. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, so my question is uh, for uh, for a new syndicator, right? Like uh, I've, I've only done one uh, GP deal uh, with other GPs uh, in yeah. Dallas uh, last August, and uh, I'm looking to uh, kind of establish a syndication business for the next three to five years, uh, right? So uh, my question is, uh, which of the three markets uh, which uh, do you suggest uh, getting into in Texas, like Dallas, Fort Worth, or Houston or San Antonio? So again, it's biased to answer because I broker DFW, uh, but DFW, it's why not? Like, give me a reason not to invest. Um, like I, it's the number two market in the nation right now. Um, I think Florida is beating us. Again, it's, it's the number two for a reason. Um, so I would focus, you know, I was paying attention a little bit about what a boss was saying. Focus on those markets that a boss has presented to you. Focus on the information that I sent to you guys earlier about who has job growth, who has employment growth. Um, I, I saw an interesting statistic earlier this week. If you really want to get into uh, some nitty gritty information that people don't pay attention to, go and look at school district growth. That's a huge factor that people don't discuss. You want to see which communities are growing fast, like and you're trying to decide which one I want to get into, see how many students have gone into, go into, you know, into that school district from year over year. That's a huge component. Household formation is a, is a big stat. 100%. I love that. I don't actually, I look at schools nearby and I look at the reviews and everything, but I don't look at that. And so that's interesting. I'll add that to, to my future uh, method. And one one follow up question on this. Uh, yeah. So, what are your thoughts on uh, like uh, I've heard a little bit about uh, you know near source saying that's kind of like kind of uh, manufacturing jobs uh, getting shifted to uh, Lerada Nova Nova Lerada in uh, Mexico. It's kind of the border town to San Antonio. Uh, so, okay. are you uh, what are your thoughts on like you know uh, more manufacturing jobs coming to that uh, place like from China and uh, kind of, you know, giving a boost to San Antonio, all right? Uh, I mean, is it all hype or do you think there is some substance to it? So particularly to San Antonio, um, San Antonio is a, is a tough market. Uh, we do cover, so we, we cover um, Nevada, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, and then actually San Antonio. San Antonio is what I would consider a sleeper market because it just doesn't move, the, the, the needle doesn't get moved all too often. Um, San Antonio needs something huge to happen there for the market to change. Um, people typically grow up in San Antonio and leave to Dallas, leave to Austin. You're typically not seeing the reverse. Uh, it just doesn't have those major employers like a DFW, like the Austins. Um, so San Antonio is a good market. You're just not going to see the growth that you see in DFW or Jacksonville and these other markets. Um, now, one thing, one thing I will say is San Antonio is, is a great investment. It's, it's, it's good product. Um, they do have the military base. So there's, a, there's that down there. But one thing I will say is we, we, need, um, we need proper immigration in America. Um, in order to solve this crisis we're in and towns and like, like, you know, San Antonio with the immigration we have right now, we're not going to see the kind of jobs that we need. Um, and so that's, that would be my comment on, on jobs is we need right immigration to fill a lot of these jobs. Um, you know, I'm having my addition built in my house right now. I was talking to my plumber. I've known him for years. Um, you know, from Mexico, came up here to the States, um, really good guy. He's work, he works super hard. And I know his son because of it. He, I'm like, hey, so what's your son going to do? What's he going to do after high school? Oh, he's going into college. He's doing that. I'm like, no plumbing? Nope, no plumbing. Well, what happened now? We lost a plumber out of the workforce. And we need immigration because immigration helps those jobs. Of course, we all come here for the American dream. You know, uh, some of us, you know, came to Texas for the Texas for the American dream because they had to leave other states. But, you know, we need those, we need jobs back in America. We need them feel, filled correctly so we can fix this inflation issue. You know, if, if Powell really wanted to, you know, Powell, Powell's kind of tied, but if we really wanted to fix this issue, 
we would be focusing on immigration right now. Uh, Ray, Ray says I'm spot on, but that's, that's our concern um, right now. And so to answer your question, yes, Texas will probably continue to well because we are a border state. Um, we probably will pick up a lot of jobs and, and those migrants, but we need it to happen on a national level. Got it. I love it, man. I appreciate that. I wish I could ask more questions. I could talk to you all day long, but unfortunately yeah. we, we did run out of time. Now, question was, if somebody should, if someone wants to see your future email deal blast or yeah. connect with you, what, what do you recommend they do? Um, man, feel free. I'm going to email your boss what I sent out. And then if okay. you want to send it with your, uh, with your, you know, database, but um, yeah. a quick, quick find right now is multifamilyadvisors.com multifamilyadvisors.com. That's my team. I'm on the Flow and Hoover team. There you go. Thanks, the boss. Um, and uh, yeah, again, we cover a bunch, a bunch of uh, territory. Uh, and so I specifically focus on 75 units and greater, like the boss mentioned. Um, you know, I do focus on the, actually the, the larger private client deals. So 170 and above is really my lane of focus. I, you know, boss was a, um, now, a boss, you know, did an off-market deal with us and, you know, I, I kind of got roped into it. Um, but thank God I did because I got to meet him <laughs> because of it. I appreciate that, man. That one great. And, he, and he's got people like if he's not busy doing his hundred million dollar deal, he's got uh, another person, Jonathan, actually, is also phenomenal who does anything yeah. you know, that's in the more reasonable entry point for normal people like us. <laughs> yeah. And, and we, have a, we have a smaller team, too. So um, feel free to reach out to us, email us all. Uh, it's Once you get in the groove, you'll figure it out. 100%. So that website is multifamilyadvisors.com. I put that in the chat. Sign up for the future email blast so that way you get on their database. Yep. Man, Wes, I super appreciate all you've done. Drop a fire in the chat if you loved Wes. This guy just rocked Thanks, it. Guys. I appreciate all the value you've added here. Yeah, hey, I appreciate you, boss. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. All right. Well, we've got our next panel. Man, this has been phenomenal. Drop drop a fire in the chat. Let us know how much we appreciate him. He's been super awesome. All right. Now, our next panel is we have a panel of SEC attorneys. Now, why is that important? Why is it important to have an SEC attorney on your deals? Because you don't want to go to jail. If you're raising funds on a deal, you have to follow the laws that are set by the Securities and Exchange Commission because you're essentially selling securities uh, when you're buying a property. And so it's very important you have an SEC attorney on every single transaction. So I brought in uh, the top three SEC attorneys that I know. These guys are just doing a lot of deals. They know a lot of people and they're going to talk to us about what's happening right now in terms of current laws that you need to be aware of, plus changes that are happening in the meantime that you should also know so you avoid getting in trouble. So let me pull up uh, the, the speakers right now. We've got Adnan. Let's see, where's Adnan at? He's... Uh... Can you pull them up for me, Vinky? Let's Everybody's see. been on my screen, so I'm not sure if you are seeing, but I have a oh, interesting. and Anon, and you have to do the I'm same. I'm trying to see how to spotlight them. Yeah, to so you can pin them, go to the participants, and then from there. Oh, I see. As well. Yeah. All right, let me let me do that real quick. Sorry, guys, we're we're not very techy. Pin, there we go. So I pinned that non. Yeah. Let me get so, Mauricio. Yeah. Okay. Uh, add pin. And then we got Kim. Now, Mauricio, uh, Mauricio has his podcasting mic. He's all set up. He's a, he's a professional yeah. at this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. see you all. Welcome, everybody. Perfect. And then let me add myself in there as well. Very cool. I think, can you guys see all of us or, or is it just on my screen? Oh, no. I messed it up. Uh, I think we're all seeing Ad, uh, Adnan right now. We got to get Mauricio on again. Uh, add spotlight. There we go. Okay, I'm doing it right now. Cool. And then add spotlight, and then I got to spotlight myself. Perfect. I think I think you guys can see all of us now. Perfect. Let me unmute. Unmute. There we go. Uh, unmute. There. Oh, there we go, Kim. Kim, I, is it letting you unmute? There we go. Cool, awesome. Can we do a mic test? Hey. There hey. we go. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. So Kim, Adnan and Mauricio, I appreciate you all hopping on. Um, I want to start this off with some introductions of each one of you guys. If you could just spend like a minute or two, just kind of introducing yourself and, and what you do and where you're located. And then we'll just get into the, the questions. Let's start off with, with Kim. Hi, I'm the founder of Syndication Attorneys PLLC. See, it's a Florida law firm, but we serve clients all over the country. I also host the podcast, Raise Private Money Legally, and have written the number one Amazon bestselling book, How to Legally Raise Private Money. I love it. I love it. Adnan? Hi, my name is Adnan Merchant. I'm a co-founder at MW Law. We're a Dallas-based law firm that really focuses on real estate private equity, and we're a title company as well. So we, uh, we're sort of a one-stop shop for real estate investors, um, syndicators, private equity funds, all that kind of stuff. I love it. I love it, Adnan. I appreciate that. And then Mauricio. Hey, everyone. I'm Mauricio. I'm the founder of Premier Law Group. We help real estate syndicators stay out of jail. I'm the host of a podcast, The Real Estate Syndicate Live, every Tuesday at 4.30. And I uh, wrote a book called The Five Things Every Syndicator Must Know to Stay Out of Jail. I love your YouTube channel, by the way. I saw you just crossed 2,000 subscribers. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> great That's job, cool. great I, job. I wanted to go faster but it's been nice it's been a it's been a lot of fun to be doing over the last couple of years so well you've got you've got a very niche type of audience right you're not you're not going to for the masses you're going after syndicators so it's a it's a small group it is it's a very small group so but looking forward to this panel and uh good to see kim and uh it's been a while since i've seen you in person kim but good to see you again yeah you too and, and Adnan, nice to meet you have we met i don't know if we met before in person yeah, I don't think we've met, but obviously we we run in a lot of the same circles. So I'm really looking forward to getting 100%. to know both of y'all. Yeah, yeah. let's do this. I love it. So I'm going to start off with, with Kim. Kim, you get the first question. One of the most important things that people need to realize when they get into this business is, you know, there are laws that they have to follow when it comes to raising equities and raising money. And so I, I think a lot of people that are on here, they're just kind of getting into the business. Maybe they've done one deal. Can you talk to us about the importance of knowing the differences between 506B, 506C? What, what is 506B and 506C to begin with and get into that? Okay, so these are federal securities exemptions that allow you to raise money from private investors without having to get pre-approval from regulators. And so there's just kind of two different sets of rules depending on who, what, who you think your investors are going to be. 506B is where all of our clients start. Uh, that allows you to raise an unlimited amount of money from an unlimited number of accredited investors and up to 35 non-accredited but sophisticated investors but you can't find them through any means of general advertising or solicitation. The way to prove that you didn't advertise or solicit is to be able to demonstrate that you had a pre-existing substantive relationship with each prospective investor before you offered them an investment opportunity. So that's 506B. Uh, 506C does allow you to advertise, but it restricts you to only allowing verified accredited investors to participate in your deal. So they actually have to go through a third party verification process, or you've got to review their financials their, yourself to make sure that they meet that definition. And then you could admit them into your deals. Right. So, so you have, if it's a 506B raise, which is what most people use that just get into the business, you have to have a, a prior relationship prior to getting the, the property under contract or before starting to raise the funds. It's before you have a current or contemplated deal. So you know, current and deal is, you know, you got the offering documents in hand, you're actively raising money, contemplated deal. I would argue that by the time you've hired your securities attorneys and they're working on your docs, you have a contemplated deal. But, uh, you know, LOI stage isn't necessarily a contemplated deal because you still have to do some due diligence. You may decide not to go forward with that deal. But it, it, your, your whole premise here is that you should be developing relationships with investors prior to offering them investment opportunities. So every, everyone you're meeting today is not for any active deal that you have right now. It's for current or for future, future deals. Got it. Perfect. So you have to have the relationship prior to getting the deal. And then with a 506C, you don't have to worry about relationships, but they just have to be accredited, correct? That's right. That's right. Very and then cool. they have to prove it. Yeah. So there's they have a to little prove bit of a hassle factor accredited. for your investment. Mm -hmm. Got it. Very cool. Now, Mauricio, uh, I've heard you talk about this a lot. I think you're one of the people that has brought the most awareness to this in the, in the syndication space. And then it's switching from a 506B to a 506C in the middle of our race. Every time I talk to someone about that, they always mention you and your videos about it. So I'd love to have you talk about, you know, what are the pros and the cons of doing that? How does that process go? Are you raising 506B and then you switch to a 506C in the middle of it? 
Yeah, you know, I was hesitant to even talk about it at the beginning because when I first read this thing, I was like, I was like, what? There's, there's got to be a typo or something. And and when the proposed rule came out, I read. I remember it was like November, so like between Christmas and New Year's, I didn't really have a time to do a deep dive. So it took me a while to dig into it. But essentially, what happened was in it actually in March of 2021, so two years, almost two years ago, the SEC completely overhauled the integration rules. And not buried in there, but one of the integration things that they they basically said was like, hey, if you ever if you ever start a deal under 506B, you can actually then terminate that offering, start a 506C, and we won't integrate those two offerings. We won't consider those two as one. And so we have a situation now where you can literally in, in the same deal, we're talking about the same, you're going to go buy an apartment building. You can start a deal under 506B, which which Kim just did a great job of explaining. So you know you can you you cannot advertise, you cannot generally solicit, you 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 can you know you've got to have a pre-existing subject relationship, all that fun stuff, um, and uh, get your people in there. And then at some point, and and maybe it's because it's like the pros and cons. Maybe it's because um, you know you're just short on the raise. Like you, hey, you, I was going to raise five million dollars, and I'm kind of stuck on the raise. Or or you know maybe you want to just expand your audience, but you can then. Pivot, I call it pivoting, but what you're actually doing is terminating, right? And so we'll talk about it in a second because that's critical. But you can pivot essentially and say, okay, well, I'm done with my 506B. I'm not doing 506B anymore. I'm going to switch to 506C. And from that point forward, comply fully with all the rules of 506C, which Kim just went over as well. So accredited investors only, got to take reasonable steps to verify that they're accredited. And then you can essentially, the SEC even in the rule said, basically use the same documents Now we we actually do tweak them you know quite a bit because it does it, it does change that your business plan changes a little bit when you're doing the second piece but essentially you do those two things and so obviously the the pro is if somebody you know again can't finish all the raise or maybe they just got a bunch of non-accredited that they're they're sort of their 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 bread and butter investors and they want to get them in the door and, and then you know cut it off and then you know go to the 506c that's probably a good scenario for them it's not for everyone I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, we've had an infl a flooding of deals. We, you know, I was checking with the team before so I, this is probably going to come up, but I mean, we've probably done it just, just over 20 of those since we, I started talking about it, which has only been about a year ago. So we're not doing a ton because a lot of people don't need to do it, don't want to do it. But the key is that you have to terminate. So you, you start 506B, you, you, you um, alert everyone that that's what you're doing. So you want to disclose everything and then you terminate it. You mean, I mean, no more money, no more docs, no more IRA money, nothing's trickling in. You are terminating that offer. And then from that day on, I would actually recommend doing sort of a written resolution or something. Hey, today's the day we're done with B and starting tomorrow or starting this afternoon, I'm switching to a 506 C and now I've got to make sure that I'm complying fully. And we do amend the documents. We have a second second of documents that we have, you know, send out. And the business plan is, is a little bit different too, because you don't need to raise 2 million anymore. You only need to raise 600 grand or whatever. Um, and one of the things I like to do is, and again, it's not in the rule, but I think a good practice is to actually create separate classes of shares, one for your B raise, one for your C raise, even though they're exactly the same, there's no difference. But when you're out there advertising, let's say you're on social media or you're doing podcasts on the C side, you're specifically offering those C shares or whatever those shares are. So there's no confusion that, hey, you were you were really selling the B when you're on the podcast. Just, I just think it, it keeps it really clean. Uh, a nice, like, it's done a lot cleaner that way. I love it. I love it. So, so you start off with the B, you get all of your non-accredited investors in, and then you switch to a C. So then you could you could start advertising, posting, and then get the the accredited investors afterwards. Could you do it in reverse, where you start off with the C and then switch it to a B? No, absolutely not. So once you do once you do a five hundred six C, well, let me just backtrack. Assuming you're doing a five hundred six C and you've actually advertised and you've, you've actually solicited and you've really done a five hundred six C, then by that time that the bag, you know, the cat's out of the bag. You can't then like just try and get it back in and start doing a B because one of the requirements of a B is you cannot generally solicit or advertise, and presumably you've already done that with the five hundred six C. So you can go from a B to a C. You cannot go from a C to a B. Got it. That's awesome. Uh, I love it. Um, if you guys have any questions about any of this stuff, hold off for right now. I'm, we're going to go back to all this. Um, and now I have a question for you. And this I noticed this happen a lot during uh, races that I do. And other co-GPs ask me this question all the time, which I refer to an attorney, is that can if you're doing a 506B, you have to have a prior relationship with the person before you let them end the deal. But then the question comes up, what if I'm talking to an investor and the investor has a referral and I've never talked to the investor that they're referring me prior to me doing the deal? Can you talk about that? Is it legal to get the money in? Is it not legal? What are, what are the differences? 
Yeah, and that's a great question, right? I mean, it goes back to a lot of what Lisa said earlier, right? It really depends if we're conducting a 506B or a C. Uh, by the way, I do apologize. I've got a bit of a cold, so I think I might sound a little nasally. I promise I don't sound like this every day. Um, I, I talked yeah. to him on the phone. I can prove that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah. And, and so, you know, it depends, right? So the same rules are still going to apply. If you're doing a 506B, you have to have a pre-existing substantive relationship with any investor that you're bringing in. So if you're midway in this raise and it's a 506B and somebody's referring you to somebody that you've never met before, you don't have a relationship, well, certainly you can't take that investor in this round. You don't have that pre-existing substantive relationship with that investor, right? Now, again, if you're doing a 506C raise, right, where you were permitted to just generally advertise social media posts, billboards up on Main Street, whatever you want to do there, then certainly, you know, as people are sending in referrals, you're welcome to start talking and soliciting people to bring into the round. Again, provided that under the 506C, uh, they're all going to be accredited investors and we will need to take those extra steps to verify, right? So it just depends on what, what uh, you know, which safe harbor you're going with to start with. And that's one of the other reasons why, and I'm sure both the other attorneys on this panel will attest, you really want to be talking to an attorney before you start any one of these deals, right? Because you want to examine your goals. Am I going to need non-accredited investors or am I going to need to generally advertise and solicit, right? Uh, and we're going, to, we're going to design this deal and this raise based on the goals that you have um, so that you can get the deal done. Right. 100%. And, and uh, from the attorneys I've worked with, you know, they would normally send you a questionnaire, you fill out the questionnaire. And so that way right. they can set up the, the, the documents based on the questionnaire that you answer. So I, I think that's very important. Now, how do you establish, and this is a, a question someone is asking, how do you establish a pre-existing relationship with an investor, a, substanti a substantive relationship? Yeah, that's another great question, right? So with, in, in that same vein, it, it's actually, it's two things that everybody should be keeping in mind. The first is pre-existing, but the second is substantive, right? So that's what a lot of people tend to sometimes forget um, is, oh yeah, I knew this dude from before, but really I just met him once, right? And we talked like for two minutes, right? Well, that's not going to qualify as substantive, even if it's pre-existing. So it's two things, pre-existing and substantive. Now, how do we define that? The funny thing about this is the SEC doesn't actually have a statute that says, here's exactly how we define pre-existing substantive relationship, which, you know, SEC, federal government agency, fantastic, right? But what we do get uh, are no action letters. So they're similar to case law in, in, in the way that, uh, you know, the way that a lot of, you know, other areas of law work. We have what we call no action letters from the SEC, where the SEC tells us, yeah, look, if you did it that way, we would take no action. In other words, that's perfectly cool, right? Um so when we put a lot of those no action letters together, we do tend to get a bit of a framework, right? And that's the, that's one of the important things to recognize as well, is that it's going to be a totality of circumstances. It's never usually one thing like, hey, I knew this guy for five years, or hey, I had one really great, you know, coffee date with this person, right? So it's a totality of different circumstances that goes into defining what we think is a pre-existing substantive relationship, right? A couple of key points, though, that the SEC has, again, kind of identified in these no action letters is, um, look, did you get a chance to really know this person? Did you understand their level of sophistication? Are they somebody that is capable of evaluating the merits of this deal, right? So if you're raising $10 million to buy an apartment complex, have they invested in real estate before? Um, you know, have they, you know, have you taken the time to get to know what they do? You know, what are their occupations? What is their general net worth or income, right? So a lot of people will send those questionnaires like you mentioned, right? Um, so there's a lot of things that you do, right? One of the other things that is, it, it's it's debatable. There's a lot of different opinions on this, but there's a timing factor, right? And, and that goes to the pre-existing. How long did you know them and how long did it take to establish this pre-existing relationship before you invited them into the round? Now, there's not a hard and fast rule for that. There really isn't because again, it's from these no action letters, right? So what you're looking at doing is, you know, again, totality of circumstances. Maybe I met them, you know, at a conference. Uh, then I had a call with them. And I, I got to know them and I had them get to know me. I gave them an opportunity to ask us questions about my business and about our syndication business and what we do. Um, and then I met them in person, right? Or, you know, during COVID, you had a really good Zoom call with somebody. You really dove deep into those kinds of things. And then you waited for a little bit of a time. Sometimes it's referred to as a cooling off period. But again, it's not, again, it, it's not completely required to have the cooling off period, but it is one of those things that it, it could be recommended. It could really help evaluate that situation, right? You know, I had a professor in law school, and to kind of sum up the answer here, I had a question in law school who used to always just tell us most of these kinds of things are just a rose test, right? If it smells like a rose, it looks like a rose, it feels like a rose, it's going to be a rose, right? So really ask yourself, 
do you have a pre-existing substantive relationship with this person before you started this deal, right? And most of the time you can kind of gather what that should mean on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. And just to clarify uh, for everybody, and that's that's only on 506B. If it's a 506C, right. uh, you don't need this, but you do have to have them accredited, correct? That's right. Yeah, exactly as Kim described it, right? So in a 506B, you can take up to 35 non-accredited, sophisticated investors, but the caveat is no general advertising, and you have to have those pre-existing substantive relationships. Got it. Now, no general advertising. Could you just quickly elaborate on, on what that would entail? Yeah, I mean, definitely we're talking about like, you know, um, no billboards on Main Street. You don't want to be doing social media posts where you're soliciting large groups of people. Hey, I've got this deal. We're buying an apartment complex. Find out how you can get involved, right? I mean, it, it has to truly be a private uh, raise, right? So it's people that you know, people that you have those relationships with. You don't want to be advertising it in any way. Right, right. So personally, I mean, we send out emails to our current database of people that we have relationships with. So if you're not in that database, you're not going to see a deal for right. us that's got to speed. Now, uh, I see sometimes people post pictures and they do this stuff. They're posting pictures of the due diligence. Is that legal? <laughs> Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> Uh, you know, again, it, it's it's going to be a case by case basis, right? What we want to not do is we don't want to be soliciting investments. There's a difference between, you know, talking about, you know, what your company is, what your company does, right? And the business that you're doing. But what you have to be careful about is you can't be soliciting investments from people with whom you don't have pre-existing relationships. So honestly, it's going to be a case by case basis. It's a, it's It depends is the answer. And I know that sucks coming from a lawyer. Um, but the answer truly <laughs> is, you know, you got to look at these things on a case by case basis, talk to your lawyer, make sure you don't accidentally violate securities laws and, and, you know, accidentally wind up in a lot of trouble with the SEC. I love it. I appreciate that. Let's circle back to Kim. Kim, I want to ask you, I, and I'm noticing this is happening more and more frequently where people are jumping to doing funds rather than raising money on a particular deal by deal basis. Can you talk to us about the difference on these two ways of raising money? Sure. Uh, so if you're raising money on a deal by deal basis, we call that a specified offering. So you've got something under contract, you can create uh, sources and use of funds for that particular deal. It's like, here's how I'm going to spend all the money that I'm going to raise. Here's how it's going to be allocated. And then I'm going to get some of the money from the lender. I'm going to get the rest of the money from investors. So that becomes your sources and uses of funds. You're going to be able to do a pro forma based on past performance of a property try to uh, explain to the investors what you're going to be doing to that property to add value over the duration of time you plan to own it. And then you're going to maybe propose an exit strategy. You're going to have to make some assumptions about what kind of uh, cap rates are going to be in place at the time you go to sell and how much you're going to be able to increase the NOI, stuff like that. So that specified offering is the easiest possible way to raise money because you have concrete information that you can put in front of your investors based on some reasonable assumptions. You're going to list what those assumptions are. They can decide whether they think you're making reasonable assumptions or not. So it, it becomes very easy. You also have a timeline involved. So you have to get the money in the door. So you're going to be a little bit more diligent about following up with people, reaching out to people, getting them to invest. Those deals, uh, our, our statistics show that 85% of specified offerings close as long as a sufficient amount, you know, you've got a signed purchase agreement, someone from your team's been to the site and uh, you've reviewed the financials before you actually engage us and get us started working on your docs. At that point, uh, your docs, you're 85% you're likely to close on that deal. You'll be able to raise the money. A fund is a whole different animal. It's the hardest possible way for anybody to raise money. You don't have anything under contract. You've got a business plan. You're saying, hey, here's my business plan. This is the kind of stuff we're going to buy if we can find it. We don't know when we're going to find it, where we're going to find it, but we're looking. It, and so people will just tend to sit on the sidelines and wait until you get something under contract before they invest anyway. So a fund will allow you to have multiple properties in an offering. Um, so, you know, you could, you could, uh, you know, close on three properties at once, or you could close on 10 properties over a, you know, span of time. Um, but it's still, you're not going to go out and raise a huge amount of money all at once and have it sitting in your bank account. So you can go out and look because investors are really going to sit still for about 90 to 120, 20 days before they want to return. So you got to get that money invested. So, you know, my experience has been that people who have funds are still raising the money when they have a deal under contract. So it just gives you the docs already in place so that you can continue that raise. 
and uh, you know, without having to stop, get a new set of documents uh, prepared, and then uh, you know, force forge ahead with those docs. Um, for a lot of people, though, a fund is not the right way to go because if you don't have an established track record already doing what you're planning to do with your fund, then nobody's going to invest with you. There's a whole lot of fund documents that get written where people raise a very small amount of money or no money at all. You know, thinking that they're going to go out and, and dream big. And then they never get anywhere with it because it's just a harder raise. Um, right. The other pitfall with a fund is, you know, people think, oh, I'm just going to do a $50 million fund. And then they only raise, you know, two or $3 million. You know, what does that look like to your investors? That looks like a failed fund. You're better off to start with a small fund, get it fully subscribed, get it fully employed, and then, you know, step up to a larger fund and, and continue to grow as your track record builds. That, that's just my opinion on funds. Yeah. Can I ask yeah, that real quick? Can I add to that? Because yeah. that's such a great point because that happens all, oh, I'm going to do a hundred million dollar fund. Oh, no, 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 no. And it's like, they end up raising two or three. I think from a, from a marketing perspective, let alone a legal, but like, just think of it if, like to Kim's point, like if you did a small array, a fund, like a $3 million array, a fund, and then you do another three, now you're on fund number two. Now you can point to fund number one and say, hey, look, I did a three million. Uh, now you're on number four, number five, number six. And instead of doing one fund that you said it was a hundred and you've only done 20 or whatever, you've done seven funds. You can you can point to your to your performance and, and record. And, and I think from a marketing perspective, it makes it a lot easier when you're on fund six and you are trying to raise that hundred million dollar fund that you're never going to raise money for. Completely <laughs> right. agree. Yeah. Perception yeah. is very important in this business, you know? We, we do a lot of funds, uh, and especially right now, um, just given where markets are, um, and I couldn't agree with you guys more, right? So, I mean, there's there's a set of clients who are very capable of doing that, and then there's a set of clients who really should build a track record use, doing syndications, right? Because syndications really are funds. They're single asset, single project funds. So do those, go full cycle, get these exits under your belt, and then go be like, hey, give me $10 million. I don't know what I'm going to go buy yet, but I promise it's going to be great, and here's my business plan, Right. Right. I, I know uh, W, uh, I'm sorry, S2 uh, Capital in Dallas, they didn't start a fund until like 2021, I believe it was, where they've already done like $7 billion of assets by that right. point. Then they started yeah. a fund because they had the track record, they could raise a ton of money very quickly. But if you're just starting out, it's it's more challenging because investors don't know, you know, what you've done before, what property you're going to be buying. And so, it, you know, they're a little more hesitant. Now, if somebody does want to start a fund, what it, like how would they go about doing it and how is it different than just a regular um, regular syndication uh, Mauricio you know the, the you know obviously the exemption the legal parts the same the same exemption you're going to try and figure out are you doing a 506b 506c or whatever you're trying to do the main difference really comes down really in my opinion to the business plan because instead of obviously identifying the property first and getting it a contract and then showing all the pretty pictures and here's here's the market and here's my pro forma and here's this and here's that what you're going to be doing is actually providing what we call fund criteria or, or parameters where you're saying, hey, I'm going to go raise $100 million or I'm going to go raise a bunch of money and I'm going to go buy multifamily in the Dallas and San Antonio markets between 100 and 300 units that have this, that, and you start trying to craft some parameters from your perspective, you'd like to have probably the more uh, as broad as possible. So you have the most flexibility, but your investors probably want you to be as narrow as possible. And you've just got to find, find that, that happy medium in between. Uh, but to be honest with you, you know, the, the, the disclosure documents and all that stuff is very similar. But what's going to change is the fact that obviously you're taking the money first, then identifying the property versus the project specific. It's reversed. So it's, in my opinion, it's primarily the business plan and the, and the, you know, the project description part that really is the most, uh, that, 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 that's the most different from, from a regular project specific. Got it. And did they, did they cost the same generally or is it different? We charge more for funds. And the only reason we do that is because in my experience, uh, if somebody's never done a fund before all these other things that, don't show up in a project specific, start to show up in a fund. So you start thinking, well, well are investors going to be able to come in and out? Uh, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? You know, what if you can't raise all the money? Are you going to take all the money up front or are you going to take a little bit up front in soft commitments or whatever? And then you're going to do the rest. Are you going to buy everything right now? There's all these thousands of questions that come up and that just leads to more and more consultations on the front end. So instead of maybe doing one or two calls on the front end to figure out what they're doing, we're doing multiple mores because it was like, what about this? And then they'll, they'll have to think about it. And we have another call and then they'll have, and then we'll go back and forth. So it takes a lot longer to get to that business plan stage because of all of these items that they haven't even thought about it. So it just takes long. So we charge a little bit more on the fun side. Got it. Got it. That's awesome. Um, 
Now, Adnan, I'm seeing a rise in the fund of funds model. Uh, that's becoming more and more common. I'm hearing from uh, different investors. Can you talk about what a fund of fund is and uh, what you're seeing out there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it is something that a lot of people are looking at doing, but I do want to urge listeners to be very careful when you're considering fund of funds model, right? So, you know, everything that we've been talking about today, when we talk about securities compliance is coming from the Securities Act, which gives us regulation D and tells us 506B, but there are actually two other securities acts that are always out there that people tend to forget about in real estate, and for good reason, because it's real estate. The first is the Investment Company Act, and the second is the Investment Advisors Act. Now, the reason I mention all this as a prelude to the answer is because when you're raising a syndication or even a real estate private equity fund, your underlying assets are real property, real estate, right? You're buying real estate. And so at that level, the SEC has less restrictions on what you're doing under those other two securities acts. When you do a fund of funds, think about this conceptually, right? If you're doing a syndication, you got like an LLC, you might have an SPE, but let's ignore all those details. You got a syndication, it's going to go and buy and own a property. Well, in a fund of funds, your underlying asset is not that property anymore. Your underlying asset, if you're a fund of funds, is the securities in the syndication that then owns the property. So what happens in that situation is now you are subject to the Investment Company Act because you're, you're not buying real estate, you're buying securities. And if you're subject to the Investment Company Act, then you're also subject to the Investment Advisors Act. So there's a lot of, and, and that comes with additional restrictions, right? So for example, one that is common is you, you've got a restriction of fewer than 100 beneficial owners. So you need 99 investors maximum um, because you know, you're, you're now considered what we call a small private investment company instead of a real estate investment company. And so there's a lot of different rules that you have to be cognizant of when you do a fund of funds, right? I get the appeal, right? Fund of funds is one of those things that, hey, I don't want to go out and do all of this work and do the syndication, but I've got the ability to raise the capital so I can find these syndicators and these sponsors and partner with them by raising my own syndication or my own fund and investing in theirs. But it's not so simple sometimes, right? And so you really need to be careful when you're looking into those things. There, there's, a, there's a really fantastic lawyer out of, out of Arizona. Uh, his name is Steven, and he's looking into some very interesting research that him and I are kind of going back and forth on a little bit um, about like the ability to think about these things not as, you know, what we call 3C5 or 3C1 funds and figure out if there's ways to get around that. But the truth of the matter is, more often than not, you really want to be careful when you navigate those waters. So again, talk to an attorney before you do a fund of funds and make sure that it's something that is doable in your situation. Oftentimes, the cost and the compliance that's associated with doing something like that can cannot be worth it if you're just trying to raise a couple million bucks to raise into somebody's syndication, right? Um, so yeah, you know, there's there's other creative ways to do that kind of a business model, joint ventures, um, and other ways to think about those things. But again, you just want to be careful when you get in that securities waters. Can I do an add-on? Can I do an add-on? Can I do oh, an sure, add-on to that? Because this is something that happens a lot. So I couldn't agree more with what uh, what was just said. But a lot of people, when they think, when I think of a fund of funds, I think of somebody putting together a fund where they're going to go out and and look at and invest in other people's deals, right? So so that's that's a fund of funds, and and, and there's all these other compliance that you just talked about. But what a lot of people want to do is they just want to say, hey, you know, Mauricio's got a fund and he's raising five million. So let me put together my own fund. And let me raise a million dollars into that so I can just invest in his deal. And you've got to be super careful of that because you're starting to act a lot like a broker dealer there. If all you're doing is raising money into your fund and turning around and giving it to Mauricio or somebody else, like what are you adding value? You want you don't want you start to look like what's called a disguised commission. You're, you're kind of putting all these little smoke screens where really the money starts here and it goes to this and this entity and this entity. But at, at the end of the day, if you're not adding additional value with your due diligence, with your you know just negotiating better terms, doing all these other things, finding the right deals, you know you're looking at ten deals and you're picking these three, then you you're probably acting as a broker. So at, at Premier, we don't even we actually don't take clients that just want to do a fund of funds where they just want to invest in somebody's deal. If they're going to do a fund of funds, it's got to be like, I'm going to go invest in a bunch of deals. And what of the values that I'm going to do is I'm going to go do the due diligence on these operators. I'm going to do the due diligence on all these things. And then I'll make a decision. And that's what I'm getting compensated for, not just raising a bunch of money and turning it around and writing a check. Got it. That's that's awesome. I, I, uh, I appreciate that clarification. Uh, so you have to add value to, to, to others 
in order to get compensated. Otherwise, like you've said, you're not, you know, you're acting as a broker dealer. Now, a follow up question is what if you're allowing investors, and this is from a, someone who's on the call, what if you're allowing investors in a fund to pick their own investments? Do you waive the RIA requirements? RIM, I'm guessing, stands for Registered Investment Advisor. Um, so if you're letting people choose their own investments, are you, you know, are you waiving the RIA requirement? Anybody want to answer that? I, you know, I'm just going to, I've seen this model that's been circulating and I'm guessing what that question is. And I'm not, I don't be biased. I'm not necessarily a fan of the model and maybe I just don't have my mind around it, but there seems to be a model out there and, and, and I'll pose this to the other attorneys as well, where they're putting together a fund and they're somehow allowing the investors to basically pick what, you know, once they find a deal, you get to pick what what deal they go into, right? And and that's fine, I guess, except there's a lot of issues with liability and there's also, you know, there's still additional disclosures you have to do. So I think everybody's trying to save the money on a PPM and I don't think it necessarily sells you anything. <laughs> but I don't think that changes anything with your RIA. First of all, RIA, Registered Investment Advisory Rules, generally speaking, are a state level, unless you're doing 100 million or maybe now it's 150. So if you're just starting out and doing a $20 million fund, you're probably looking at your particular state because the way the law works is that it, you, they, they look at you, as you as a fund manager, you're advising your LLC, your syndication. That's why you're advising as to the purchase of securities. So that's a state by state issue. So each state's going to have their own you know, requirements as to whether you need to register or get an exemption. Most of them have exemptions, but the fact that the investor somehow gets to pick what uh, what deal they end up getting, whatever structure that comes up with, I don't see how that has any effect on whether you as the fund manager are advising your fund as to the purchase of securities. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll totally agree, right? So we we have this concept that we we've thrown around a lot, and it became really prevalent during the pandemic, like the very early pandemic, a pledge fund, right? Um, and what is a pledge fund, right? A pledge fund is one of those structures. It's a very unique fund structure in which you're allowing your investors to be able to diligence each deal and kind of opt in on it. But as Mauricio said, and I couldn't agree more, that doesn't, it doesn't get you out of any of these securities requirements, right? It's a unique structure that you can put in place um, that a lot of emerging fund managers might find helpful because A, they can still raise capital commitments and B, their investors feel comfortable because they can still diligence each deal. But it doesn't get you out of this fact that, you know, you are still soliciting investment capital um, and you are still sourcing investment assets, right? So it's not getting you out of any of the securities laws. It might just be a unique structure that helps you on your business terms and your business plan. But I would be very weary to suggest that it does get you out of securities compliance, right? Yeah, I would um, agree with that. We do a fund of funds and uh, we take the position that it doesn't matter. If you're buying securities in somebody else's deal versus buying direct real estate to Adnan's point, then you are crossing into the realm of being an investment company. And now you're subject to the Investment Advisors Act. So you have to comply with that as well. And we take the position that uh, you have to file the form ADV part one with the SEC up until you have $25 million in assets. Uh, but you may also have to register at your state level. Some states have no requirements for RIAs. Some states have very rigid requirements for RIAs. And they may also impose some further restrictions on who can invest in your offering. So they, you know, California, for instance, has a rule of a qualified investor rule. Once you uh, become an IRA, you can't take accredited investors anymore. You have to take qualified investors. So, uh, which which is a higher standard. Um, so, yeah, it's it becomes a big problem. It sounds very easy. Um, you know, I advise clients that you know it's it's probably not really where you want to go if you are trying to raise money for other people. You should be looking that at it more like a, you know co GP uh, model, which is totally incorrect terminology, but that's what <laughs> everyone calls it. Um, but, you know, where you're actually becoming co-managers of a syndicate with them. So you're in the management team, you're participating meaningfully, you have other jobs besides raising money. Now you're in a defensible position. If you're worried about someone else stealing your investors, which is why you're trying to put them into your own isolated little pod, then uh, you can use a non-disclosure, non-circumvent agreement. You know, it doesn't prevent somebody from trying to steal them, but it is a deterrent. And, uh, you know, it it, you know, if somebody does it anyway, then, you know, they're not, they're unethical, you shouldn't be investing with them anyway. 
Got it. Very cool. Well, now to switch topics from funds and funds of funds, I'm sure we could dive into that for many hours. Uh, let's talk about 1031 exchanges because I think that applies to a lot of people here. Could you 1031 exchange into uh, a proper, into a syndication? Adnan, could you, could you cover that for us? Sure. So, you know, the, the issue with 1031 exchanges, it has to be what we call like kind exchange, right? So, you can't sit 1031 into an ex, into a syndication in its as an entity, right? The 1031 investor, if they're coming into a deal, they cannot come into the syndication itself because what's happening is they're going from being direct owners of real estate into now being owners of the LLC that owns the inner uh, the owners of real estate. So that's not going to work. Instead, what you have to do if you're going to take a 1031 investor is you have to structure what's called a tenants in common agreement or a tick. Um, and what happens then is the syndication owns maybe call it 80% of the property and the tick investor owns the other 20% of the property. So at a property level, direct interest in the property is what's required for a 1031 exchange in to a deal like this. Now, what I would also say is um, you still have to be careful about that. That's not the only thing that matters as well, right? That's the general philosophy philosophy and theory behind what a 1031 exchange requires, but there are a lot of rules um, that the IRS has as well when it comes to um, 1031, right? So for example, um, at the tick level, at that property level, everything needs to be pro rata. So if they're 20% and you're the syndication's 80%, the distributions at the tick level have to go 80 and 20%. You can't do a complicated, unique waterfall at the tick level and do pref, you know, preferred returns and do this and do that. So you have to treat the, 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 the tick level as the most basic type of joint venture, if you will. And then the syndication entity within itself can do whatever it wants thereafter. But what happens a lot of times with that then is, and again, you can do this, right? As I mentioned, but again, this is one of those cost benefit analysis sometimes that sponsors have to really think through. To do the tick and to bring in a 1031 investor requires structuring that tick underneath the syndication. So now you've got a lot of increased work, right? Um, so oftentimes for smaller 1031 investors, it just tends not to be worth it, unfortunately. Um, and so you really only consider it when it's like a high dollar value 1031 coming in that you want to bring into the deal, right? But again, there's a lot of different moving pieces that come with that. So you can certainly do it. You just want to be careful how you do it. You want to structure it properly. You want to make sure you're compliant with the IRS regulations, not just securities, right? Because again, the security stuff is one level up now. That has nothing to do with the 1031, which is a tax issue, right? Got it. And don't Very forget, don't forget the disclosures too, because yeah. you know a lot of times the 1031 investors come in at the end, right? Because they're like, oh, I'm short right. and I got this right guy. <laughs> well, if you're going to restructure, because because of what what and I just mentioned, which is you've got to be proportional. You can you can only do this, you can only do that. Then you've got to rework all the docs, right? Because now you've got somebody right. else in, you got to redo. So now you got to go back to all your investors that have already signed the PPM and basically tell them, hey there's a material change to this deal. Now I got this 1031 person. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. We're not going to own hundred percent. We're going to own 92%. And so, you know, we're going to change the deal and you've got to give them that option to back out. Like if they don't like the new deal with the 1031, then they, you you've got to give out. them that option to get out. So it's really tricky. It, it, like, like to your point, it can be done, but it's a royal pain in the end. Yeah. And, we, and well, we definitely and, charge, yeah. we definitely charge more for that. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's, I, would that's, add, uh, I would add to that that the, the lender has to approve that tenant right. in common, right? Because they have to be on the loan because their rights are freely alienable, meaning they could sell their interest to somebody else. And the lender has to have control over them to make sure that they stay in control of that loan. Uh, so I, I have my advice for my clients is, you know, you're giving away whatever portion of the property that person is going to own and you're not going to get a promote off it. You can get some asset management fees, but uh, they have to be customary and ordinary asset management fees. You can't, you know, elevate them for the 1031 investor. So it's a disproportionate amount for them versus what you're charging your other syndicate. Um, you know, you have to be just really <laughs> cautious about that. So I always say, don't do it unless it's your own money. Okay, or it's large enough amount of money that you can't raise any other way. Right. Like how large are we talking? That, you know, if, if you if you're five hundred thousand dollars short and you've got somebody who's got five hundred thousand dollars, well, that's worth bringing in. It's not worth doing it for a fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar investor unless it's your own money that you're bringing in from a ten thirty one exchange of your own. I had to I had to say no on a million dollar check on the last deal we were doing because I didn't want to deal with the hassle of it. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, and you don't want to give yeah. that part of the deal away, right? Because yeah. if you raise all the money from syndication, then you can get your share of profits, or, you know, your 30% share or whatever you're going to be able to keep. But uh, otherwise, you're giving that away because as you know, to add its point, your splits have to happen at the property level. Those are IRS. Rules. There's a, a revenue procedure called uh, RevProc 2002-22 that describes all the different things that you have to comply with and for a, a tenant in common not to be to become a disqualified partnership that would take away the uh, 1031 benefits. So, you know, you got to be aware of what those rules are and, and there's multiple rules you'd have to follow. I love it. By the way, I love how you can mention the specific like rule and then dash. And it's like I, us normal people can't do that. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry, were you saying you were trying to say something? Uh, I was just saying there's actually, yeah, to kids, boy, there's 15 of them. There's 15 restrictions. About five or six are kind of relevant to what we do, but there are, and people forget about those. And uh, it's it's not an SEC thing to add an end's point. Like we can, they ask me, can we do it? Like from my point, I can structure it however you want. I can just, just put it together, disclose it, yeah. but the IRS has their limitations. 100%. Um, I want to jump off to uh, to accepting international investors. Uh, can we, I think a lot of us have international investors, whether it's Canada, or South America, maybe European money, whatever. Can you accept international money and in U.S. funds and syndications? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, you can, uh, but you've got to be aware of certain things. Number one, that country might have securities rules that you have to follow. So if you have anybody there soliciting those funds, uh, you better be make sure you're complying with their rules. Then you're going to have tax complications. So you need to make sure that those investors aren't getting double taxed. You're going to have to withhold uh, taxes from those investors and pay it to the IRS. They're going to have to get uh, their own taxpayer identification number here in the U.S. in order to legally invest with you and file their own return if they want to get a refund on any of that stuff, if it's even available. Um, it's There's tax treaties between the U.S. and all these different countries sometimes, and, or sometimes there's no tax treaty uh, that would describe how much tax has to be withheld from people from different countries. So, you know, the easiest thing for or what, what we tell our clients is it's easier for you if the non-U.S. person actually creates their own entity in the U.S. and then uses that to invest with you. And then they are responsible for their with own, own tax withholdings, their own issues, uh, you know, with, regarding securities and, and whatever else, comp, whatever other complications that they're going to have. But uh, you've just got to be cautious and be cognizant and aware of those things. You also have to make sure that you know those investors because money laundering is a real thing. And uh, you need to make sure that they're not trying to use you for that purpose because you're here. You're the one that's going to go to jail if they are. Yeah, that's not good. So they have to be careful. And don't forget, there's a, you know, we always talk about, you know, 506B, 506C, which are under Reg D. <laughs> And we sometimes talk about Reg A, but there's actually this one called Reg S as in Sam, and that deals with international investors. So if you are exclusively bringing in investors from abroad, exclusively selling and marketing, you're not marketing in the US and it's, everything's happening outside of the United States, you might look into Reg S, at least have that in the back of your mind that there is an exemption out there that, that may fit for you. I love it. I love it. I, I have more questions I want to ask, but I want to give the chance to the participants to ask questions. If you uh, if you have any questions, you could raise your hand. I'll pull you in and you could ask uh, any of these guys any questions you've got. So let's see. We've got Rob. Rob, I'm going to unmute. By the way, before we ask any questions, if you're loving this panel, if they're adding value to you, show them how, how much you love them. Put a fire in the chat right now. Blow up the chat for them because I you know they're doing this for free. So I super appreciate every one of you guys. Hey, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, Abbas. I'm super nerdy about these things, so I love any <laughs> opportunity. Even if I've got a cold, I'm like, yeah, let's talk about this. This is fun. Sometimes I jump on the phone with him now for like an hour and he's just like going into all these details. I'm like, God, I mean, I feel like I'm wasting your time because you're giving me so much info. No, this is <laughs> great. Um, awesome. Yeah, well, well, Bob, you're, you're on. Yo, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Okay, perfect. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the information. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And um, I think I'm becoming just as nerdy about it as well. So I absolutely love it. Um, but um, I'm based in the UK, and we're going to try and raise money in the UK and then take it across to the States. Do you think it would be more advisable for us to set up a UK entity and then raise the money and then do a single sort of transaction where we would manage all of those tax exemptions, all that complicated stuff within the UK entity, and then the 
uh, individual UK investors would be able to like wouldn't have to manage it themselves or would it be better for us to not do that any advice on that basically yeah my recommendation would be that you have a consultation with an international tax advisor that understands both the U UK and US law uh, tax law um, how would I go about finding them um, we have somebody that we could refer you to that uh, has done some really good kind of plain English work for some of our clients, which is kind of hard to find in a tax attorney. Uh, that would be amazing. <laughs> we also work with Weaver. You, you, you want to be working with some of these larger tax consultant groups, right? So I, I think everybody on this panel knows a lot of good people that certainly can recommend it. Oftentimes, that's really what it is, right? With international investors, to, to Lisa uh, and Mauricio's point, right? It, it's, it's just all the tax issues, right? um uh that, that you have to be careful of right so you've got sometimes a lot of inv international investors they're going to structure what we call a blocker entity here in the united states which sometimes is formed as a, as a c corporation right because of the tax rates um and the other thing to be cognizant of sometimes is like certain countries don't recognize the llc as a valid structure so it defaults as a corporation under their tax laws and so now the investor is screwed from a tax perspective there as well which is why still sometimes you might see larger funds structured as limited partnerships um, but certainly I, I would agree what you really want to be doing is getting into the tax side of things and making sure that the money isn't unnecessarily subject to taxes. Amazing. Um, I've, I've connected with you on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll follow up if, if not, I can, if you drop an email or something, I can follow up, but I'd really appreciate any recommendations or anything that you have to talk to the right people. Thank you so much. And we're going to drop everyone's email in the chat as well. Um, all right. Up next, we've got Sharada. Hi. Thank you very much for such wonderful information uh, you guys are sharing on Saturday. Um, my question is more of a uh, uh, clarification that uh, Kim was uh, saying on accreditation process. I understood that uh, we need a third party uh, to uh, validate that, but did I hear you mention that we can review it as well? So what you have to have is a reasonable assurance that those investors are accredited at the time they make the investment or that it's been verified within the last 90 days, uh, at least for the initial time they invest with you. Once someone has invested with you, then uh, they can uh, just continue to be certified by their own assertion after that for, for the next five years. Um, a lot of people will just use a third party, such as verifyinvestor.com, or you know, there's, there's a, several of them out there that'll do it uh, just to make it easier. Um, but if you have the means and the ability, you know, you have someone on your team that's a CPA or a mortgage broker or somebody like that, they're used to looking at people's financials, then there's no reason that you can't look at that information yourself and, and make that verification so that you have that reasonable assurance. The problem there is that if you're getting that information electronically, you now have to safeguard that information. And it could have some sensitive information. You want to make sure that you're not subjecting somebody to, uh, to identity theft. Okay. So uh, to kind of... Uh... Uh, put it on a personal level. So I was a CPA in Singapore and uh, I was a consultant as well. So for me, uh, I'm used to looking at all those uh, documents and data. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can actually put together information and okay, yes, this qualifies, this doesn't qualify and that suffice uh, as an accreditation process. Yeah, as long as you have a reasonable assurance. And so if you were ever audited by, you know, opposing counsel in a litigation matter or SEC or uh, state securities um, investigation, and they started asking you questions to prove how you knew these people were accredited, as long as you can defend that by saying, I reviewed this, this, and this document, you know, to make sure that they met the qualifications. This is my prior background. Sure, you can use that. So does the same regulation apply as in accounting? like? Uh... Uh, board of directors are responsible for the accounting records. Uh, the person putting together the documents, uh, the final um, touch and all that as an accountant or CPA is not responsible uh, for the truth and, and um, uh, the background. Like we don't go all the way to like, do you really have this? Do you really have that? We are not responsible for that, correct? Well, again, you're going to rely to some extent on what they provide you, but you're going to be able to look, you should be able to look at what's being provided and make sure that it doesn't look like it was something that was created out of thin air, um, you know, that there's some substance to it. Uh, 
but uh, yeah, and you don't have to have, uh, I mean, the, the, the initial rule kind of came out and indicated that you needed to have uh, something signed by a CPA, an attorney, or a registered investment advisor, somebody with a license that could vouch for that person. But, uh, you know, there has been some uh, subsequent uh, communications from the SEC where they've relaxed that standard a little bit and saying, hey, if you have, you know, again, other reasonable assurance that that person is an accredited investor, then you can rely on that. For instance, if you know your next door neighbor is the president of some giant corporation, you can probably rely on the fact that they're accredited. You might not have to go through that process, but just because you've known somebody for a very long time and they you know drive a fancy car, it doesn't mean that they're accredited. They would have to go through that process. Yeah, don't do, I? I you know what? I, I don't don't do it is what I would recommend. I mean, absolutely, you could legally do it, but look, it costs like these days, 60, 70, $80 to do. And that shifts your liability off of your books onto that third party. So mm -hmm. to, to Kim's point, it's like, well, did you act reasonably? Well, I, I don't know. Like, did, you know, did you take reasonable steps or not? And if you didn't, you may blow your whole exemption and you might be out, you know, millions of dollars, which for $50 or $75, you can, so in your, in your, in your, um, a uh, business plan on your financials, just have a column in there that says, look, third-party verifications, $1,000 or $1,500. That, that's an ounce of prevention. I don't know why I would, you, I would not mess around with doing it myself, even though you legally could. You, you, there's just such an easy shift of liability. I just think it's, it's, just, it's just worth hiring somebody. Like to, to verify investors is probably the most popular, but you can use anybody who does that. You don't have to legally, to Kim's point, but I, I don't know why you wouldn't. And that's yeah. and that's a cost that could be paid by the fund itself, right? 100%. You're not, yeah, that's, or yeah. by the investor. Yeah, or by, or by the, the investor. investor. Yeah. Right. At the end yeah. of the day, it's it's about good record keeping, right? All of these rules, like when you onboard this investor, it's not like you're going to take their tax returns and go give it to the SEC and say, "Hey, I did this deal, and here are my accredited investors." Right? It's about keeping good records um, on file for all of these things, such that if you were ever asked about them, you could validate, you could verify, and you could prove that you did do all of these things and that these, in, in, these investors are in fact verified as accredited. Right. right. Thank you. Andrea, last question. Uh, we'll go to Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This is, um, a little tiny bit off of topic, but, um, kind of on topic. If you're doing a capital raise and, um, you get brought into the GP team for an amount that you brought in. And I think that that's not really the way it's supposed to go from what I've been watching on Mauricio's channel. And I was wondering if things got bad and somebody got in trouble with the SEC, would the individual who got brought in be in trouble as well as the group or the group that brought them in would only be in trouble. No, both. Every, you're a GP, you're a general partner. And that's the thing about being GPs is that everybody is, you know, jointly and severally liable, so to speak, for, for everybody else's wrongdoing. So it's, it's if one of your, so it's the same thing as if you had three co-sponsors and one of them decided to go off and start advertising the deal in violation of your 506B uh, deal, it's all of you are in trouble. It's it's the it's a syndication company. It's the managers. It's the GPs. It's 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 everyone. Yep. Yeah, and that's that's the broker dealer issue that we're talking about, right? I know Mauricio has talked about this extensively. I, I've seen you talk about this a lot, and I, I can't agree with you more, man. I mean, that's one thing that the SEC is likely going to be tracking down um, a lot in, in in the coming years, and we want to be very careful about you know acting as unregistered broker dealers which again that's what that transaction is you're describing right where you know you got you were given gp interests in exchange for the fact that you brought capital to this deal well in other words you were compensated for raising capital and you're not a registered broker dealer right and so we want to be very careful about that as well i, I know mauricio has a ton to say about that and i'm sure kim does too and it's the same yeah. it, it yeah. can be a problem so what is the way to avoid that you have to have the, the rule is you have to have a job in management other than raising money, and that's what you get compensated for. Yeah. So if you just make it a rule that everybody in management has to raise money, but we don't get compensated for that. So there's no formula where we plug in how much money each of us raised, then you're going to be on pretty solid ground. And then you have, you know, there's like 20 different jobs you can assign to each other within the syndication management team. Uh, so just start allocating those jobs out amongst and, your team and, and make sure that people do it. And don't forget, <laughs> this is like the part that cracks me up. Don't forget 
that the emails that go back and forth between you and your co-sponsors or the spreadsheets you guys put together where you have a little cell that says this is 5% for the cap. None of that is privileged information, right? Unless you, at some point, at some point you're going to hire an attorney. It might be. So if the SEC has an issue and starts subpoenaing all the, the you, they're going to have the emails, they're going to have the communications. And so if you've been negotiating, Hey, if you can bring in a hundred grand, we'll give you 5% of the deal or whatever. And that's somewhere in the records. You're just going to be in a world of hurt. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. And so it's important that you have a CC. That's why I always tell people, it's like, look, you have to have an SEC attorney. I see some, there's a specific uh, syndication company where you could host the records and, and they, they generate their records for you automatically without having an, an SEC attorney. And to me, I think that's a terrible idea. It's like, you don't, it's not worth it. You know, it's not worth the, the cost and the cost is paid by the fund. Anyway, you might as well do everything correctly. Have somebody like Adnan, have someone like Kim or Mauricio that could tell you, Hey, you're doing this incorrectly. You got to do this instead of if you're all you're getting is the documents, you know, you're not doing yourself uh, any good. Sleep better at night. Talk right. to us first. And, that, and this is going to be one of my pet peeves. And I know it's going to be one of, uh, of uh, Kim and Adnan's pet peeves. What we do. Yes. We, draft documents, but that's not what, what, that's not what we do. That's part of what we do. I, I always say it's like 20% of what we do. What we really do is we, we make sure that you raise capital in full compliance with federal and state securities laws. Right. Yeah. And so all these little things, are you a broker dealer? Are you an RA? Are you doing that? Are you investment companies act? What about this? What about that? We've got that in the back of our heads, a little bag of tricks, and we may not always use them because it doesn't come up, but to have a company just bang out a bunch of docs, they're not doing a complete thorough job for you. And, and if things start going south, that's just not a good way to do it. Well, and I would uh, like to add one more thing to what we do that's really critically important. And, I, and it applies to all of us is we give you deal structuring advice. So you stop leaving money on the table. Uh, because I don't know, I'm sure you guys have calls every week. I know I do about people who are just, you know, they're, they're leaving all kinds of money on the table that they could be uh, making more money for themselves. They could be making more money for their investors. They could be creating a more sustainable business. And, uh, you know, that, that too can be a disservice to your clients and to your investors. If you're giving them all the money and you're not making any money, well, then you're going to have to go out and do something else in order to, to survive, which means you're no longer paying attention to their investment. And that's not their best interest either so you've got to be making enough money to survive in this business uh but you don't want to be greedy and uh, we can help make sure that you guys are you know, creating uh, offerings that are fair and reasonable to you and your investors i love it i love it now uh we did i would love to keep asking questions there's so many in the chat but we're running out of time uh, if somebody wanted to reach out to you kim what's the best way to do so uh, our website, uh, syndicationattorneys.com, if you, uh, any page has a schedule a consultation button, there's opportunities to schedule a call with me or with one of my staff, um, you know, that, and there's a ton of information. We've got a huge library there with a bunch of articles, all of our previously recorded podcasts, you know, subscribe to our podcast, raise private money legally, download my book. You can get a free digital copy of it at syndicationattorneys.com, free book tab. You know, all of those things are uh, ways that you can start educating yourself and uh, get access to us. I love it. What about you, Adnan? Uh, yeah, same. I mean, drop us an email. Um, I'm very good about responding to emails within 24 hours. Um, except for this weekend, I'm probably going to go pass out for the next 16 hours. So um, yeah, drop us an email. We're more than happy to, to, to help any way we can. I love it. Awesome, man. And then uh, Mauricio? I just put him in the chat. So um, if you want to get a hold of me, it's just, just go to askmauricio.com. That'll get you to sort of the, the email format. Uh, MauriciaRaul.com forward slash live gets you on our live weekly Zoom that we do uh, for syndicators, the real estate syndicator live show. And then if you want to see all the library, I've got about 150 videos on my YouTube channel. It's MauriciaRaul.com forward slash YouTube. And all of my uh, lives are also archived there as well. I love it, man. I appreciate all of you guys. Hey, if, you, if you've got any value from this, blow up the chat with fires. I want to see fire emojis all over because these guys, I mean, they came on a Saturday. They're not getting paid to do this. They're just adding value, answering all these questions. And, and I super appreciate every single one of you guys. Thank you so much for being here. No, Thanks for having us, Abbas. Fantastic. Appreciate it. Good to see you, Kim. Nice meeting you, Adam. Yeah, nice meeting yeah, you, you Thanks, everybody. Nice Bye. Bye, Vinky. Bye. Thank you, boys. Thank you, Ed. All right. Let me bring up Vinky. I'm here already. Perfect. Okay. So you can pin, uh, since you're recording, can you pin Rob at your end? 
Sure. So one of the things I've learned, by the way, while we're hosting this live uh, two-day summit, by the way, are you guys enjoying this? Has this been helpful to you guys? We've worked for like four months to set this up and bring in all the speakers and the scheduling and advertise all this. So I'd love to know if this is adding any value. Let us know in the chat. Um, you know, that would be awesome. But we're learning a lot on how to host uh, events while we do this. So I just learned how to spotlight people where you can actually get it so that everybody's on the same screen, not, not with a pin. Uh, so let me spotlight Rob. Yeah, please do that. Perfect. There. Rob, this is the first time I've ever seen you not wear a suit. What's going on here? <laughs> I'm having a rough weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, welcome, Rob. Good to see you. Yes, good to see you. Thank you very much for having me. It's amazing that you guys have such a big crowd on a Saturday. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, really, really insightful sessions. Many of them. Um, we learned a lot of things today. Even buying multifamily from conception to completion, and then the sec attorneys and the fund structures and the uh, fund of fund. A lot of things that we learned today. And now, and Rob is here, we're going to be talking about the family offices. Family offices are becoming increasingly popular and significant source of capital for entrepreneurs these days. And I love to build relationship with them as well. However, building relationship is a little bit challenging. That's what I feel all the time. And Rob has already nailed it. He has figured out the unique strategy or uh, his own charm to make these connections with them. So I would say whether it's a startup, um, whether you're a startup founder or a fund manager or an advisor, you know, anyway, whatever business you're in, it's always effective to build these relationships. And, you know, this helps you unlock a new avenue of capital and the growth possibilities. So our speaker today, Rob Beardsley, again, welcome. I uh, will share the basics of family offices, their investment criteria, and the best practices for building relationship with them. Rob oversees acquisitions and capital markets for Lone Star Capital and has acquired over $350 million of assets. And uh, welcome again, Rob. Floor is all yours. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be speaking about this topic because, as you mentioned, it is something that I am uh, very passionate about and spend a lot of time focusing on, uh, which is raising capital, not just from family offices, but from larger sources of capital, more sophisticated. Uh, sources of capital, which include family offices, but also include private equity firms, opportunity funds, and uh, I know with individuals. So it, people call themselves all sorts of different things, but at the end of the day, we're talking about people who are writing checks five to fifty million. And uh, as Vinky mentioned, it's a it's a hard game. There's a lot of uh, a lot of pros, but there's also a lot of cons, and it's not a get rich overnight thing because. These relationships, like all relationships, require trust. And uh, in particular, it, it, when you're talking about someone investing $10 million with you at once, that is a big trust curve that uh, you need to go through because it's you know obviously very different than someone investing $50,000 for you with you if, if that's not a significant sum for them. So, so I think uh, that all sounds pretty exciting. And I mentioned that we're going to talk about how to actually build these relationships and, and what are they looking for. Uh, but before we do that, I also want to fully go through the pros and the cons of uh, partnering with larger, you know, I, I would call it institutional capital. It's technically not institutional capital, at least the groups that we work with, you know, technically institutional capital would be sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, you know, we're not there yet. Those are very big groups writing very big checks and working with people who are much more sophisticated and experienced than us. So what we target is the, the middle market, private equity or institutional capital, which these days is about, like I said, five to even five to 25 million. And what's really interesting about that is the middle market private equity space has been, uh, is now being competed against uh, with syndication, right? We just had a panel uh, about raising money legally Right. That's a relatively new thing, the 2012 Jobs Act. And it's only within the last 10 years that people are now raising private money on the scale that they're doing. You know, people didn't used to buy 50, $100 million deals with retail capital raising $50,000 at a time. Right. Technology and uh, the Jobs Act have allowed this to be possible. So, with that being said, 
with the middle market private equity space, call it like a uh, private equity firm that writes a $10 million check to be an LP in your deal, they're now being competed with by, by syndications because you can just go and if you can raise $10 million of retail capital. And so you have to look at your options as a sponsor and say, okay, well, is it, you know, is it in line with my, my values, my business strategy to partner with a private equity firm and get a $10 million check? Or would I rather have a hundred investors each give me a hundred thousand dollars for that $10 million check? Right. So before you get excited about the prospects of partnering with institutional capital and thinking, oh, you know what, investing is such a headache. Why don't I just partner with one big firm and just get $20 million, right? Before you just jump to that conclusion, you should really understand that you have options and that uh, you, you want to be actually building towards what your goal is rather than just trying to chase money in every direction. Because what you'll realize is if it's not in alignment with who you are and with what your company is trying to be, it could just be a headache that isn't worth, uh, isn't worth the effort. So, you know, what does that all mean? Uh, specifically on the <clears throat> private equity side of things, what are the pros? The pros are a big check, right? Majority equity investor usually invest in 90 to 95% of the equity in the deal. That's a big pro. That's fantastic. Um, that's kind of your one big pro. And now what are all the cons, right? So the cons are uh, some people find this to be a bigger deal than others, but control, right? Some people don't like giving up control, but that's something that we'll be discussing more. But control, number one. Number two are going to be fees and, and promote structure. So basically everywhere you look, you're making less money when you're talking about partnering with a family office or a private equity firm. Acquisition fees are less, asset management fees are less. Um, the, the promote structure is more favorable to the investor. And it makes sense, right? They're getting a bulk discount, essentially, because they're investing a lot of money with you and hopefully at least saving you time that you don't have to pass the hat around and raise from hundreds of investors. You just go to them and get one check, right? So you might be able to do deals quick, more quickly, more efficiently, uh, but less profitably, unfortunately, in most circumstances. And that, again, goes back to the concept of competition between your sources of capital, right? Are you better off doing a syndication? For the $10 million that you're looking for or to partner with institutional capital. So you need to evaluate in your business model uh, what makes the most sense for you. Um, some, some other cons are you are uh, talking about dealing with very sophisticated people uh, on, the, on the institutional capital and, and family office side. So it requires more, I'd say, technical effort, right? It's maybe less phone calls because you're talking to less people, but the analysis is more in depth. The conversations are more in depth. The questions are more rigorous. The due diligence on you as the sponsor, the due diligence on your deal is more rigorous. There's more hoops to jump through. So that might be another question to ask yourself. You know, Am I interested in partnering with people that are gonna ask a million questions and do a ton of due diligence? Or would I rather have more conversations with people who are more surface level? And speaking of which, the, the pickiness is a factor as well. What's, what's really interesting is family offices, not all, uh, but certainly all private equity firms that invest professionally in, as LPs into the deals that you know, we all here do, they have a ton of deal flow. They, get, they have lots of sponsors that send them deals all the time. And so they have the luxury of sitting back and being picky. So that's another con I would say is you're going to you know, show them a lot of deals and you're going to hear a lot of no's. Uh, but there's more to it than that. And so I'll, I'll talk about that as well, because even though they are very picky and they have a lot of deals, so they have the luxury to only do the best deals, right? which makes it harder to partner with them, at the end of the day, they're human too. And they want, want to partner with people that they know, like, and trust. So even though they're very sophisticated, they're very numbers driven, they're not just going to do a bad deal for no reason just because they like you. But with that being said, there is a, a big bias towards relationships. And so once they like you and do one deal with you, then they want to do more and they want to confirm their bias and they want to also get their money's worth and their time and energy's worth with you. Because one big concern for family offices and private equity firms is they never want to do one deal and that's it. They want to find partners that they 
can build a relationship with, establish trust, and then rinse and repeat and get a lot of deals done together. So that's something as you, as we kind of talk later about attracting potential uh, institutional investors, you want to be pitching them and selling yourself as a repeat partner that you can do lots of deals together. So that is, that's just one, you know, I kind of jumped ahead, but that's one little tidbit strategy to, to focus on. You, you want to show them that you have consistency in your business, that you're not going to run off and do some other venture or that your pipeline is going to dry up. It's important to be able to show them that you have a very active pipeline and that you're doing many deals. And that doesn't mean that every single deal you're doing is right for them, but it is comforting for them to know that you are active in doing deals. Because again, it's, it's, there's, no, uh, there's no benefit to them if, if they do a ton of due diligence on you as a sponsor, get comfortable with you, and you bring them one deal a year, right? That's not what they're looking for. Um, I feel like, okay, so I'll also jump back and mention one more pro. Obviously the pro is get a lot of money, the other pro, if it works out great, is you have a very sophisticated partner with you on your deal. And they're also, uh, it, put it simply, very rich, right? If it's a $500 million fund, there's, there's a lot of fund money there. If it's a $200 million family office, they have a lot of money. So why is that good? Uh, well, all else being equal, it's better to have rich investors than not rich investors. And that because of capital calls, uh, which is a, a big no-no word that none of us want to have to deal with. Um, but I, I do believe that capital calls are going to be happening across our industry of multifamily, at least um, over the next 12 months or so. So those that can make capital calls um, are going to be better off than those that can't. Uh, either way, your reputation is going to be tarnished, but it is better to make the capital call and live to fight another day and, and, and keep your deals alive. Similarly to that, given that they have a lot of experience, they have a lot of capital, they are not afraid to make a capital call. You know, some of the conversations, difficult conversations that I've been having with investors over the recent months, given all the interest rate volatility, um, you know, for example, we, we paused distributions uh, a few quarters ago now. And with our smaller investors, those conversations were a bit more challenging. Hey, I'm upset. I invested fifty thousand dollars, and I, you're not paying me any distributions anymore. The sponsor down the street's paying me distributions. What's going on? Whereas with family offices and institutional capital, the conversation is, okay, yeah, totally get it. This is this is the the world. You know, not every deal worked out. Not not every not every deal has perfect timing, and this is uh, a market problem, not a you problem. Uh, and we'll get through it together. And then at the end of those phone calls, they go, so where's the next deal? Right. So that's really comforting. So it, if that is a big pro, if you are wanting to be in this business long-term and you want to deal with sophisticated people that are a partner with you, um, that can be a very comforting and beneficial thing to have uh, in your, in your tool belt. Okay. So I think that's enough about pros and cons. Also um, whenever I do these things, I usually don't prepare at all. And I'm very open to questions in the chat. So if you want to just uh, pepper, and also that helps me know that you guys are paying attention and not falling asleep. So if you want to ask questions, please do so in the chat and I can kind of tailor my conversation um, with you better uh, based on the questions that are coming in. I love it, man. I'm, I'm taking notes myself. I super appreciate this. If you're learning from this, put a, put a fire in the chat. Let them know how much we're, we're learning out of this presentation, it's it's awesome. There's very few in the multifamily industry that raise money from family offices successfully. And the ones that do don't like to share what they do specifically. And so you're always open to sharing. And so we appreciate that. We're getting a bunch of fire emojis. People are loving you. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, uh, well, speaking of which, right, it is more of like an old school business, right? This uh, raising capital <clears throat> through the syndications are... It, you know, it's a, it's a newer business and the marketing is, is now being pretty well established, right? People, like we post every day on LinkedIn, we make YouTube videos, uh, we, we, we publish books. So the content creation formula is pretty well defined in the, in the syndication space, right? 
uh, there's there's kind of a set playbook for for doing that, becoming a thought leader, starting a podcast, things like that. Those are all super fun things, and I and I think they're incredibly valuable. What's interesting is I think there's this myth that those same strategies don't work with family offices and sophisticated people, right? Oh well, you know your your cute little LinkedIn video works for someone investing fifty thousand dollars, but that wouldn't work on a billionaire, right? That's I I, I think. I think people think that, and I think people are wrong. Uh, so the reality that I've seen is that the, the same type of marketing strategies that hopefully all of us on this call are doing or working towards putting into place for our businesses, they also work very well for the more sophisticated institutional capital. The content uh, may need to be a little bit different, may need to be more tailored to your target audience, right? And that goes towards niching, right? Because Whatever you're doing, even if you're not actively niching, your content is attracting somebody, right? Your marketing and your voice, everything, it, it's all, it's, it is attracting somebody and you, just, you may just not know it. So you want to, if you are, if we're going to go down the marketing rabbit hole, you do want to evaluate what, uh, you know, what your content looks like and who is it resonating with? And then most importantly, who do you want it to resonate with? Who's your target audience? What's your dream investor? If I close my eyes and I think, you know, who who do I want to uh, you know have this message sink in with right that I need to be able to see very clearly and and feel that so that's jumping over to marketing a little bit but that's a myth that I think is is a good one to bust and you and you don't have to I mean yes I do wear a suit every day and go to the office and do all that kind of stuff uh, but you can absolutely raise institutional capital online and through creating marketing content like articles and social media posts and videos and things like that. And it's a fabulous way to get uh, a relationship established. Um, so that's, uh, you know, if there's more questions that come in about that topic, we can kind of cover that and stuff. And that's actually something that I myself am trying to work on as well and get more uh, just direct with the, the type of content that we're creating to really resonate with institutional investors. So let me just take a quick scan through um, the comments. Yeah, there's made. there's a lot of questions. Do you want me to read them for you? Or Vinky, do you want to read them? Yeah, please, I'll read it. Thank you so much. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, I have um, actually, you know, I got dropped off for a second. Uh, I dropped my internet. There's the last question I can see is, tell us your first deal. How did you start? And how many times did you fail to get your first deal funded? And how did you break into the class of investor? I mean, basically, they wanted to know how did you start building the relationship with the family offices? When sure. and how? Sounds good. Um, okay, so well, we we were very fortunate to, uh, you know, just to give a little bit of background on myself more. Uh, we, my business partner, we started our business, Lone Star Capital, uh, five years ago, and uh, the first deal we did was a. $15 million deal in Houston is a 261 unit multifamily property. And at that time, obviously it was our first deal. So we had no idea what to do as far as raising capital. We had, we had the myth that, that uh, if, if we found a good deal, the money would come. Right. And so we kind of thought, Oh, the, the money, the capital raising thing, uh, we'll worry about that later. Uh, that stuff's boring. So put the deal under contract, start going out and raising money. And it just went horribly. It was so difficult. I mean, it, it's just insane. It was the hardest thing that we had ever ever done. And we had to uh, bring in a lot of people to help us. We had to cut our fees up and give away pieces of the deal. I mean, it, it was it was still a home run to, to get our first deal closed, but it just was uh, was was not pretty. And then the second deal, uh, this is what I was starting to talk about, is we, we got very lucky because we actually got a private equity firm to invest with us on our second deal, which is pretty rare. Uh, that is very lucky. So usually it takes a little more experience and a little more track record to attract a uh, institutional firm to invest, but not all of them. And, and relationship goes a long way. So that's why some people that I talk to, they say, yeah, I'm going to stick with uh, syndication until I get more track record. And then I'm going to start talking to institutional capital. But the reality is the time to start talking to institutional capital is today and building those relationships because those relationships take a lot of time and it's fine. If you're not ready for them yet, they'll be honest with you. Yeah. We're not ready for you yet, but we'll track you. And you say, Hey, that's fine. I'll just keep sharing you deals and I'll keep updating the progress. And eventually 
uh, you know, the relationship will work. You know, right? there's, there's, there's no neediness on your end, right? You know that you're going to be in business for a long time. You know that they're going to want to do deals with you eventually. And uh, that confidence goes a long way. So um, I, I might have not missed the second part of that question. So the second part of the question was, how did you break into this class of investor? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I mean, I kind of mentioned it. This this uh, private equity firm invested with us on our second deal, and they, uh, I, I just bumped into uh, one of their uh, one of their guys at a conference. Conferences to this day are still a great way to meet uh, institutional capital. So that that was uh, that was kind of how we got into it, and it was really through desperation because like I said, we had no idea what we were doing as far as raising capital. So we were talking to everybody, anybody that we could talk to uh, is, is what we did. So building a ton of relationships kind of clued us into this world of, oh, okay, there's these different firms out there and uh, this is their, their investment program, their investment parameters. And it gave us the, the knowledge that this world existed and then the desire to, to partner with with them. And then once we had the desire, we would go out, make more relationships happen through conferences, through online research, uh, through equity brokers. And then from there, you start growing and growing the relationships. And I've also heard that um, all these family offices or the institutional investors, they are always looking for good operators too, or even the new operators too. They do not want it to work with all these experience, like, you know, like well savvy operators who are in the game for like 40 years, 30 years, and they might want it to work with some newbies too, like us who are like in the game for last three to five years. Is that true statement though? Uh, or it was just like, again, a mess that I got from somebody. I would say it's true. Right? It's their job to to get deal flow, so they can't uh, they can't resist talking to new sponsors because you know they, just like us on our side, we're you know we're interested in finding new deals. They're also interested in finding new deals and new partners. So uh, they are never afraid to take a, an intro call and build a build a new relationship. With that being said, though. Uh, Vinky, it is difficult to break in, very difficult to break in uh, with an existing group, especially if they have some partner that they're already doing business with that's doing the same deals as you. That's really difficult. So for example, we are a Texas multifamily value add sponsor, right? If a private equity firm already has their Texas multifamily value add sponsor, we would have to have the deal of a lifetime for them to want to switch. Because at the end of the day, if it's just an average deal, then they'll just do a different average deal with their sponsor that they've already done a million deals with, right? Rather than take the risk of a new partner and getting to know each other and, and all those things. So the, the, I mean, not that you can necessarily control this, but one of the best things you could do if you can find it is a, a fund or a family office that is active in something similar to what you're doing, but they don't quite have deal flow in, in your thing. So maybe for me, it would be a family office that has a ton of investments in Atlanta and Charlotte, and they wanna get into Texas, but they don't have a Texas sponsor, right? That would be the, the home run for me to, to find. And so, and we actually have a family office uh, that is our largest investor. And they, before us, didn't have any Texas investments. And now they've invested a lot with us and they, they told me that they would not be open to investing in any Texas multifamily outside of us. So we, we got their spot, right? And that's, that's exactly where you want to be uh, when you're building these relationships. And this is not true for all of them. I mean, certainly there's other groups that will do deals with multiple sponsors in the same markets, no problem. Uh, but that's something that I've encountered. Uh, and the other thing I heard was like, you gotta be a little bit more resourceful. Uh, and then how you position yourself with these institutional investors, because if you are more resourceful and you're getting them more than just a deal flow, you know, you're adding more value to them and you might be standing out in the crowd, you're positioning yourself in a different way, like kind of go to person for them. So I yeah. have seen that people doing that and building relationship that way. And they're growing at exponential level, you know, after that. So if you can yeah. touch that as well, you know, what being resourceful means, you know for this institutional investors? Yeah, it's a very good point. So, so for us, just in our experience, 
what we see that our institutional investors reach out to for is, is data information, right? They know that we have good informational flow, whether it be coming from our portfolio or coming through our pipeline of, of potential deals. So just as an example, we have, uh, what we do is we, we track all the deals we underwrite and we put them all in a spreadsheet. And then every quarter we host our uh, deal flow webinar. And this is available to the public. We record it very transparent with our deal flow. We say, okay, this is how many deals we looked at this quarter. Here's the average pricing. Here's what the average returns look like. And, you know, we kind of, we do a little webinar and that data is extremely valuable because you don't, you can't just go online or go on CoStar and find that sort of data. It is limited because we're only in Dallas and Houston as far as our deal flow, but uh, we have absolutely had institutional investors reach out and ask us questions and, and want a copy of it because they, they want to know the information, right? They might be looking at a deal with maybe another sponsor, not us, and it's uh, in, in, a, in a location that we have expertise in. And they'll say, well, hey, do you think this number makes sense? Is, is this okay for insurance? Is this a good cap rate to be paying for this deal? Et cetera, et cetera. So those are, uh, those are the ways that you can add value uh, above and beyond just providing deal flow. Right, and there's another question I'm gonna to go to is in the chat uh, from Rob. What problems do you solve in the content you share for institutional investors? Yeah, this is a good question. And I, I wish I had a better answer because I do think that our content is good, but it, uh, it can be a lot better. Because when I think about the problems of institutional investors, I think about trust, I think about risk, meaning, especially like a family office, they don't need to necessarily find a deal that's a 30% IRR, right? They need their deals not to lose money and they need their deals not to be a headache. They're too busy, they're too important. They have too much money already to create a headache for themselves by having a bad deal or having a bad partner. So uh, those are just some things that come to my mind when I think about my dream avatar and what their problems are. Other problems I had already mentioned was deal flow, right? They don't want to do one deal and then not do another deal with you. They want to have a consistent pipeline of deals uh, where they can rinse and repeat with you. So those are just some, some things that uh, pop up in my head as far as content. So the earlier you were talking about uh, having the control on the deal, because when you're dealing with the institutional investors, they might want you to have more control on the deal. So from the sponsors or the operator's perspective, what would it look like? Because some people, they don't want it to give up the control. So yes. did you find that difficult when you got started in that? You think, oh no, maybe I can do multiple deals. Maybe that's the route I wanted to take because there's a growth is exponential, you know, if you look at that way too. Yeah, so yeah. So our belief, and I'll actually want to address two things. So first I'll, I'll say our belief is that it's not a zero sum game that, for example, if we have to do a deal, not have to, but if we choose to do a deal with an institutional partner and they take control, first of all, I'll, I'll talk about control in a second. I really don't mind control at all because nine times out of 10, they're more sophisticated than me, have more experience than me. So I wouldn't, I want them to have control and drive the bus. It's their money as well. I mean, I want to make sure that they're happy. Even if I don't agree with the decision, they're, they're my client and I have to keep them happy. So control, I think is not a problem. Uh, but to address the zero sum concept or the non-zero sum concept, right? My belief is that if we choose to do a deal with an institutional investor and, and it, we fill it up, right? We get $10 million, this deal is done. And we may be make lo lower fees because we chose to go that route. Well, I don't view us as losing out on potential earnings there. I just view us, okay, we got that deal done. Now let's go do another one. And if we choose to, we can syndicate that as well, right? Because I do believe that at the end of the day, all of us on this phone call are um, capital constrained, not deal constrained. We might say we're deal constrained and yes, finding deals is really, really hard. But at the end of the day, if you had more capital, you could do more deals. And it's not, it's not pretty to say this, but the, the truth is the more money you have, the worse deals you can do. I know we all think that we do the best deals in the world and that all of us are only buying the best deals, but that's just not the truth, right? On average, we're buying average deals. So the question is, if you have investors that love you, they'd be willing to do average deals with you. Now that is beautiful. So 
that's the reality. We're all capital constrained on this call um, because if we, if, if any one of us on this phone call had, I don't know why I keep calling this a phone call. So <laughs> if any one of us had a deal of the century on our hands, all of us can raise the money, right? That's not difficult. Uh, the the, the skill set, the real value is being able to have an average deal and have it oversubscribed, all right? And that goes to your pedigree, your track record, your communication, all the things you do outside from providing return. Um, so I'm not saying go out there and do bad deals, but I'm just saying that we're capital constrained. So when I look at what we have in our network of investors, I think, okay, well, let's say we think we can raise you know, $10 million from our syndication investors and then $10 million from institutional capital, right? I'll find it, find a deal and I'll subscribe it one way or another and then do the next one and the next one. So that's, that's our take on uh, kind of the downside or, or the potential of losing out on, um, on potential higher fees, right? Like if it's a 1% acquisition fee with institutional capital and 2% on syndication, right? That can kind of hurt but we think about the bigger picture. Exactly. So I'm going to go back to the chat. There's another question. It says, what are the questions you can ask to start conversation with family offices? Yeah, and there's a similar question, uh, I believe from Ashley talking about playing golf, right? right? And, and there's a lot of money on, on the golf course, right? And that's, that's very true. Um, so how you kind of open up and start these conversations? Um, well, it depends. <laughs> so if... If, it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody who is essentially a professional investor, they are an LP for a living, and that mean and that could mean a, a private equity firm. That's a, a half a billion dollar private equity firm, and they write ten to twenty million dollar checks. Right? They have a program set up to invest with people like us. So with them, you could be very direct. Right? You don't have to beat around the bush. It's they've got money. They're looking for deals. You've got deals. You're looking for money. It's it's a very uh, it's like Tinder for capital, right? It's very straightforward. So in those cases, the best way to get the conversation started is you just uh, you you introduce yourself, of course, but keep it very brief because they're busy, and you just say, "Hey, this is who we are. We have a, a new deal." that I think fits your criteria because I researched your criteria. You, you know, I, I have a deal that fits your criteria. Uh, when do you have time to talk, right? That is enough to pique their interest and get the conversation started because they're in the business of sourcing deals and they want to talk deals. So if, if that's who they are, then that's my favorite approach. And I've had very good success this way. If they are not necessarily programmatically established to take in deal flow and to invest as a, as a programmatic LP, then it's more difficult, right? If you are just at a country, at your country club and you're maybe playing golf with someone who has a lot of capital, to just say, hey, when do you have time to talk about this deal? That's just too forward, right? And um, that, that whole realm goes a little bit outside of my expertise. I don't like that kind of stuff. So I don't focus on, I don't focus my efforts there. I like people who are, are warm and already aware of, of our business. So for me, I truly just don't really have that much experience of bringing it up to people just because I don't really want to sell someone on something that, you know, they may not already be. I like to sell people who are already sold on something, right? Multifam is the best. We're investing in it already. And then I just want to convince them that we're the best option in multifamily. I don't want to convince them that multifamily is the best option, right? So there's, there's that difference. Right. And then uh, somebody's asking, what is equity brokers? Is your, okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah and okay. then uh, I'm going to, uh, one thing I wanted to remind everybody, if you guys have any question, please put in the chat. And this is your time to ask Rob because it's very hard to get. <laughs> and thanks to Rob for coming on Saturday and spending time with us. We appreciate that. My pleasure. My pleasure. I'm glad everyone is uh, putting a bunch of stuff in the chat. So, okay. So equity brokers are, people who um, have a network of institutional investors that they work with and they can introduce you to them and they broker the deal. And then the deal pays out, uh, the equity worker gets paid at closing. So if the deal consummates, they'll make money. If no deal happens, they don't make money. So equity brokers uh, work for free. 
basically until uh, they work on a success fee basis, right? Um, in my experience, we have we have never closed a deal. We closed one deal with an equity broker. Uh, I, although I mentioned them, and they are a very legitimate way to get a lot of equity relationships established quickly, because they'll just literally just start connecting you and having intro calls, and you'll start talking to a lot of groups. Uh, for me, I. I don't like it and, and I struggle with it. And I don't think uh, the investors on the other end like it either because you're basically stuck trying to build a relationship with someone through another person, right? On every email, they need to be CC'd. On every phone call, they want to be on it, right? They don't want to get cut out. So it's very difficult to build that true, you know, one-on-one -on -one relationship if it's always through a go-between. And like I said, from the very beginning, this is so relationship driven uh, that putting that hamstring yourself via the equity broker, just in my experience, makes it really tough. Um, so that's what they are. And, and that's my honest feedback about them. I really love that. Uh, that's just a relationship based because I always say to everybody who's saw what I mean, that I'm in the relationship building business. I'm not in the transactional business because if you have the strong relationships, money follows. Never chase money. Build strong relationships. Money will follow no matter what. So there is a good question from BD. Actually, I really like the question. He says, "How do you validate that you're talking to the like legit family office?" Because a lot of people I have seen they put family office behind their name, you know. So not necessarily that's like a legit family office. Totally. Yeah, this is a fantastic question, right? We're talking about how can we validate ourselves to family offices, but what about them validating us, right? Or, or us validating them rather. So how, how do you do that? I would want to ask simple questions and understand. It's, it's a bit sensitive though with family offices because you're asking about their personal private, their private money. And that's what's interesting about the family office business is it's uh, it's just more a lot more private, right? If it's a, fu a fund, you know, if I'm talking to a fund, I have no problem asking them, oh, cool. What's the size of your new fund? They say, oh, well, we're raising a $300 million fund, right? No problem. But if I go to a family office and say, well, what's your investable net worth? You know, like, mm, I, don't know if, I don't know if I want to uh, ask that of, some, of someone, right? Um, so uh, actually, I'm trying to remember this. I don't, this is, a little, um, this is a little much, but it's a joke from one of our family office partners. And uh, he's very funny. Um, and, it, and it's Saturday night, so I think I can tell the joke, but it's a little brash. So he said, he, we were working on a deal and the lender needed to see his balance sheet, right? His personal financial statement. And he said, said, said Rob, listen, my, my, my balance sheet is kind of like a really nice pair of boobs. They, it looks really big, looks really nice, but you don't really know how big it is until you really feel it. So I don't know what he meant by that, but that was pretty funny. And that kind of speaks to the intimacy, if you will, of someone's personal balance sheet, right? So sorry to go on such a tangent there, but validating family office is different, difficult because they are very private. Um, but I want to know what deals they've done and how much money have they invested in those deals? That's okay, right? I can say, oh, cool. Well, how much did you invest in that deal? And they say, oh, I invested $10 million in that deal. And then I go, okay, well, that's helpful to know because I know that they're actually legitimately writing uh, joint venture equity size checks. Whereas if they tell me, oh, well, we did one deal in multifamily and we invested a million dollars, right? That is not, uh, you know, that, that would not be good for, for me to find out. Um, so understanding their track record is, is really the best way to validate a family office. Obviously, we're not going to get into the idea that they could be lying. That's outside the scope of this, but you know, I'm not, we don't, we don't do a ton of validating. Like we're not looking up LLCs and making sure that everything is checking out like that. It's uh, it's more so kind of reputational based and track record based. And I think it's uh, conversational too, because when you're talking to them, you can figure out, you know, how deep they are. I mean, you gave the analogy. I'm not going to repeat that because <laughs> I, I, 
has spoken to before. And when we were talking about how many deals you have invested or what's your appetite, the answer was, oh, we were like only $1 million I manage or $2 million, something like that. So it's like, okay, this is not a really family office, family office, you know. So I'm just uh, kind of, you know, barking at the wrong tree. So I shouldn't even talk to them, kind of that kind of feeling I got. So BD raised a really good question there. Um, and let's and like you, and like you said, everyone can just say they're a family office, right? Exactly. They can just say, well, I'm investing my family's money and it's a family office. But yeah, so I was just going to answer. Um, technically, what is the definition of a family office? Um, so it, it is very broad, but a true family office is basically a team that is set up to manage a family's affairs. And, you know, most of the effort is focused on the investment side of things. So uh, a family office would have a uh, chief investment officer, maybe a CEO, a bigger family can have a deal team. I mean, you're talking about lots of employees. So the reality is a true, true family office is like 100 million net worth plus. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, if you are if you're a high net worth individual and you have 100 million in investable net worth, like money that can be managed, not just you know paper net worth, then you can afford at least a million dollar payroll, right? You could pay a CEO, CIO, you can afford a million dollar payroll because that's 1% of your investable net worth. And it can definitely be worth paying 1% of your investable assets to have a deal team to, do, to go and do better deals, to to vet, to have compliance, to, to do all that kind of stuff. And to, of course, manage your, your jet and your yacht and all that kind of stuff. So one question came to my mind, when you're dealing with this family office, it's not necessarily you are talking to the owner owner, and then maybe there is some investment, uh, investment officer or something with a uh, similar designation that you're gonna be dealing with. Is that true statement? That's how it works. And then you can make your way up from there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it. it it uh, doesn't matter to. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're speaking to the, the the entry level analyst, right? Because if you can get your deal into their queue and, and actually looked at and then worked your way up, yeah, it's it's a it's, it can be a very good in. Um, so yeah, like a more formalized, legitimate family office. Well, you're not just gonna get the patriarch on the phone, right? This super rich guy. Um, it's nice if you can, but that is not always realistic. Oh, great. So there's another question. Once you're past the initial intro with potential investor, what does the process look like? What sort of things do they want it to see? Pitch decks, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think we can actually get a lot of value from this discussion. So you, you want to be very well prepared when it comes to this next phase. This is a very critical phase because they're getting to know you and they want to know if you're a good partner. They want to know if you're professional and if you're organized. So what they'll want to know is, hey, you seem interesting and your deal seems interesting. Um, our investment committee wants to know more about you now. Can you please provide us more information about your track record and your company and how you're set up, right? Do you work out of your bedroom? Do you, you know, how big is your team? All that kind of stuff. So, and if it takes you, oh, if it takes you a week to put that information together, <laughs> number one, that means you're not having many of these conversations. They don't want to be doing, they don't want, you know, they don't want to be doing deals with someone who is just getting started, right? I mean, they will, but you don't want to look, they don't want to do deals with someone who seems apparent that this, they're, they're just getting started. So point being, you want to be as organized as possible and you want to have all this stuff already put together. So. What I'm going to share with everyone right now is what we've taken years to put together and into just this very nice, simple link. Uh, it's just a Dropbox folder. So it's, and then we bought, um, so our company is Lone Star Capital and we bought the website lscdd.com, right? Lone Star Capital Due Diligence.com, lscdd.com. And that just goes to the Dropbox link. And then we keep that Dropbox up to date with our company presentation our track record, case studies, testimonials, references. Um, so when anyone gets to that next phase, they say, hey, we'd like to learn more about you. Boom, we drop this in. And this communicates a lot of things. It, it communicates, what, okay, they're organized. Okay, this is not their first time, right? Someone's asked them for this information and they have, uh, they've, 
they've put it together, right? Uh, so, and then the information itself will communicate the things that we want to communicate to them also. Obviously, at the end of the day, we all want to communicate the same thing, right? We want to communicate that we are, uh, that we perform well, that we're organized, responsible, uh, that we have a good team, that we have a good strategy, you know, all those things. I mean, you know, we, we, we can all work towards putting together case studies and our, and a track record takes a long time to build, right? So I don't have the luxury to wave around some magical 20 year track record, right? If I did, then I probably wouldn't have to put in so much effort on marketing collateral and getting testimonials and references and case studies, right? But because we're a new company and we're light on our track record, we need to bolster with all these other things. So if you do take a look at our uh, company data room that I linked to, um, you'll see that's that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to, at the end of the day, we're trying to tell a story that, hey, we're not that experienced, but look at all this, right? And try to make it look uh, as good as possible. So that's what everyone here, uh, if there is one thing, I, mean, I would say, I, I normally don't want to, I don't normally like to be prescriptive, but if there's one thing that you would do from this uh, conversation, I would probably have to say, this is it. Having this is going to serve you so well. It's going to save you so much time and give you a leg up on so many other people. I mean, we get compliments on this all the time. Uh, so this is, this is a, a big one. Great. So before I ask the next question, if you guys value what uh, Rob is sharing or if you're enjoying the session, please show him some love. Put some fire emojis in the chat. So the next question is how and where to get the list of family offices? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is really funny, right? Uh, because if someone gave you a list of family offices, which they're out there, you can go and buy them. It would pretty much do you zero good, right? Because it, the, it's, a, it's, it's a relationship thing, right? So now if we're talking private equity firms, that has value because like I, like I said, they're set up programmatically to invest with you. So reaching out, um, reaching out to them cold and saying, hey, you know, kind of the script I just mentioned, hey, this is who we are. I have a new deal that fits your criteria. When do you have time to talk? You can do cold outreach like that and you'll actually get pretty good response rate. But for, to family offices, they're too private. Uh, that's just, that's not going to work for them. So where can you get a list of uh, family offices? Well, you can get it at familyoffices.com. Right. Richard Wilson's family office club is a great place to be. So there's there's your simple answer. But the longer answer is, hey, you actually need to find a way to build a relationship with them. And as as much as I have a love hate relationship with conferences, conferences can absolutely be a legitimate uh, way to meet uh, family offices and institutional capital. Um, so. So those are good. And uh, also one thing that I really like is keeping up to date with online articles and social media, because you will, it, once you start kind of knowing where to look, you'll start seeing family offices and institutional capital being mentioned in articles or in social media posts, right? If they, if they close, uh, if a sponsor like myself closes a deal and I partnered with uh, an institutional capital, an institutional firm like like East Ham, for example, that's based out of Florida. I would tag them in my LinkedIn post and I'd say, "Yeah, super excited to close this deal. Really grateful for our partnership with East Ham." And then you can look at my post and you go, "Oh, well, who's East Ham?" And then you can Google, figure it out, and then reach out to them. Right. So that's exactly what I've done. Is I look at people's LinkedIn posts, I look at articles announcing closings and stuff like that, and I say, "Okay, well, who did they partner with?" And that's even better about that is if you are keeping up to date with deals that are being closed that are similar to your strategy, then you know they invest in, in your type of deals, right? So then you can re really credibly reach out and say, hey, I just saw that you closed XYZ deal. That's exactly like the deal I'm working on right now. Here it is. Let's, you know, when do you want to chat? That is, that's a home run right there. Wow, I love that. Thanks for that. So if anybody has any questions, I'm going to open it up for you. Please take yourself off mute, raise your hand, and you can ask directly to Rob. I think there was another question. Somebody put it out there, how to contact family offices. But I think we addressed that earlier. It's all relationship game. So it's not like finding a list and start calling them. 
is uh, even you have the less, still you need to build a relationship with them. Maybe in a golf course, maybe at a conference, somewhere just, you know, they know your name, who you are, and you can start the conversation with anybody in the family office and work your way up. And don't get and discouraged way, also. So, sorry, go ahead. Also, I was just going to say real quick, I have bought these lists. I've paid um, like one, one, 10,000, another 6,000 bucks. I've, I've flushed down $16,000 and it, it was zero use. It's completely useless. So, you know, just learn from my experience. I've already made that mistake. Okay. So Jacob, you want to unmute you? So let me unmute you. Go ahead yes, and of ask. Course. Well, Rob, first off, thank you. It's invaluable information. I appreciate it. I'm learning a lot from this. Um, I wanted to ask you, briefly earlier, you described um, in your underwriting analysis on a, a macro scale, you build a database and then you do a call. I just wanted to inquire, is that uh, recording at all on your website or is there a YouTube video or something of uh, a link? Yeah, yeah, on our YouTube channel, uh, we, we keep all those on there. So if you do a YouTube search for Lone Star Capital deal flow analysis, you might beat me to finding it right now, but I'll do that as well. Lone Star Capital deal flow, and it comes right up, so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it. That's good. Rob, you're next. Let me unmute you. There you go. Ah, hi. Um, hi, Rob. So um, really nice to meet you. I've, I've, I've read your underwriting book, or I'm like partway through it now, and I'm building my own model out on your advice. So so really appreciate that. Um, and I'm hopefully going to be co-GP on the, the deal that you're actually looking at at the minute. I've been chatting to Dasher about that, so super excited with that. Um, awesome. And I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, um, on the sovereign wealth fund thing, and you mentioned that you're not at that point yet. Like what, what are the barriers to sort of stop you from moving up towards that? That's a hard one, I imagine. Because uh, if you do, you probably get rid of them, right? I was going to say 10 to 20 years uh, of mm -hmm. track record. I'd probably say, I'd probably say the fastest you could do it is 10 years. But yeah, I'd say about 10 to 15 year track record. You'd have, you have to have like, because you have to have multiple cycle experience and cycles are five to 10 years. So you need to have multiple cycle experience. I don't know, 20 exits at least. And, uh, and really be set up like just crazy, crazy, the compliance that you have to have for that. I've, uh, I don't know if I could still find it, but you, you'd probably find it interesting. The, so, uh, with, with very sophisticated groups like this, you'll have to fill out a DDQ, a due diligence questionnaire. And these mm -hmm. DDQs are nuts. It could be like hundred pages and they're asking you questions like, you know, like if you died, how would the company replace you and move on? And what is this? What, like, do you have a succession plan put in place? And, you know, there's so many things that we don't have set up uh, where they would just never in a million years invest. In that. Right, right, right. Gotcha. And then in, in terms of like working with other people and like partnering with them that maybe have that track record, obviously there'd be some things that you'd still have to set up. Is that a strategy that you've looked at and then chosen not to go with, or is that something you haven't considered or what's the story? Yeah, it is something that we've considered. It's something that we had more seriously considered in the past. Uh, now for what we're focused on and with the relationships we have, it's less of a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, less of a focus so yeah i think when you're when you're starting out it's one of the best ways to to do to do anything right partnering leveraging other people's experience is is, is a great way to go gotcha thanks for your time great i don't do we have any more questions i don't see any more questions and i think we are a little bit over time as well thank you rob i really appreciate you taking the time and coming to our conference on weekend. It's super My nice. My pleasure, to yes. Look, and look, love that session. Yeah. Look, look, contact information, Bob, Rob, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry? I said your contact information. Oh, yeah. Please share your contact information with everybody so people can reach out to you. Absolutely. Rob, about you. Yeah, you can put it in the chat. Thanks yeah, again, so Rob. Really appreciate that. While Rob is doing that, uh, we're going to start with our next speaker. And before that, I think Abbas has a small message for everybody. Abbas, you want to come on and share your message? Once yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Thanks.
Rob, that was awesome. Uh, I super appreciate you being on. By the way, Rob, if somebody wanted to reach out to you or get added to your investor database in the future, how do they do that? Let me, let me bring you back. Yeah, so on our, on our website, lscre.com, there's a investor form that you can fill out and that will uh, come, come to us and our team will reach out to you right away. And then you also, uh, you know, we'll get on our email list as well. And, um, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn as well. I, I uh, you know, we can direct, you know, you can message me directly on LinkedIn. That's awesome. And you're posting, I think, daily, right? Almost on LinkedIn? Daily, Just, daily on LinkedIn, yeah. I don't know how you have the time to craft these long <laughs> messages. <laughs> it's always great. Yeah, my, my marketing team are uh, ninjas. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great right. thing. Very cool, Rob. Appreciate you coming on. Guys, show some love to Rob. Put hearts in the chat. Put fires in the chat. He's done a great job. He came in on a Saturday. It's it's like at his time right now, it's 7 p.m. because he lives in New York, I believe. Um, so so it's, it's a big time difference. So we appreciate you being on this late. No problem. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Good to see you. Very see cool. You. Talk soon. All right, guys. So I want to go over a couple of quick things. Um, so we're not done with the with the day yet. There's one more speaker, and then we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have a networking session before we end the day because I want to make sure you guys have the opportunity to connect with other people, build your investor database, find other people you could uh, partner up on deals with. So we're not done with that. That's gonna come at the very end. But before we do that, we're gonna have another speaker. Um, so that's coming up. And then I also want to say tomorrow, uh, we're going to have Dan Hanford. How many of you know Dan Hanford? If you know Dan Hanford, could you let me know in the chat if you know Dan Hanford, if, if you've heard of him at all? Let me know down, down in the chat. Cool. So we've got a, a couple of people that know Dan. For those of you that don't know Dan, this guy is a freaking legend. I mean, he's raised just in 2022, he's raised close to $300 million of retail equity. Um, not family offices, just retail equity, people like you and me. He started, um, I believe it was like five years ago, and he's been able to uh, to explode the business over the over the, just the past few years. So he's going to be on tomorrow in the morning. You, you want to make sure you hop on tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, so that way you don't miss out his talk. He's going to be one of the first speakers. Let me just mute Mike real quick. I'm sorry. Yeah, this together. Um proud of course analyst but um you know this was hold on there we go cool that fixed it my bad all right so so dan hanford is going to be speaking tomorrow we're also going to have a panel on how to build a podcast and uh, build a big audience and then we're going to have one more panel vinky which one was it the second panel is on our blockchain uh how blockchain. blockchain can be used for the real estate that's going to be super insightful panel you don't want to miss that yep. and podcast panel is really good too because uh we have uh, three panelists and very successful in the real estate industry. They're going to come out and talk about it, how to build a strong podcast to attract the right investors for yourself. Yep, 100%. So that's all going to happen tomorrow. So you want to make sure you don't miss tomorrow. Today you've had half of the, the, the fun, but there's still a lot more tomorrow. So don't miss out on tomorrow. But having said that, uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I want to talk about the mastermind and, and how that's being set up. For those of you that missed it, we just kind of talked about it during our lunch break. Uh, but the way we've got it set up is that we teach you everything that you need to know to go from doing no deals, right? No experience to do in your first deal. And so that's everything, you know, that you need to know, whether it's finding deals, underwriting, building broker relationships, um, raising capital, building an audience, you know, the CRM, the whole thing, everything that you need to go from zero to do in your first deal. And what's interesting is that, like I was saying to the people that were on, on the networking session earlier, is that. You know, it's not just the education. The education is super important. I mean, I'm putting, there's like 25, 30 hours worth of content that's on there. We're also going to have weekly calls that we host. And I'm there basically answering questions and walking people through what they were doing that they should change in order to, you know, find find the right path going forward. But it's not just the education. The other part of it is the, is the camaraderie and having people that are in there that are doing the same things that you're doing. Because for a lot of us, I remember when I first got into real estate, I was 18 years old. My my family is, is, you know, they're immigrants. And so the immigrant mentality, I think, Vinky, you're from India, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yep, I'm from Iraq. And so the immigrant mentality is this. You go to college, 
right? You you get yourself a job and you just kind of do that until you until you t- retire one day and die. And that's basically rinse and repeat, right? You have kids in between somewhere, you get married somewhere in there, right? All that stuff. You buy a house. Um, and I remember when I first got into business for myself, I just, I wasn't happy with that. I didn't want to go do that and work for someone else for the rest of my life and, and, and have these financial constraints all the time. And so uh, I remember when I exited that path, everybody that I knew was against it. My, my parents were against it. My brothers, my siblings, my sister, everybody that was in my family was pushing back. My friends were pushing back on it. And at the time I didn't have a community, but I stuck to it. And I almost gave up many, many times because I would see all these other people that were doing, you know, the traditional route, they were advancing and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing, I guess. And now they have jobs and everything, which is great for them, but that's not the thing I wanted. But the problem is when you're, when you're all out alone and you're getting a lot of pushback, a lot of times you end up giving up too soon because you start to reason with what other people are telling you to do. Like you think about Zach, Zach has now uh, 200 employees. He's, I mean, he's built one of the largest real estate syndication companies in just five years. He's over a billion and a half dollars in assets. And it took him 14 months. It took him 14 months to get his first transaction and the problem is, you know, for a lot of us, if, if we don't have other people with us that are pushing us along and going through the same hardships, going through the same problems, you just end up kind of giving up because it gets too hard and, and you don't want to keep doing it by yourself. So the biggest thing with the mastermind is not just the education. The education is going to be phenomenal. But the other part of it is the camaraderie, meeting people every week, finding partners that you could do deals with, and then just kind of walking through you know, with everybody else through the same path. So you could, you could get these deals done. So um, I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. I'm going to put the link in the chat for those that are interested in being a part of the mastermind. Again, we're having our next weekly call this Wednesday coming up. Um, So I'm going to put that in the chat, but if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat as well. And we'll answer any questions live, or you could raise your hand and we can answer questions just by talking to you one-on-one. So let me put that in the chat first. So if you have any questions, post them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll be happy to answer those. By the way, if you're enjoying this, this, this has been a lot of work in the background. I mean, me and Vink have been meeting for, you know, like months now, just every day, just strategizing on who we're going to bring in, who's going to add the most value, how are we going to set up the event um, and add as much value to you guys as possible. So if you're enjoying that, let me know down in the chat as well. I would love to, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Thanks, Abbas. Of so- course. Yeah, I think Abbas said it very well. I mean, it's a joint effort. We spend hours and hours <laughs> on the on the weekdays. You know, we were saying on the like four hours, five hours call just to figure out who we wanted to invite and who's gonna be beneficial for our community because we wanted to give back, add value to everybody because you all mean a lot to us and we wanted to build very very strong relationship with you all going forward. Like I said earlier, it's a relationship game. It's not a transaction at all. Uh, we are not looking for anything from you, but we like to add value to your lives in whatever way we can. Let us know, reach out. We're going to be always phone call away or a text away from you guys or email away from you guys. Just reach out whenever you need something from us. And uh, now our next speaker is Badri. I'm super excited to introduce Badri. Welcome, Badri. Badri Malinur, and he's going to be talking about how to set up customizable real estate funds. And Abbas, if you please do the honor and just put us on the spotlight, me and... There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Badri and his company, Avestor Inc. Avestor Inc. is uh, revolutionizing the investment industry with its customizable funds. With Avestor's unique approach, you can create a personalized portfolio that aligns with your financial objectives Avestor's team of experts provide customized investment strategies that balance your financial goals so you can invest with confidence. Badri Malinur is co-founder and VP of Avestor Inc., a technology platform focused on providing sponsor with an end-to-end solution to build customizable private funds. Badri firmly believes that Avestor platform has the potential to revolutionize the syndication industry. Today, he will enlighten us on the power of Avestor platform and how it can be impactful for the future syndications. Welcome, Badri. Hey, Vinky. It's always a pleasure to be in your group. Uh, what an impressive audience. You, you have done such an incredible job, you and Abbas. Uh, congratulations. Thank you and, so much. Uh, really excited to be here. I'm assuming everybody can hear me and see me. I hope I have the capability to uh, share my screen. I do. Fabulous. 
So let me go ahead and uh, get started here. And uh, so basically, uh, what I want to talk about is customizable funds eventually, of course, but I want to put it in the context of uh, how, do, how do customizable funds and how do funds in general kind of uh, compare with all the other tools which are out there for capital raising? I'm assuming all of you want to capital raise in some way or the other. I mean, if you're here just to buy your own house, well, you're in the wrong place. I mean, you can you can go do that on your own. Uh, I'm assuming you want to get into some kind of syndications and some kind of capital raising. And I, I want to kind of uh, look at all the different tools which are out there and then talk about customizable funds and what potentially can, Avastar can do for you, yeah? So, uh, so very briefly, before I get into too much detail, uh, just some background about myself. Um, I'm a duck, I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I've uh, had a couple of uh, successful exits as startups. I was an exec in a Fortune 500 company, ran a team of several hundred people across multiple continents, kind of retired from corporate life about 15, 20 years back. I ran a hedge fund, which involves uh, index uh, trading options. And I love traveling. Uh, just some pictures of my family. My goal is to visit every country in the world. I'm up to about 70, 73 countries, quite a, quite a number to go. Uh, a little fun fact about myself, love skiing and hiking as well. Anyway, so what I want to talk to you about is, now we could get into this big debate about, uh, hey, uh, do we are we getting into a recession? I mean, is it a soft landing, no landing, <laughs> medium landing? I mean, you, there are all these buzzwords going around in the industry. Let's at least agree that there is uh, some slowdown in the economy. I don't think anybody will disagree with that. Now, the, what I would like to talk to you about is um, what type of investor behavior is there in a recession, especially if many of you are going to start out on your syndication career or uh, uh, there, you know, you may be early on in your career, right? What are some of the different capital raising options? You can do a syndication, you can do an SPV, you can do a fund, you can do a fund of funds. And then we'll talk about how customizable funds combine the best of many of these features. And then I'll, um, time permitting, we'll do a short demo of the Avistor platform and tell you how Avistor can help you on your capital raising uh, journey, you know? So, so fundamentally what happens during your times of recession, you know? So investors tend to seek safer investments. Uh, you know, they're not sure about their job. They want a relatively higher, lower level of risk in their investments. They want to increase their passive income. I mean, especially with the layoffs increasing, they want another source of income. And they seek out trusted advisors as opposed to somebody selling them one deal at a time. I, I'll come back to this point. It's a very important point you want to, um, uh, you want to keep in mind if, when you want to build your investor database. Uh, there are tons of people saying, hey, I have this syndication deal. Here is another deal. Do you want to invest in it? But they really want people who can build more of a portfolio relationship with them. And I'll, we'll talk about that. They're scared to make single large investments. They want to diversify their investments across multiple um, asset classes, multiple geographies. And they want multiple liquidity points in their portfolio um, because they're not sure. I mean, Yes, uh, they are. They think the deal is good, but uh, you know, sometime maybe two or three years from now, you may want uh, some amount of liquidity, and they become a lot more sensitive to the total amount of expenses, uh, uh, the syndication expenses, attorney expenses, accounting expenses, and all that. Yeah. So uh, keep that in mind, and then I'll talk about how these four possibilities help you uh, uh, deal with investors in uh, scenarios like this. Badri, can I interrupt for a second? Can you go sure. in the presentation mode, please? So people can see better. Uh, okay. Go I slide show. Like to yeah, go to slide uh, show. Change between slides. So, uh, but that's okay. Let me do this. Uh, how about I make this very small because sometimes I skip past slides and presentation mode makes it harder. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So this is pretty small, so it's almost as big as it gets. Uh, sometimes I skip past slides, yeah? So, okay, no problem. Uh, so, you know, I was an engineer by trade many decades back. Um, I like to reduce everything to simple two by two matrices, right? I mean, uh, uh, engineers, MBAs, everybody likes simplistic mat matrix matrices where you can kind of look at it uh, holistically. The x-axis is the number of deals and the y-axis is the ownership. 
whether you own the real estate or you're kind of raising money for others, right? So, or you're just investing in real estate. So if you're doing one single syndication deal and you're owning the real estate, uh, uh, you're typically doing syndications, right? You, where uh, the syndication has the ownership of the real estate. If you're doing multiple, uh, I mean, different people use this terminology differently, but I wanted to normalize the terminology. If you're doing, you own multiple pieces of real estate within a single entity, then you're creating a fund. Tip, uh, not everybody does this. If you're raising capital for others, the preferred way is to create something called a special purpose vehicle, which protects your investors uh, as opposed to just sending all your investors to the person who's raising capital, which a lot of people do. And that's called an SPV, where it's one single deal um, and you're investing in uh, for somebody else in an, uh, an another piece of real estate, but you don't actually own the real estate. And then the fund of funds, it's customizable fund is just one type of fund of funds is kind of the super set of all of that. You can uh, do multiple deals. You can own real estate. You can invest in real estate. So uh, you with me so far? So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of each structure? The advantages of a syndication is it's a well-known model. It's been run many times. You have full control over the asset. The risk is limited to the asset. You can co-GP on for each syndication deal as needed. It's fast to execute. And uh, the advantage of a special purpose vehicle is similar kind of advantages, right? It's lower cost to set up. The risk is again limited to the asset and <clears throat> relatively easy to execute. Fund multiple assets. You still have retain control over the assets. Uh, but the fund of funds gives you the maximum investment flexibility because investors are able to diversify the risk and you can have both passive and active investments, yeah? What are some of the disadvantages? In syndications, you're always under pressure. You have very little raise time. I mean, you don't have a lot of time to raise money and it's separate for each deal. And really it is not a mechanism. It's great to get started, but you cannot scale using a syndication model. Can you imagine doing five or six syndications and then doing five or six LLCs? five or six, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of a blue sky filing, I can talk about it. Uh, knowing Vinky, I'm sure uh, many of you do understand the concept. Uh, I'm sure she would have provided some education on that space. Uh, and uh, SPV also has similar uh, um, disadvantages, right? You really cannot scale. I mean, imagine creating a separate SPV and incurring uh, all the costs associated with it. And in terms of funds, there is less transparency because investors don't have control. I'm talking about a blind fund. And fund of funds, a blind fund of funds has a similar concept too. Uh, investors are investing in a pool of assets. They don't have control over what they're investing in. That's like you going to a, a, a ETF or a Fidelity Magellan Mutual Fund or whatever saying, hey, you know, I like this 180 stocks, but I don't want to invest in this 20 stocks. Can you help me uh, create that fund? Obviously they can't, but as a customizable fund can do that. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little later. Yeah, so... So why are funds better than some of the other entities during recession? It goes back to the points which I raised earlier. Remember, how do investors behave in, behave in recession times, right? First, you are not under a rigid deal timeline where you have to raise money within two or three weeks, but it just creates so much pressure on yourself. And you're giving investors the options to spread risk across multiple assets, multiple geographies, and fund managers can become more of a trusted advisor. A fund of funds, and particularly a customizable fund of funds, completely transforms the relationship you have with your investors. You're building a custom portfolio for them. You're asking them, hey, do you have a kid going to college in four years? Uh, I mean, do you have more cash flow needs? Do you want more capital gains? Are you in a high tax bracket? You're building a portfolio for them instead of selling them one deal at a time. And funds are far, far more cost-effective than syndication deals. And the, one of the advantages of a fund is if a deal falls through, the capital is still available to deploy in another deal. And as I indicated, you can do a, a custom portfolio where you can build a combination of uh, passive income and long-term capital gains here, yeah? So customizable funds provide the ultimate flexibility and they combine the best features of funds and syndications, okay? 
we believe this will completely change the landscape of uh, uh, the fund and the syndication industry a few years from now. It's it's on a fast upward track, uh, but it, I know it will take some time to change investor and uh, syndication behavior. In it, like a traditional fund, you have one PPM. I, I think all of you are familiar with the concept of a private placement memorandum. Each time you do a, a Reg D syndication offering, you will have to create this PPM, which outlines all the risks. And typically it costs 10, 15, $20,000 per PPM. Here you're doing one PPM. It's one blue sky filing at the fund level instead of doing it for each syndication. You can raise money continuously and earnings can be reinvested. And like syndications, investors can get to pick and choose which deal they want and how much they want to invest. And you get complete depreciation benefits like the syndication on a pro rata basis, right? So uh, uh, unlike so some fund structures where all the depreciation does not flow through, in this, uh, this does retain all the benefits of syndications. And one of the two unique uh, more advantages, apart from combining the best features of funds and syndications, this gives you the ultimate business model flexibility. So what do I mean by that? When you do a traditional fund, you need to have a very well-defined thesis. You, you, you say, okay, it's uh, multifamily apartments, 100 to 300 units in the Sun Belt, or maybe self-storage apartments, uh, self-storage units in, uh, uh, in the Midwest. And you have to stick to that thesis because people are trusting their money blindly to you and saying, okay, you can invest in any deal you want. Whereas in a customizable fund, you can change your business model in the fly. So I know Vinky runs a, a marvelous meetup group. Maybe you uh, come to Vinky's group and uh, you meet uh, a self-storage operator and you want to get into self-storage. You cannot do that in a blind fund because uh, you need to have a very well-defined thesis. Your earlier investors are going to be pretty annoyed with you if you go or deviate from the thesis. Whereas here, uh, they don't mind because you're still picking one deal at a time and they don't care uh, if uh, you go into another deal because they have the option to decide whether they want to go into a deal or not. And this is by far the lowest cost option for four reasons. Uh, we have a calculator. If you want, we can look through it uh, as a uh, time permitting. But th there are four reasons why this is uh, more effective than syndication deals, even if you do two or three syndication deals a year. One, it's one PPM. You save about $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 a year. One blue sky filing. You're doing one blue sky filing at the fund level. That can add up a lot. I mean, New York, for example, it's almost $800 to $1,000 uh, for filing a PPM. And it is less accounting, less taxes, less number of LLCs. Uh, it really builds you a foundation to scale up much faster, yeah? So any questions about this so far? Uh, I'll get into more details about customizable funds and investor in a few minutes uh, in, in the remaining portion of the presentation, but uh, feel free to uh, jump in with any questions or comments, please. So. Or, um, there is a there is a question. Through? Yeah, there is a question in the chat, Badri. It says, okay. "Do you help with PPMs with customizable funds?" Absolutely. Uh, I'll I'll go into the rest of it and how we actually help you with customizable funds. Uh, let me hold off on that for one second. But we help you with all aspects of running, marketing, and launching and scaling your fund. So. Uh, yeah, I will send a copy of this uh, presentation to Vinky, and I'm sure she'll be able to make it available for everyone. Right, Vinky? Yeah, so. definitely. I'll put my email in the chat, please email, and I will share with everybody. Uh, and I, I can put my information in the chat window as well at the very end. Yeah, so. once you're done, please do that. Yeah. Uh, feel free to jump in with any questions. Uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat window. If not, I know Vinky will keep me straight if I miss, miss any questions. So <laughs> I would like this to be uh, fairly interactive. <laughs> So what is Avestor? Avestor is a one-of-a-kind platform that brings together investors, sponsors with a completely new type of uh, fund called a customizable fund, which as I indicated, combines the best features of traditional funds and syndications. So what we do, the way it works, I, I, you know, I use various analogies. Some different analogies resonate with different people. One analogy is think of it like building an empty foundation for your house. 
you can populate it with any type of room. Another analogy is think of it like a stock brokerage account for your investors, where people can log in and choose which deals they want. Anyway, the way it works is you create one fund for all your deals. It, the, that's the beauty of it. You don't have to go back to the attorney ever again. You know, I'm going to share a secret with you, 130 close friends, right? <laughs> I'll tell you what an attorney told us. They said, hey, we are blown away with what you have done, but there is no way I'm going to recommend this to uh, my uh, clients because you'll put me out of business. So basically, when you do a customizable fund, you go to the attorney once and you can add any number of deals within minutes uh, as opposed to the three, four, five, six weeks uh, which it takes to uh, uh, do a syndication deal, right? Do the PPM, do the reg defilings. Uh, I'm, I know I'm throwing various terminology at you, but uh, I don't want to go into the details of creating a syndication deal, but uh, take my word for it. It takes uh, several weeks, uh, uh, at least four to five weeks and uh, 15, $20,000 to or more to get a syndication going. Whereas now you can add deals within minutes, right? And the advantage of that is you don't have to really proceed with the deal. Sometimes you, you might think of, uh, oh, you want to raise capital for others and uh, you throw a deal onto the platform and then you realize that there is not much in, in investor interest. Well, toss the deal. You have lost nothing, literally. You, you can put the deal within minutes and delete the deal within minutes, yeah? And the best part is investors get to choose which deal they want, just like a stock brokerage account. Uh, just like you go into a stock brokerage account, put some money in it and then say, hey, um, do you want to invest uh, $10,000 in this deal, $20,000 in this deal? Uh, you, you have uh, the ability to do that. Hey, Vinky, uh, just I should know this. Uh, uh, we can go for another 15, 20 minutes, right? Yes, is, is that, you, yeah, you, uh, yeah. Have, you have good 25 minutes more. Okay, that sounds good. I, I don't think I'll take that long. I want to have uh, room for discussion, but. Okay, that's fine. So, there is that question and there you might want to address that right now. So it's, uh, wouldn't this make accounting very complicated? It's it does, it does. If you do the accounting on your own, it makes it very complicated. But uh, since we have the power of the platform, we have literally spent millions of dollars uh, uh, and uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and uh, tens of many years of effort developing the accounting technology behind it. So uh, how is this concept different from CrowdStreet? Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, what uh, CrowdStreet is a marketplace. It is not a, a platform for you to create your own fund. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that towards the very end a little bit. If you could hold that uh, question, I think that, that'll, uh, um, uh, so that will uh, help you there. So uh, you with this platform, you can raise capital 365 days a year. You can add any asset class within a single fund. Definitely any real estate asset classes, multifamily, self-storage, retail, hospitality. In fact, we do that. We have our own fund in which we have added all these real estate asset classes. Some people mix other asset classes, uh, startup investing, uh, venture investing, judgment liens. You probably have never heard of judgment liens. We have somebody creating a judgment lien platform fund in our platform. The returns there are ridiculous. I mean, it's just 2x, 3x, 4x type of returns, you know? music streaming rights. I mean, anyway, uh, you get the idea. You literally can add any asset class in a single fund. And what you're doing is you're still not changing investor behavior. For many of you who are starting out, it is a little difficult for you to go sell a blind fund. Can you imagine that? Hey, I'm starting out or maybe I have a couple of deals, but give me your, uh, I can't tell you what deal I'm investing in but give me your money and I'll uh, create a blind fund and you have to invest in every deal which I'm creating. So um, that is not the case here because you're still promoting one deal at a time and you have the flexibility uh, uh, to say, hey, I want to invest in this deal. You know, I like you a lot, uh, Vinky, but I don't really want to invest in deal B, but I'll invest in your next deal, you know? So you have the flexibility to be a GP doing your own deals a co-GP raising money for others, which I think many of you might be in this category, or some of you want to do your own syndication deals. And here is the, here is the beauty. You can simply invest as a limited partner in a deal. So some of the established operators so who have raised uh, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars, they may not even want you to be a co-GP, which is okay. You go just invest as a limited partner. They're more than happy to take your money there, of course. And then you can slice that and in, uh, add it, uh, allocate it to investors 
And um, you're not going to make, I'll be frank with you, you're not going to make as much money as a GP or a co-GP, but you're building out your fund management revenue, which is rock steady. And, and it doesn't matter how the deal does, you're still getting your fund management revenue. So that's one of the, the advantages of this uh, customizable fund. All these three business models are possible, yeah? So, and it's there is a very important distinction I want to make here. People often compare us to other syndication software platforms out there, which frankly is not fair to them and it's not fair to us. We offer a software platform, but that's one small piece of what we offer. Don't think of us as just a software platform. We are your backend business partners to help you market, launch, and scale your fund. We help you with the fund strategy. We help you with legal and regulatory work, all the PPMs for a fee, of course. It's a flat fee. Um, and uh, we help you with the investment management, investor management, compliance, accounting, taxes. In fact, last month, we announced we, we are offering free bookkeeping services for all your fund, uh, for all fund managers. That itself is worth like $300 to $500 per month, free book, bookkeeping. Uh, fund bookkeeping, we handle that for you. Yeah. So, so when you work with Avester, you get access. We help you set up the fund. We help you do the operations. We do all the financials and oversight. We introduce you to our partner network of resources. We have almost 65, 70 funds in the platform. And uh, uh, so it's not that I'm a great negotiator. If you have 60 plus funds, hey, guess what? When you go to an attorney or an accountant, you, you can negotiate good terms. I mean, that's just the Costco model, right? We help you set up the legal entities, the fund entity, the fund management entity. We help you set up the PPM, the do the Reg D filings, Blue Sky filings, onboard your investors, allocate earnings. Now I'm going to rattle off some terms. We have we help you do KYC, know your customer, accreditation checks, which is required for a 506C fund. We can talk a little bit about that. And we even do anti-money laundering checks, which are all integrated as part of the platform. Now, many of you may say, what the heck is anti-money laundering? I don't care. Well, you don't care until you do care. After the Ukraine war, that's become very important. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the time you're okay, but uh, just two or three weeks back, somebody was on a political watch list and the fund manager was so grateful we caught it. There are extra precautions you have to take, right? And then we help you with the reconciliations, tax calculations. And here is the really, really cool part, uh, uh, folks. Even if your investors invest in 10 different deals through you, remember you're building a portfolio for them instead of selling them one deal at a time, they get a single K1. You know, frankly, the only person happy getting 10 K1s at tax time is either a masochist or maybe you're an accountant. Your accountant will be happy getting 100 K1s. Their bill goes up, right? So this completely streamlines the investor experience. They're signing one set of legal docs, one PPM, and they get a single K1 even if they invest 10 different deals with you, yeah? So, so to recap then, uh, what we are is a turnkey solution. We handle everything for you. You don't have to go shop around in different places. It's evergreen. Once you create the fund, it lives forever. Completely customizable, accommodates a wide range of investment products uh, um, and asset classes. It's customizable from an investor perspective and customizable from a sponsor perspective. All the operations are streamlined and uh, um, uh, reconciliations, tax calculations, KYC, AML, everything is integrated. Okay, now I'm going into geek land, bear with me. We are the only platform in the world, period, full stop, which allows you to backfill your GP capital. Okay, what is backfilling a GP capital? Let's say you're uh, raising a million dollars for your own deal or you're committed to a million dollars for somebody else. Maybe you're a hundred K short, you know, stuff happens, right? I mean, sometimes you're just a little bit short. You can put your own money in, just like you're investing in the deal, and you can slice it and allocate it to investors six months later, one year later. Other platforms give you a portion of the cash distributions. We do that, but we also give you a portion of the capital gains. So how does that work? Let's say you are in a five-year deal and your 100,000 was tied up for one year, you get 20% of the capital gains. So it's a way of moving inventory capital from deal to deal and decouple closing a deal from raising all the money from investors. So. Complete game changing, it's a feature. A lot of our fund managers really love it. If uh, you don't want to use it, you don't have to use it, yeah? And an additional thing which we do is when you create a customizable fund on the Avestor platform, 
you get access to our Avestor mastermind. There is a ton of experienced and less experienced fund managers. You can share fund strategies. You can invest in their deals. They can raise money for you. And here is the best part. We actually go to sponsors, and that applies to any of you, by the way. So if you want 60 plus fund managers raising money for you, there is some due diligence we do, and um, uh, then you have to offer some preferred terms. We negotiate highly preferred terms, which you will never get if you go to one individual operator and say, I'll raise money for you. I mean, it is just the power of uh, 60 plus funds raising money for you, right? So, uh, and then you can simply be even load the deal for you, negotiate these terms, and you can just, I'll give you an example of uh, one of the deals we negotiated, and uh, when I give you the demo. So uh, the Avastor Mastermind membership is kind of free. There is no additional charge for that. Yeah. So, so you get an investor portal and a fund management portal. So I will go ahead and uh, just give you a quick demo of the portal so you'll see how it works. Uh, and uh, in terms of a couple of questions, I will still come back to the crowd street question in a second. One of the questions which came to me on privately is what is the minimum amount for investing? That is completely up to you. What we are is a fund management platform. We help you create your fund. You decide how much you want to, uh, what the, you can set a fund level minimum and a deal level minimum, yeah? So let me go ahead and uh, give you a quick demo. Keep the questions coming in, please. So this is, uh, you get your own branded portal. Certainly hope uh, you find it, uh, you make it uh, mo something more interesting than a demo fund, but this is what it is, a demo fund. The best analogy, uh, folks, is to think of this like a stock brokerage account for your investors. I I'm going to keep beating that to death, but, but that's really the best analogy, yeah? You log in, when you log in, you will uh, basically, excuse me, let me actually log in you will kind of see the total account balance. It'll be all branded in your name. Uh, you'll see that the total number of deals you have in the fund. This is the investor experience, the return on the deals, number of deals which have exited. Here, here is the really cool part. This is a custom portfolio you're building for each investor. It might be your syndication deals, or it might be uh, deals which we have found for you, or it might be uh, uh, deals, uh, your own deals, or you're raising capital for others. And you can also offer debt in this fund, in the same fund. And the advantage of offering debt, it could be a debt for your own syndication deals, or we'll give you platforms where you can buy first mortgage liens offering between eight to 14%. Yes, interest rates have gone up, but they've not gone up to 12%, you know? And then what this allows you to do is build custom portfolios for your investors. So you can build a 60, 40, 70, 30 portfolio. Can you imagine the power of that? Now you're becoming an advisor to the investors as, and you're uh, building. So where do you think they'll go to when they come to their, go to their next deal instead of selling them one deal at a time? And you're replicating uh, like what a investment advisor would do for a stock bond portfolio. And then <clears throat> this is, I don't know what you want to call it, call it a vanity map, if you will, shows you how uh, the investor deals are distributed across the country. You can click on anything to get more information. And uh, uh, then this is a liquidity graph, which tells you approximately when you'll get your money back. Not guaranteed, of course, in real estate. You guys should know this by now, but it's a projection. So it'll at least help with planning purposes. And then if they want to know more details, again, I'll go back to my stock brokerage account analogy, right? This is the overall fund value. I mean, their slice of the fund, of course, not the total fund. Uh, the total value, how much they've invested. And now I want to draw your attention to a very powerful concept here. Sounds very simple, but it's a very powerful concept. We have something called the virtual cash balance. Again, we are the only fund which allows you to do that. This is like the cash balance in your stock brokerage account. So when distributions come in from a syndication deal, they go into the cash balance. When a deal exits, the money goes into the cash balance. Today, what do you do when a deal exits? You have to give the money back. 
Well, I hope you do. Otherwise, you have more serious trouble. Uh, but here, it goes into the cash balance. Augustor uh, allows ACH integration. They can uh, link to their bank account, but it doesn't automatically go into their bank account. So they have to ask for your permission to withdraw the money. And that's your chance to intercept them and say, hey, Joe, you have $20,000 sitting in your account. Do you want to withdraw the money? Very, very powerful concept, yeah? So um, uh, I can tell you from experience from running our own fund, less than 3% of the money gets withdrawn. So people keep reinvesting. It, it's just a very easy thing to click, okay, let me go into this other new deal in one click as opposed to wiring the money and asking them to wire the money back. And uh, just like a stock brokerage account, they'll be able to see how each individual deal is doing. They can uh, click on anything to get additional information. Uh, this is not that dissimilar to the other portals out there. Um, and uh, so uh, you can see different pictures. Um, the, the, you can see the PPMs, uh, you can uh, in project updates, or in, uh, and if you want to provide any custom project updates. And when they want to invest in a deal, it's very simple. They go to the current opportunities page, and then they will see all the deals currently available in your fund. These are all like test deals. Let me show you actual real deal. These are not all the deals in the platform. It's just deals which uh, um, you are uh, uh, exposing to your investors, right? And we'll make it very easy to expose a deal to your investors. So here is one deal I want to talk about. I'm kind of promoting the, them too, but they've, they've built a really cool platform. It's a, pl a company called Techvester. Um, some of you may know Sam Silverman and Seif, a company based out of the Bay Area. They're building short-term, they've built a nice tech platform for building short-term rental portfolios, large-scale short-term rental portfolios. The average investor in their fund gets a 8% pref and a 50-50 split. We have come in as the investor platform and we have negotiated a 9% pref and hold your chairs, a 90-10 split. Can you imagine the power of that? So even if you give a 70-30 split to your investors, you're getting 20% almost risk-free. So that's just an example of the type of deal we negotiate. Once you create a customizable fund, you don't have to worry about doing your own deals. Uh, I mean, you can, obviously you can, but you, we also will give you a steady stream of deals for you to expose to your investors. Again, think of it, 90-10 split. So even if you give a 70-30 split to your investors, you're making quite a bit as a fund of funds manager, yeah? So, so with that, uh, let me take questions. Um, so one of the questions is, what do you charge? Uh, I don't want to get into too much details in the pricing right now, but I can tell you roughly, it costs about $17,500 $17, to get started, which is roughly what you would pay for one syndication deal. And then we charge anywhere from 0.3 to 0.5% of the assets under management. But again, uh, uh, if you want to get on an individual sales call, we can show you even if you are doing two or three deals, you are actually uh, saving money. Uh, uh, basically because of the money you're saving in PPMs, the blue sky filings, <clears throat> accounting, taxes, and uh, less number of LLCs. You save anywhere from 40 to 60% in legal accounting and compliance cost. And you save anywhere from 60 to 80 percent in uh, time savings. Yeah. So, so and there, so I, I kept promising that I'll come back to the Crowd Street question. So I le, uh, so let me show you. Uh, I'm kind of that's this part, this is the part where I kind of skip past uh, some slides. What we are, sometimes people have a little difficulty placing what we do, okay? So I thought I would share this picture. I mean, there are other players out there. These are not the exhaustive list of players by any means. So what we are is a combination of investment software, fund administration, and a marketplace. We are really a combination of all three. A little difficult to understand. We help you with the business strategy. We help you with fund setup. We help you with marketplace. We, we have a marketplace where you can put up your fund. Uh, and we are getting ready for a venture round. When we do a venture round, we are going to funnel a lot of advertising dollars to go into the marketplace. We, of course, help you with the investment management and investor management, all the compliance. We do your blue sky filings for you. Uh, uh, you don't even have to go back to the attorney. We do it for $50 plus the cost of filing. I mean, I don't think any attorney will do it for 50 bucks. And then we help you with all the accounting and taxes. So, yeah. So, if you compare it, 
there is investment software out there like Juniper Square, Appfolio. There are tons of people. We combine the elements of that. Well, this is probably not the best example, Azure. They went out of business, but uh, they used to give you fund administration capabilities. We do that. Uh, and then there is a marketplace like CrowdStreet and Cadre. Now, we are not in the same league as CrowdStreet, of course, in terms of the number of investors, but you do get exposure to investors in our marketplace. So I hope this answers your question of uh, um, uh, this, uh, you know, how does this compare with uh, CrowdStreet, you know? So uh, another question is, uh, can a GP's investors look at other deals when they log into your platform? Absolutely not. That's a quick way of getting out of business for us, right? So when you log into the platform, they'll see only the deals which you expose to your investors. They will not be seeing any other deals. We'll make it very easy to expose a deal uh, once, but uh, you know you can just say, hey, expose this deal to your investors, uh, but uh, they will not be seeing uh, deals which are uh, from other investors, yeah, uh, from other funds. Wow. I think that's a super great presentation, Badri. Uh, it's a very, very informative. And then plus, you know, having the investments of the investor portal, plus the crowd street, plus the marketing, having everything on the one portal is pretty awesome. And then you can, uh, I, I think you did mention that you can, um, I mean, chop your deals even smaller. Like you've invested as an LP, you can go in there, you can cut that deal into like maybe 10,000, 5,000. Exactly, and exactly. In a smaller chunks as well. So that's a possibility too in there. So it's just kind of a newer way of investing, just like you said, it's a comparable to stock market, which is really, really awesome. And then uh, I'm pretty sure people uh, got a lot out of this tool and they might- Tell Papa, I'll go to-, to So would you please uh, share how they can contact you as well? You uh, know, know. Know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me put minutes, my information in the chat window. Uh, and uh, uh, so just to reiterate what uh, uh, Vink Vinky, Vinky said, uh, you can basically uh, have a fund level minimum and you can have a deal level minimum. Mm -hmm. So uh, so maybe you can set a fund level minimum of uh, 50,000 and a deal level minimum of, uh, uh, you know, maybe it is uh, 10,000 or 15,000 and you can change the deal level minimum too, right? So it's not that uh, you have to stick to the same deal level minimum or fund level minimum, yeah? So, so you have that possibility too. I think... Uh... It's pretty awesome. And then you, I think, pretty much address all the questions, right? If you guys like uh, Badri's presentation, I forgot to mention, please show him some love. Put some fire emojis in there uh, in the chat. And then appreciate his time that he's been with us and is trying to share what he has to offer. So Badri, there was one more question, right? That sure. you said you'll talk about later. That was regarding the security license because we are selling the security on this portal, right? Um, maybe through the fund. How would you address that? Uh, it's not so much you're selling. Uh, you are being a fund of funds manager. So you, uh, as a fund of funds manager, it's no different than doing a Reg D fund. or it, It's all under Reg D filing. You do not have to be registered as an investment advisor. And uh, so you, as a fund of funds manager, you do not have to be registered as an investment advisor. So we'll help you with all of that. And you don't have to take our word for it. Uh, we have negotiated the highly discounted rates uh, with the top tier uh, legal companies and uh, you can consult with them and uh, you would establish a direct relationship with the attorney. Uh, we, we have just negotiated the discounted rates. You wouldn't be paying us the attorney fees. The attorney fees would go directly to them with, um, with the discounted rate. So. Oh, thank you. If you have any questions, please, you can take yourself off mute, raise your hand, and then you can ask to us live. And uh, there's another question in there. Somebody wanted to know what Reg D is exactly. And uh, if you can refresh that. And also, do you need a license to run on your portal? No, you don't need a license. Uh, that's what I just I mentioned. Uh, Reg D, every little syndication, every person you have talked to, including, I guess, Rob Birchley and uh, I'm sure Abbas, everybody, all the syndication de your deals here, you'll come across is under an exemption uh, called Reg D, which allows you to raise money without having to be registered. So this is the most common uh, uh, registration. Under Reg D, let me go ahead and go into it into a little more detail. You can either do a 506B syndication or a fund, or a fund of funds, a or a 506C fund of funds. Now, many of you may know the difference between a 506B and a 506C. A 506B, cannot be advertised. 
and uh, it is limited to 35 non-accredited or sophisticated investors, whereas a 506C fund is limited uh, uh, only to accredited investors, but it's a more scalable model and you can advertise. And uh, But there is something many of you may not know. In a fund of funds also, a customizable fund of funds can be a 506B fund of uh, funds or a, a 506C fund of funds. But what many of you may not know is once a fund of funds hits $5 million in assets, you can actually give non-accredited investors exposure to accredited in, uh, deals. Like a, you can actually give 506C deals to non-accredited investors. They, trust me, they'll be very grateful for you to uh, exposing uh, th those kind of deals to non-accredited investors. So that's one of the advantages of the fund of funds. So. Great, thank you. And one last question I think um, Rob wanted to ask you is uh, how do you deal with the international investments? He's a UK based. Yeah, uh, so that's a more complex question. I don't want to give you off the cuff remark. We absolutely can help you with international investors. There are different ways you can do it. Uh, it depends on how many international investors you have. Is that the exception or is that the rule? And do you want them to, uh, are, are, they, are you okay with uh, them applying for an ITIN, which is a tax ID? And so there are accounting issues, legal issues. We, we can help you with all of that. Uh, um, one, uh, the simplest thing would be for them to get a US tax ID. But if they don't, you don't want to do that, uh, there are ways to go, uh, uh, depending on the country, right? Venezuela is a very different uh, situation than UK. <laughs> So um, and uh, it, so it depends on the country, depends on whether they have an ITIN, but we can also help you create a feeder fund in that country. Let's say Vinky wants to go back. There are a ton of uh, emerging middle class in India. So she wants to create a fund in India. We can create a feeder fund for you in India. Now, that's a more expensive process. That's not what I recommend you start with, but we can absolutely help you with international investors is the short answer. And, um, uh, but it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, unfortunately. I can't give you a generic uh, answer. Thank so. you so much, Badri. I don't see any more questions. I really uh -huh. appreciate your time. Please add your um, contact information in the chat so people can reach out to you. And I really appreciate you being here with us on the weekend. And uh -huh. once again, everybody, please give him some love. Show him your love through chat, put the fire emojis or whatever to show him that we appreciate him being here. Thank you so That's much. That's awesome. Appreciate you, Badri. That, that was amazing. Appreciate that. Thanks, um, so Thanks, Minky. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I did put my information in the chat window. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you just want to understand the space. Don't worry about, oh, I have to reach out to Badri only if you are creating a customizable fund. No, absolutely not. Uh, a wide range of people. I even, uh, very few people put their email, direct email and uh, phone number directly. I've done that. So feel free to reach out. If I'm not free right away, I'll call you back. Happy to chat about, uh, and like Vinky said, we are here to add value. Happy to help you with your uh, journey. And uh, you may have a legal question. Now I'm not a legal expert, but at least I'll give you my first opinion and then you can go to a real attorney, right? And, <laughs> so <laughs> th thank you Very again. Cool. For the thank you. Kind of thank us. you so much, Badri. Appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. No, that's awesome. I, uh, I, I think that was great. Um, now, so that was it for today's speaker. I, I, you know, I think this honestly was way better than I expected. All the speakers that came on and the panels just knocked it out of the park. How many of you guys agree that these speakers that we had today were just phenomenal and they added a lot of value to you? Let me know down in the chat if you enjoyed all the speakers we've had. I mean, starting with Ken, going to Zach, I mean, and Rob, and we've got obviously the Mauricio, we had Adnan, we had Kim. I mean, this has been Bedry just now. I mean, this has been just absolutely incredible. So uh, if, you, if you enjoyed this so far, let me know down in the chat. Now, again, this is just day one. We're not done with this. We're only halfway through. And tomorrow, I can promise you, we're going to have speakers that are that are going to just knock you out of uh, out of your mind. I mean, Dan to me is honestly one of the one of the most inspiring, one of the biggest multifamily syndicators out there. And so you definitely don't want to miss his uh, his talk tomorrow. I flew uh, to meet with him back. I think it was last year, and uh, he's one of those people that has had the biggest influence and the biggest. Uh, you know, change in my business was because of, uh, of what he taught me. And so highly recommend you guys hop on tomorrow as well at nine o'clock. But before we hop off for the day, 
Um, we've kind of failed earlier, Vinky, at the at the networking session because this was our we'll first do. one, didn't we? We'll we'll do really good. I think we we'll should. Do, we'll do better on the on the future networking yeah, sessions. Yeah, it's like a party time now because we're done with today and we are looking forward to an exceptional day tomorrow because we have line of good speakers, couple panels yep. as well. So you're gonna learn a lot. Even if you're a beginner or experience, doesn't matter. You're gonna learn a lot. It's gonna be a lot of value tomorrow as well. So don't forget to join us. But yep. I think we should network for a little bit, Abbas, because uh, we a lot of still here. So that way everybody will get to make new connections and they will know, put their name with their faces, you know. Yeah, it's awesome. a relationship business. I mean, I know we're all tired. I can promise you, Vinky and I, we're very tired as well, you know, contacting the speakers, making sure everything is going well. But I think, you know, connecting with other people and establishing new relationships uh, is is very instrumental in this business. So what I want to do is uh, I'm going to open it up for another about 15 more minutes of networking. So we'll do one final breakout room for 15 minutes. And then after those 15 minutes are over, you know, connect with people after those 15 minutes are over, log off, and uh, and then we'll see you all tomorrow. But I, you know, for those that are interested in networking further, which I recommend highly, I mean, when I go to these events, if it's an in-person event, I'm out there until like 12 o'clock at night, one o'clock at night. I want to make sure I get everybody before I get to my room. And so that's that's just very important to me. And so I want to open it up for one more session, Vinky, if that sounds good to you that. as well. Yeah, I think it sounds good. I'm going to open it up right now. I'm going to put four or five people in each room. So go yep. ahead and network and we'll pop in in the rooms, me and Abbas, randomly to say hi one-on-one -on -one to you guys. Let's do it. All right, very cool. We're going to open it up. After you're done with the networking, then feel free to leave and we'll see you all tomorrow. Yes, excited to see you all tomorrow. And I'll introduce myself tomorrow because somebody was asking in the chat that they didn't get to know me. Who am I? So I'll tell you who am I tomorrow. <laughs> we should introduce ourselves at the beginning, but hey, you know what? Mm -hmm. Missed opportunity. It's not. So, we have another opportunity. Tomorrow. We have another day tomorrow. Yep. Very cool. So did you set up the rooms or? Uh, no, no. Yeah. Are you going to set them up? No, I did set it up. I think. Like, I'm not playing with it. Let me see. Hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart it. It's like a little bit lag on it. And I'm going to restart it. So one more time. I'm not sure what's going on with this thing. It's not. Sorry, guys. We're still trying to figure this out clearly. So we're going to restart. The, <laughs> but that I, I do it every week because I have a meetup. And I usually have a lot of people in my meetup, like sometimes 40 people, 50 people. I never have issue with the breakout rooms. But some more I'm not reason, sure. not sure what's going on today, and it's not working some more reason. But yeah, I have experienced that before in other people's meet. I'm like, oh, I'm pro. I'm not, never going to let this happen. Well, to the me. other issue we had today is the whole names. You know, everybody's <laughs> lost their name, and it's like the I profile know. pictures. I mean, I don't know what's going on with Zoom. But hey, you know what? We got to work through it. You know, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't send okay. it. Don't send the ready link like that. Every time we need to be able to sign with our name, that's the only way to get in, then it will not happen. Yeah, it's too late. That's the lesson learned. <laughs> that's true. We wanted to make it easier for everybody to join. We didn't want you to go through all the trouble of signing in again and then just authenticate with your emails, you know. We wanted yeah, to make it I, more simple. Yeah. I host weekly webinars and the biggest issue that people get is like, I can't find the link. I'm like, okay, well, I don't want people to not find the link on this one. So we literally invited everybody through like a Google Calendly link. And that took a, a lot of time and, and it turned out to be uh, not a very good idea. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes. I'll change my name for you guys. You're, you're worth it. Don't worry oh, about I appreciate it. it. Thank oh. you so much. I'm going to open the rooms. I'm sorry, yeah, Maria. It's, Go ahead. it's all good. You guys, listen, you worked very, very hard. This is not an easy thing to do. I appreciate it. I applaud you. I'm sure everybody else does. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This thank you. Worth a million quadrillion. Uh, I don't even want to put a number on it. It was just an infinite amount of, of worthiness here. So thank you for I appreciate for that. Hard thank work. you all. I, I'm sure I speak for most. Thank, thank you. you. We really appreciate that. that. We really, really you appreciate that. Put on a great that. Great thank you, and the boss. I appreciate it. Hey, man, I now. appreciate that. Thank I'm you so much. Open I, the rooms. It. I open the rooms again. Please join it. You should see a pop up on your window. Perfect. There we go. This is working well. That works. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what's going on with that. <laughs>
Let's see if everybody joins, then we can pop into the other rooms. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to remove the spotlight from me and you. Let's see. Let's go to the gallery view. So we have only BD here. So I'm not sure why we're getting so many users. Who is user? Why people are logging in as users? So it's assigning everybody the name user and the name Dorian. And I think it's because those are, those are the joining links that we sent everybody. It was through Dorian's account who set all this up for us. And so when he sent it, I think it, it, it registered maybe like a specific join link for him. And so when we shared it, everybody came in as Dorian. Mm. I don't know, but. We'll yeah, I don't know. It. User, I didn't understand. Dorian, I still could make it, you know, because he. I think, yeah, I think next time I just won't send the link like that. But the problem as well is that I get is that people just don't get the, the join link sometimes, you know? Mm. Yeah. So I don't know. So Anita, let me see if I can assign you to, no, she got it already. So BD, are you still there? BD, are you there? I think maybe not. So you wanted to hop into any of the rooms, uh, Abbas? Uh, like few people, there is a room number eight is only two people and I'm gonna go say hi to a few of them too, so that. I'll stay here in case people hop back into this main Yeah, room. that's okay. We can still assign them if we are in a room. Uh, I will get a alert for that. Hey, Andrea. And I'm sorry, you say user, I can't tell your name, but your name is? The one driving. Me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear What's me? Your... Yes, yeah. I can hear you now. I, my your... name's Tina, because they couldn't hear me in the breakout room. So I came back out because they left. So I figured, uh. I don't know what happened, but it was fun. We got in there for 10 seconds. <laughs> so now that it seems that I'm working again, sorry that I was driving. Oh, um, no, you can uh, send me back into some room if you want, and we'll see if it yeah, works inside like, the room. <laughs> if you can rename your name uh, on your screen, if you can rename it. Let me see if I can rename How it. How do I do that? Let's see. Because that way I will know who you are. So Andrea, the same thing with you happened. There was nobody in your room. So let me put you back. Andrea. Hope you guys had fun today. You enjoyed the conference today. Yes, but I'm trying to figure out how to rename on a phone. Do you know how to do that? I'll, I'll uh, Abbas, can do... you rename her? Uh, it was Tina, I'm sorry. Is that right? Yep, it was Tina, Tina Weaver. Perfect. All right, I renamed her. Thank you, because I have, I can do it on a, my last. There we go. Let cool. Me see. And then we're going to assign Andrea as well. Andrea, I'm going to, I assigned it already. So Alan, let me assign Alan to Alan Foster. Alan Foster, let me move it to a room number eight. Okay. Alan, I have assigned you to a room, room number eight. There you go. God, okay. this no, is so much fine. more work to host it than I thought. <gasps> I'm exhausted. I'm hungry, starving. I have a headache. <laughs> I know. I just had a cup of tea. My husband so nice. He made lunch today and he brought me tea. So I don't know. I just have to work on my oh, presentation too. I didn't get to do it last night. So I'm going to do it today. Yeah. I'm in the morning too. I mean, the partnerships thing. Oh, you didn't finish your presentation yet? <laughs> <laughs> You got homework to do. Thank God I'm done. I don't have to worry about that. I you know. can mine. I'm gonna do. I think I'm gonna do half an hour, forty-five minutes, and you can ask me questions regarding partnerships. Yeah, just you know, if you can keep it simple, and then I can I can help. I you have a very simple, but I'm just like bringing the people are uh, very uh, familiar with the storming, norming, forming exercise. You know how that fits in. So uh, it's a very simple presentation. It's very, it's like a storytelling, you know, like, yeah, I'll, like I'll, I'll, I can, I can interview you down the line in the middle of it or something. Yeah. When I'm done with the presentation, you can ask a few questions, but ask simple questions. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Because I don't want it to jeopardize anything because see you build relationships with time. It does not happen day one and you do not like everybody day one either. You know, you like somebody, 
but when you start working somebody is the relationship is not the same right you know, until unless you are, have a very adapting nature you don't care how the person is doing because eventually you know it's going to be fruitful partnership for you so you want it to give you 100% you want it to be there but most lot of times people do not have that kind of patience you know yeah no i know you might have experienced that too so but the thing is is very kind of the concept that kind of grows on you versus listening to people but i think it's a storytelling format for story kind of sticks with people yeah so, you know no i i i agree i agree i mean i'm i'm very glad with how next time i want to fix one i can't believe we forgot to upgrade our attendee limit that was so dumb but i told you i had a i have 5000 i have an enterprise version you said no i want to use my i own. i thought so i thought we had a five so we do have we have a 500 limit but what i didn't realize is that 500 limit is on the webinar and it doesn't translate to also the meeting so like apparently we had to purchase a separate product just for the meeting not for the webinar my webinar used to be 100 i upgraded to five and i thought that covered everything but apparently i needed that separately because this is a meeting i so, think you need to have an enterprise version because i have the enterprise on my zoom i That's bought i don't i don't know what i bought in the morning I'm like just give me the fucking highest package i don't care let me get this uh, done i'm pretty sure you got the enterprise because that's the only yeah. way you can do it. But I think it went pretty well overall, you know, high five. Yeah, yeah, it went, it went really well. I don't like the trolls in the morning. It was very embarrassing with Zach. But that's okay. I mean, I mean, you just have to live with it sometimes, you know. It wasn't a big deal. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. that bad. Because I remember one of my meetings was hijacked. And this guy was showing porn. And oh then we just killed. The, I mean, and I was live on uh, YouTube and on Facebook, on LinkedIn. I was live. I mean, people are watching on the social media too. So everybody was like, oh God, you're going to be so popular after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no. the social media. But then I killed the sharing session. And then he started asking stupid questions to the speaker. And speaker was like stunned. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know. But we handled it pretty yeah. well. No, but that that troll, I think by not responding to him, we, we did we well. We got, yeah, yeah. Ignoring it was good. Because if you would have responded... I, that's why I don't want to bring it up or anything because then he would like double down on trolling. So, yeah, that's the reason I kept uh, putting in the chat for people to uh, rename their screen names yeah. so that we know who they are. So then we can kick somebody out. You know, I kick one user out too, but yeah. later I was thinking maybe it was him because after that we didn't see. Him. After that I was gone. Yes, yeah, so I think it was yeah. him. So I, that was him maybe. Because I reported him and I kicked that. But then I saw there was like 50 users. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even know if I kicked the right user. Which one is which, right? Yeah. But I think that was the correct one maybe because we didn't see anything, any hateful speech after that. So yeah. But I think it was a good session. Hey, BD, <laughs> you want to chime in? Yeah, I think you guys did a great job. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You know, I, I understand technology has glitches, but trust me, technology <laughs> companies have these issues. So don't feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's what, why what, that's why i used to always joke you know i was like that's why a hardware engineer is much better than a software engineer because that software <laughs> engineer bakes it out ships it and then keeps sending you all these bug fixes you know, know. hardware engineer it's going to be fully baked otherwise the chip is not going to work and then right. you know, 10 million dollars went down the train man but yeah, yeah i was just telling me i don't know if you're here like the biggest thing was at the beginning it's like uh, it's like it's like we set everything up and I thought we had the 500 person limit and it's like, turned out that's only on the webinar. I had to buy another one on the meeting. And it's like, Jesus Christ, how did this not come up sooner? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's when okay, I it was in managed. In the morning and it showed me that, oh, more than the 100 limit. I was like, oh, okay, sounds like a big meeting. <laughs> so. <yeah. laughs> I know, I was, was I was. I, I was shocked that there's that many people lasted that long actually. Right. I don't know, because it was, yeah. I think, it, it was a good content, good speakers. But the other thing was when I just uh, kind of, you know, stopped at 100, I'm like, what's going on? Then yeah. I'm like, you know, people are in the waiting room. Then I started calling you. I'm like, you know, because this is your Zoom. We need to fix that. I'm but still I'm getting emails from some people, a couple of people that say they still can't join. I don't know if they're doing something wrong or not, but a couple of them are saying they can't join. So I wonder... What's going yeah, on? There? Send out another join, uh, joining link tonight. You know, have Dorian. I sent I sent a bunch. But I, I can't, see that. Yeah, yeah I, I sent a bunch of emails while people were speaking. Uh, but no, I, I can't change it. It's the same one for both. No, no, no. 
don't change the link let's send the link again this time because people might think they were not able to join so we can say in the email the glitch has been fixed Oh, we did. Yeah, I sent like I had my guy send like five one emails. Like everybody got spammed. Probably I don't know how many unsubscribed. I know, I know. But the thing is, for tomorrow's, we're gonna send a one fresh email for tomorrow's, and then yeah. send the link because a lot of people, a lot of people were asking me. So I is gonna break, and then we're gonna get a new link to join. I'm like, no, we unfortunately we do not have any break. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, are the we hardcore work colleagues. You know, we're gonna be here. So the only break you're gonna have is a networking break during the time. I think tomorrow we should have uh, we should have a, a thirty minute thirty minute networking, and then we should give people a thirty minute break because that Maybe was. Maybe we should do that at noon no, time. We should do like, that twelve thirty. We do networking. Yeah, hey, that Christina. was too much. Dedrick, oh, so you're you're muted, are back. Let me how are you guys you. doing? I can't hear you, Christina. Just got out of our breakout room. It was with Christina and Ben. Met nice. them, exchange information, talked about our plans and uh, just giving each other motivation. I love it. Uh, road we're trying to go down. Great, I awesome. And I, yeah. Dedrick, I met Dedrick, he came to my class actually down in LA. I've been to several of your events in LA. <laughs> yeah, it was a good, uh, a little last session was good with Ben and Christina. Um, the ones earlier, I think the moderate, if you guys had a moderator in the groups, it might work a little better. Um, that's uh, in other groups I've been to. They had a moderator. It just helps it flow to have somebody to keep the topic on on, on point with people. So that's a good idea. On the tomorrow. future ones, on the future yeah. ones we do, I'm gonna bring in like multiple VAs to help us do all this crap that we were scrambling with. So that way we can just focus on the event and the people. No, but we can do tomorrow when we do the breakout rooms. We can just uh, advise people that they can make one person. One person can moderate. You know. Or at least lead the conversations of people are not struggling to make the connections. Right, right. And anybody would like to take the lead on that. I'm pretty sure people do that all the time. Hi, Kamel. Good to see you. You're on mute. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> My breakout room finished, so I came back here. <laughs> right, to, the, right. to, to the main room. To the, the main home. room. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Popular Christina's like there. Christina's like just maximizing her time out there, just driving, yeah, doing driving. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, guys. Thanks for the call. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, new to the real estate uh, concept with investing. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Don't miss don't miss day two though. This, that's gonna be great. That's awesome. Great. We are so excited to see you guys all tomorrow. You're going to love it. Yes. Yeah, more tomorrow. information. More information. See you. Have a great night. Bye. All right. You too, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for being here. Bye. All right. So we still have people. We have to wait for them. Right. A few more minutes. So tomorrow is uh, Faisal in the morning, right? So, is he any good? Yeah, he's really good. He's gonna do the vision, uh, vision building exercise in the morning. So that's gonna be pretty good. People are gonna like it. He's um, he's take you to all the meditation process and everything, how to visualize everything. People like that. That's good. That's Got his thing. And then I think, um, so I will kick off tomorrow morning with him. I think who else is there? Let me see, hold on. Oh gosh. So then after Faisal is, uh, gosh, I'm, it's me right after him, then Dan. You got to send me your, your intro, or I can just come up with something for you. Yeah. Then can, Dan. Uh, yeah, and then Dan. And then after that, we have the podcasting uh, panel. That's a really good one, hopefully. Yeah. Firas might not come, but Ben Suttles might come instead. We don't know yet, because Firas's brother is getting married today. Oh, really? Okay. But Ben Sardles is pretty good, too. Yeah, yeah, they're the same. Too, yeah, they're the same. So you should be good. I met him before. I think he was on my podcast, too, if I remember that. Um, yeah, then you got Hamal, Shannon, Michael, Courtney in the panel. Yeah. Hamal uh, is uh, good. And then um, the blockchain panel is going to be good, too. Right. 
So I'm going to close the breakout sessions. You did already. That's good. If we can address this user thing, I don't know. Um, we do not know the names, so we can rename those. I don't know how to fix that, to be honest with you. I'll try. We don't know. Hi, welcome back. User and user. <laughs> and user, it's Rob. <laughs> hey, Rob. Hope you enjoy, enjoy the session today. Of course. It's been great. It's been really, really good. Absolutely. It, it's been honestly cost to be fair. Like like the amount of just gold that's just been dropped by like everyone is just been like amazing. So unreal, awesome. unreal. Really do well, appreciate I really, it. I appreciate I appreciate you being a part of it. I, you're the only you're the only guy in the UK that works on weekends. You know, they tend to not work on weekends. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. But mate, for this, it's worth staying up till 1 a.m. just to listen to you guys talk for sure. For sure. Oh, uh, is it 1 a.m. right now in your place? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Jesus 1 a.m. <laughs> wow that's commitment man <laughs> what can i say dude as i'm saying dude this is gold man this is absolutely incredible the value you're dropping here bringing in people like zach rob beersley dude like what like these are these are crazy people dude absolutely dude, insane awesome, insane thank you dude, i really appreciate thank you putting you. it together I appreciate, it. Thank I appreciate that now tomorrow's gonna be tomorrow's gonna be even better you guys don't want to miss tomorrow but that's pretty much it for today. I, I super appreciate you guys being here the whole day. I appreciate you playing all out, you know, making the speakers feel special with the fire emojis. I know it's it's little to us, but the reality is people want to understand that, you know, they're adding value and they're being appreciated. So I appreciate you guys doing that for, for them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. I appreciate you hopping on today. Vinky, any last words before we log off tonight? No, I think I appreciate you all being here and it was a successful day and looking forward to see you all tomorrow. It's going to be again action packed day tomorrow. So just one thing when you log in tomorrow, make sure that your screen name matches your, with your real name. So we know who you are. Otherwise, we are struggling to figure out who's user or who's Dorian. <laughs> <laughs> because we love to know you by your name. So like I said, we are in the relationship building game. So we wanted to build a strong relationship with you all. So yes. also we wanted to make ourselves accessible to you that you are able to call us, email us anytime should you have any questions on anything. Yeah. And yes, video is gonna, we're gonna cut the videos and we're gonna share the videos with all. It's gonna take us a few days to cut the videos before we share it. So hang in there, but email me and I will definitely share everything with you guys. Yeah, we'll email it to everybody that signed up. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Abbas. Thank you, Rinky. Of course. Of course. Thank, you job. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank, thank you, guys. Thank Appreciate you, you all. Thank thank you. You. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. See you tomorrow. See you. Bye-bye.